Chapter 17 Jim Belly McMillan, the giant of the wine industry, has suffered another crisis. It has been confirmed that a tainted bottle of wine was responsible for the death of Margaret Bowers, an executive with the company. Police are investigating. The possibility of product tampering is being considered, and Giambelli McMillan is recalling bottles of Castello di Giambelli Merlot 1992. Since the merger of the Giambelli McMillan wineries last December... Perfect, Jerry thought as he watched the evening newscast. Absolutely perfect. They'd scramble, of course. Already were scrambling. But what would the public hear? Giambelli. Death. Wine. Bottles would be poured down the sink. More would sit unsold on the shelf. It would sting quite a bit and for quite some time. It would cut into profits, short and long term. Profits liqueur would reap. That alone was a great satisfaction, professionally and personally. Very personally. It was true a couple of people had died. But that wasn't his fault. He had nothing to do with it. Directly. And when the police caught the one who did, the damage to Jim Belly would only be compounded. He'd wait a while, bide his time, watch the show. Then, if it seemed advantageous, there could be another anonymous call. Not to the media this time, but to the police. Digitalis comes from Foxglove, Maddie knew. She'd looked it up. What? Distracted, David looked over briefly. He had a mountain of paperwork on his desk, in Italian. He was much better at speaking it than reading it. Would they have grown foxglove near the vines? Maddie demanded. Like they grow mustard plants between the rows here, for nitrogen? I don't think they would, because they'd know foxglove had digitalis. But maybe they made a mistake. Could it infect the grapes if the plants were grown there and turned into the soil? I don't know. Maddie, this isn't for you to worry about. Why, you're worried. It's my job to worry. I could help. Honey, if you want to help, you could give me a little space here. Do your homework. Her lips began to pout, a sure sign of personal insult, but David was too distracted to notice. I've done my homework. Well, help Theo with his or something. But if the digitalis... Maddie... At his wit's end, he snapped at her. This isn't a story or a project. It's a very real problem, and I have to deal with it. Go find something to do. Fine. She shut the door of his office and let the resentment burn as she stomped away. He never wanted her to help when it was something important. Do your homework. Talk to Theo. Clean up your room. He always fell back on those crappy deals when she wanted to do something that mattered. She bet he wouldn't have told Pilar Jim Belly to find something to do. And she didn't know squat about science, music and art and looking pretty. That's all she knew. Girl things, not important things. She stalked to Theo's room. He was sprawled on the bed, his music blaring, his guitar lying on his belly, and the phone at his ear. From the dopey look on his face, it was a girl on the other end. Men were so lame. Dab wants you to do your homework. Beat it, he crossed his ankles. Nah, it's nothing, just my idiot sister. The phone knocked hard against his jaw when Maddie launched herself at him. In seconds, Theo was dealing with the shock of pain, the squeals in his ear, and the pummels and kicks of a furious Maddie. Ow, wait, damn it, Maddie, call you back. He managed to drop the phone and in the nick of time protect his privates from a knee jab. What the hell? After a long, sweaty minute, he managed to flip her. She didn't fight like a girl, but he still outweighed her. And pin her down. Cut it out, you crazy little bitch. What's your problem? I'm not nothing. She spat it at him and made a valiant attempt with her knee again. No, you're just nutsoid. He licked the corner of his mouth, cursed at the unmistakable taste. I'm bleeding. When I tell Dad... You can't tell him anything. He doesn't listen to anybody except her. Her who? You know who. Get off me, you big fat jerk. You're just as bad as he is, making gooey noises to some girl and not listening to anybody. I was having a conversation, he 
he said with great dignity to counter the gooey snipe. And if you hit me again, I'm hitting you back, even if Dad grounds me for it. Now what's your problem? I don't have a problem. It's the men in this house making asses of themselves over the women in the villa that's the problem. It's disgusting. It's embarrassing. Watching her, Theo wiped the blood from his mouth. He had a very creative fantasy life going where Sophia was concerned, and his baby sister wasn't going to spoil it for him. He shook back his mop of curly hair, yawned. You're just jealous. I am not. Sure you are, cause you're skinny and flat-chested. I'd rather have brains than breasts. Good thing. I don't know why you're having a snit fit because Dad's hanging with Pilar. He's hung with women before. You're so stupid. Every drag of disgust gathered in her voice. He's not hanging out with her putz face. He's in love with her. Get out. What do you know? But his stomach did a funny little jump as he dragged a bag of chips off his dresser. Man, it's going to change everything. That's the way it works. There was a terrible pressure in her chest, but she got to her feet. Nothing's ever going to be the same again, and that sucks out loud. Nothing's been the same, not since Mom took off. It got better. The tears wanted to escape, but rather than let them fall in front of him, she stormed out of the room. Yeah, Theo muttered, but it didn't stay the same. Sophia hoped air, cold and clear, would blow some of the clouds from her mind. She had to think and think precisely. She was spinning as quickly as she could, but the newscast had caused some damage. Too often, the first impression was all people ever remembered. Now her job was to shift that impression, to show the public that while Jim Bailey had been violated, the company had done nothing to violate the public. That took more than words. She knew more even than placement and delivery. It took tangible action. If her grandparents weren't even now packed for Italy, she would have urged them to do so, to be visible at the source of the problem, not to fall back on the safety of no comment, but to comment often and to comment specifically. Use the company name again and again. She thought, making mental notes, make it personal, make the company breathe. But they had to tread carefully around Margaret Bowers, sympathy, of course. But not so much it implied responsibility. To do that, to help them do that, Sophia had to stop thinking of Margaret as a person. If that was cold, she would be cold and deal with her conscience later. She stood at the edge of the vineyard. It was guarded, she thought, against pests, disease, the vagaries of weather. Whatever threatened to invade or damage it was fought against. This was no different. She'd fight the war. And on her terms, she wouldn't regret any act that won it. She caught a shadow of movement. Who's there? Her mind leaped toward trespasser, saboteur, murderer. Without hesitation, she charged and found her arms full of struggling young girl. Let go! I can be here. I'm allowed. Sorry, I'm sorry. Sophia stepped back. You scared me. She hadn't looked scared. Maddie thought. But she had looked scary. I'm not doing anything wrong. I didn't say you were. I said you scared me. I guess we're all a little jumpy right now. Look, she caught the glimmer of tears on the girl's cheeks as she didn't like having her own crying jags brought into issue. She gave Maddie the same consideration. I just came out to clear my head. Too much going on in there right now. Sophia glanced back at the house. My father's working. There was just enough defense in the statement to have Sophia speculating. There's a lot of pressure on him right now, on everybody. My grandparents are leaving for Italy first thing in the morning. I worry about them. They're not young any more. After her father's rebuff, Sophia's casual confidence soothed. Still cautious, Maddie fell into step beside her. They don't act old, not like decrepit or anything. No, they don't, do they? But still, I wish I could go instead. But they need me here right now. Maddie's lips trembled as she looked toward the lights of the guest house. Nobody, it seemed, needed her anywhere. At least you've got something to do. 
Yeah. Now if I could just figure out what to do next. So much going on. She slanted Maddie a look. The kid was wound up and sulking about something. Sophia remembered very well what it was like to be fourteen, wound up and sulking. Life was full of immediacy and intense moments at fourteen, she thought. That made professional crises seem like paper cuts. I guess on some level, we're in the same boat. My mother, she said when Maddie remained silent. Your father? It's a little weird. Maddie shrugged, then hunched her shoulders. I gotta go. All right, but I'd like to tell you something, woman to woman, daughter to daughter. Whatever. My mother's gone a long time without someone, without a good man, to care about her. I don't know what it's been like for you, or your brother, or your father, but for me, after the general strangeness of it, it's nice to see her have a good man who makes her happy. I hope you'll give her a chance. It doesn't matter what I do, or think, or say. Defiant misery, Sophia mused. Yes, she remembered that, too. Yes, it matters. When someone loves us, what we think and what we do matters. She looked over at the sound of running feet. From the looks of it, somebody loves you. Maddie! Breathless, David plucked his daughter off her feet. He managed to embrace and shake her at the same time. What are you doing? You can't go wandering off like that after dark. I just took a walk and cost me a year of my life. You want to fight with your brother, be my guest, but you're not to leave the house again without permission, clear? Yes, sir. Though secretly pleased, she grimaced. I didn't think you'd notice. Think again. He hooked his arm around her neck, a casual habit of affection Sophia had noticed, and envied. Her father had never touched her like that. Partly my fault, Sophia told him. I kept her longer than I should have. She's a terrific sounding board. My mind was going off in too many directions. You should give it a rest. You're going to need all circuits up and working tomorrow. Is your mother free? He didn't notice the way Maddie stiffened, but Sophia did. I imagine. Why? I'm slogging through reports and memos in Italian. It'd go faster with someone who reads it better than I do. I'll tell her. Sophia looked at Maddie now. She'll want to help. Appreciate it. Now I'll just drag this baggage home and pound it a while. See you at the briefing, eight o'clock. I'll be ready. Night, Maddie. She watched them walk through the fields toward the guest house, their shadows close enough to merge into one form in the moonlight. Hard to blame the kid for wanting to keep it that way. Hard to make room for changes. For people, when your life seemed just fine as it was. But changes happened. It was smarter to be part of them. Better yet, she decided, to initiate them. Tyler kept the radio and the TV off. He ignored the phone. One thing he could control was his own reaction to the press, and the best way to control it was to ignore the press altogether, at least for a few hours. He was working his way through his own files, his logs, every record he had available. He could and would ascertain that the Macmillan area of the company was secure. What he couldn't seem to control were his own questions about Margaret. An accident, suicide, or murder. None of the options were appealing. He eliminated suicide. She hadn't been the type, and he sure as hell didn't have the towering ego that suggested she'd kill herself in despair because he'd broken a dinner date. Maybe she had been interested in him, and maybe he'd ignored the signals because he hadn't felt the same way, and hadn't wanted the complications. Life was complicated enough without tangling up business and personal relationships. Plus, she just hadn't been his type. He didn't go for the fast-track career woman with attitude and an agenda. That kind of woman just took too much energy. Take Sophia. Christ. He was beginning to think he'd explode if he didn't take Sophia. And wasn't that the point? He reminded himself as he roamed restlessly downstairs again. Thinking about her that way muddled up the mind, strained the body, and complicated an already complex business association. Now more than ever it was essential he keep his mind on his job. 
The current crisis was going to pull his time and energy away from the vineyards when he could least afford it. Long-range forecasts warned him that frost vigils would be necessary. Several casks of wine were on the point of being ready for bottling. Disking had already started. He didn't have time to worry about police investigations, potential lawsuits, or a woman. And of all of them, he was finding the woman the hardest to shove out of his mind. Because she'd invaded his system, he thought, and she'd be stuck there, irritating him, until he got her out again. So why didn't he just march over to the villa, storm up her terrace steps, and deal with it, finish it? He knew exactly how pathetic and self-serving that was as rationalization, and decided he didn't give a damn. He grabbed a jacket, strode to the front door, and yanked it open. And there she was, stalking up his steps. I don't like irritable macho men, she told him as she slammed the door at her back. I don't like bossy, aggressive women. They dove at each other. Even as their mouths began a mutual assault, she boosted herself up, wrapped her legs around his hips. I want a bed this time. Her breath already tattered. She tugged at his shirt. We'll try out the floor later. I want you naked. He nipped his teeth into her throat and began to stagger up the steps. I don't care where. God, you have this incredible taste. She raced her lips over his face, his neck. It's so basic. Her breath caught when he wrapped her back against the wall on the top of the steps, her fingers fisted in his hair. This is just sex, right? Yeah, right, whatever. His mouth crushed down on hers. Using the wall to brace her, he began dragging her sweater over her head. God, you're so built. He tossed her sweater aside, took his mouth over the soft swell of a breast that rose above her bra. We're not going to make the bed. Her heart hammered as he used his teeth on her. Okay, next time. Her feet hit the floor. At least she thought they did. It was hard to know where she was or who she was with as the geyser of greed erupted inside her. Hands were pulling at clothes, something ripped. Mouths ran hot over flesh. Everything blurred. Over the wild beat of blood she could hear her own whimpers, pleas, demands, a kind of mad chant that merged with his. She was already wet, already aching when his fingers found her. The violent glory of the orgasm ripped through her, molten gold release, so strong. So welcome, she might have melted bonelessly to the floor. Uh-uh, no, you don't. He pressed her back against the wall, and riding on her thrill, continued to drive her. I want you screaming. Go up again. She couldn't have stopped herself. Welcoming the burn, craving it, she let him take, empty her out until her mind was filled with the dark and the feral. And filled, she tore at him whipped him past reason. She watched his eyes go opaque and knew it was she who blinded him, heard his breath heave and tear, and thrilled that she could weaken him. Now, once more she anchored her hands in his hair and shuddered, shuddered as she poised on the next thin edge. Now, now, now. When he plunged into her, she came again, brutally, her nails dug into the sweat-slicked slope of his shoulders as her hips pistoned, lightning fast. With his mouth fused to hers, he swallowed the small, greedy sound she made, fed on them as he hitched her up to give more, take more. Pleasure careened through him, left him shattered, stupefied. He managed to hold on to her as both of them slid to the floor. Sprawled over him, her heart still racing, Sophia began to laugh. Dio, grazie a Dio. Decanted at last. No real finesse, but a fine body and excellent staying power. We'll work on finesse when I'm not ready to howl at the moon. Wasn't complaining. To prove it, she brushed her lips lightly over his chest. I feel fabulous. At least I think I do. I can verify that. You feel incredible. He blew out a breath. I'm winded. That makes two of us. She lifted her head, studied his face. Are you finished? Not hardly. Oh, good. 
Because neither am I. She shifted, straddled him. Ty? Mmm. His hands were already stroking up her torso. She was so smooth, he thought. Smooth, dusky, exotic. We probably need to set guidelines. Yeah. She had a pretty little mole on the curve of her left hip, a kind of sexual punctuation. You want to get into that now? No. Good. Me either. She braced her hands on either side of his head, leaned down. She brushed her lips at the corners of his mouth, teasing little sips. Bed, she whispered. He reared up, wrapped his arms around her. Next time. Sometime around midnight, she found herself face down on his bed. The sheets were tangled and hot, and her bones were limp as water. Even after so long a sexual drought, it was hard for her to believe the human body could recharge as often, and at such intense power. Water, she croaked, afraid now that she'd satisfied one craving, thirst would kill her. I need water. I'll give you anything, wild sexual favors, if you'll just give me a bottle of water. You've already paid out the wild sexual favors. Oh, right. She groped over, patted his shoulder blindly. Be a pal, Macmillan. Okay, but where are we? On the bed, she sighed gustily. We finally made it. Right. Be right back. He staggered up, and since he'd been crossways on the bed, misjudged direction and wrapped smartly into a chair. Listening to his muttered curses, Sophia smiled into the sheet. God, he was cute. Funny. Smarter than she'd given him credit for. And incredible in bed. On the floor. Against the wall. She couldn't remember any man appealing to her on so many levels especially when you considered he was the type who had to be held at gunpoint to put on a suit and tie. Which was, she supposed, why he always looked so sexy in them, the caveman temporarily civilized. Lost for the moment in that thought, she yelped when Ty held the iced water to her bare shoulder. Ha ha, she muttered, but was grateful enough to roll over, sit up, and gulp down half the glass. Hey, I figured you'd share. I didn't say anything about sharing. Then I want more sexual favors. You couldn't possibly, she chuckled. You know how much I like proving you wrong. She sighed as his hand snuck up her thigh. That's true. Still, she handed him the rest of the water. I might have a few sexual favors left in me, but then I really have to go home. Early briefing tomorrow. He drained the glass, set it aside. We're not thinking about that now. He hooked an arm around her waist, then rolled until she was under him. Let me tell you just what I have in mind. It had been, Sophie amused, a very long time since she'd snuck into the house at two in the morning. Still, it was one of those skills, like riding a bike or, well, sex, that came back to you. She dimmed her headlights before they flashed against the windows of the villa and eased the car gently, slowly around the bend and into the garage. She crept out into the chilly night and stood just a moment under the brilliant wheel of stars. She felt outrageously tired, wonderfully used, and alive. Tyler Macmillan, she decided, was a man just full of surprises, of secret pockets and marvelous, marvelous energy. She'd learned a great deal about him in the past few months— Aspects and angles she hadn't bothered to explore, and she was looking forward to continuing that exploration. But for now, she'd better get in the house and get some sleep, or she'd be useless the next day. Odd, she thought as she walked quietly around the back. She'd wanted to stay with him, sleep with him, all curled up against that long, warm body, safe, cozy, secure. She'd trained herself over the years to click off emotionally after sex, a man's way, she liked to think. Sleeping and waking in the same bed after the fun and games were over could be awkward. It could be intimate. Avoiding that, making certain she didn't need that, kept things from getting messy. But she'd had to order herself to leave Tyler's bed. Because she was tired, she assured herself. Because it had been a difficult day. He wasn't really any different from anyone else she'd been with. Perhaps she liked him more. 
She considered as she navigated through the shrubbery, and was more attracted to him than she'd expected to be. That didn't make him different, just new. After a while, the polish would wear off the shiny excitement, and that would be that. That, she thought, was always that. If you looked for love and lifetimes, you were doomed to disappoint or be disappointed. Better, much better to seize the moment, wring it dry, than move on. Because thinking was dulling her mood, she blocked out the questions, and rounding the last bend in the gardens, came face to face with her mother. They stared at each other, the surprised breath each puffed out frosting into little clouds. Um, nice night, Sophia commented. Yes, very. I was just, uh, David stumped. Pilar gestured vaguely toward the guest house. He needed help with some translating. I see. A wild giggle tried to claw its way out of Sophia's throat. Is that what your generation calls it? A small choking sound escaped. If we're going to sneak the rest of the way in, let's do it. We could freeze out here trying to come up with reasonable excuses. I was translating. Pilar hurried to the door, fumbled with the knob. There was a lot of, oh, mama, the laughter won. Sophia clutched her belly and stumbled inside. Stop bragging. I was merely floundering. Pilar pushed at her hair. She had a very good idea how she looked, tumbled and flushed, like a woman who just slid out of bed, or in this case, off the living room sofa. Taking the offensive seemed to be the safest course. You're out late. Yeah. I was translating with Ty, with, oh, oh, I'm starving. How about you? Enjoying herself, Sophia pulled open the refrigerator. I never got around to dinner. She spoke casually with her head in the fridge. Do you have a problem with me and Ty? No, yes, no, Pilar stuttered. I don't know. I absolutely don't know how I'm supposed to handle this. Let's have pie. Pie? Sophia pulled out what was left of a deep dish apple. You look wonderful, Mama. Pilar brushed at her hair again. I couldn't possibly. Wonderful. Sophia set the dish on the counter and reached for plates. I had a few emotional bumps about you and David. I wasn't used to seeing you as, to seeing you, I suppose. But when I run into you sneaking into the house in the middle of the night, looking wonderful, I can't help but see you. I don't have to sneak into my own house. Oh, wielding a pie cutter, Sophia asked. Then why were you? I was just. Let's have pie. Good call. Sophia cut two huge hunks, then smiled when Pilar stroked her hair. She leaned in, and for a moment the two of them stood in the bright kitchen light in silence. It was a long, lousy day. It's nice to end it well. Yes. Though you gave me a hell of a shock outside, me. Imagine my surprise, reliving my teenage years, then running into my mother. Reliving, really. Sophia carried the plates to the kitchen table while Pilar got forks. Oh well, why dwell on the past? Grinning wickedly, Sophia licked pie from her thumb. David's very hot, Sophie. Very hot. Great shoulders, that charmingly boyish face. That intelligent brain, quite a package you've bagged there, Mama. He's not a trophy, and I certainly hope you don't think of Ty as one. He's got a terrific butt. I know. I meant Ty. I know. Pilar repeated. What am I blind? With an unladylike snort, she plopped into a chair. This is ridiculous. It's rude and it's fun. Sophia finished and sat down to scoop up some pie. We share an interest in fashion, and more recently in the business. Why shouldn't we share an interest in Nana? Well, of course we share an interest in. Pilar dropped her fork with a clatter as she followed the direction of Sophia's blank stare. Mama, what are you doing up? You think I don't know when people come and go in my house? Somehow elegant in a thick chenille robe and slippers, Teresa swept into the room. What? No wine. We were just hungry. Sophia managed. Ah, no wonder. Sex is a laborious business if done properly. 
I'm hungry myself. Sophia slapped a hand to her mouth, but it was too late. The burst of laughter erupted. Go, Eli. Theresa merely took the last piece of pie as her daughter stared down at her plate, shoulder shaking. We'll have wine. I believe the occasion calls for it. I think this is surely the first time all three generations of Giambelli women have sat together in the kitchen after making love. You needn't look so stunned, Pilar. Sex is a natural function, after all. And since you've chosen a worthy partner this time, we'll have wine. She chose a bottle of Sauvignon Blanc from the kitchen rack and uncorked it. These are trying times. There have been others, and there will be more. She poured three glasses. It's essential that we live while we move through them. I approve of David Carter, if my approval matters. Thank you. It does, of course. Sophia was biting her lip to hide a grin when Teresa turned toward her. If you hurt Tyler, I'll be both angry and disappointed in you. I love him very much. Well, I like that. Deflated, Sophia set her fork down. Why would I? Remember what I said. Tomorrow we'll fight for what we are, what we have. Tonight. She lifted her glass. Tonight we celebrate it. Salute. Chapter 18 It was a war, waged on several fronts. Sophia fought her battles on the airwaves, in print, and on the telephone. She spent hours updating press releases, giving interviews, reassuring accounts. And every day she started over, beating back rumor, innuendo, and speculation. Until the crisis passed, her time in the vineyards was over. That was Tyler's battlefield. She found herself resenting not being able to soldier there as well, to take part in the disking, the frost vigils, in the careful guarding of the emerging buds. She worried about her grandparents, forging their front on the Italian line. Every day the reports came in. The recall was being implemented, and soon, bottle by bottle, the wine would be tested. She couldn't think about the cost, short or long term. That she left in David's hands. When she needed to step back from the hype and spin, she stood at her office window and watched men with harrows work the earth. It would be a year of rare vintage, she promised herself. They only had to survive it. She jumped at the next ring of her phone and buried the very real need to ignore it. Sophia Giambelli. Ten minutes later, she hung up, then released pent-up rage with a vicious stream of Italian curses. Does that help? Pilar asked as she stood by the doorway. Not enough. Sophia pressed her fingers to her temples and wondered how best to handle this next stage of combat. I'm glad you're here. Can you come in, sit down a minute? Fifteen, actually. I've just finished up another tour. Pilar settled into a chair. They're coming in droves, curiosity seekers for the most part now. Some reporters, though that's down to a trickle since your press conference. It's likely to build again. I just got off the phone with a producer of the Larry Mann show. Larry Mann? Pilar wrinkled her nose. Trash television at its worst. You aren't going to give them anything. They've already got something. They've got Renee. Unable to sit still, Sophia shoved away from her desk. She's going to tape a show tomorrow, revealing family secrets, supposedly, telling the true story of Dad's death. We're invited to participate. They want either you or me, or both of us, on the show to give our side of it. It won't do, Sophie. As satisfying as it might be to slap her back in public, it isn't the way, and that isn't the forum. Why do you think I was cursing? She snatched up her frog paperweight, passed it restlessly from hand to hand. We'll take the high road and ignore her. But, God, how I'd love to wrestle in the mud with that bitch. She's been giving interviews right and left, and she's good enough at them to do considerable damage. I've talked to both Aunt Helen and Uncle James about legal action. Don't. She can't be allowed to use the family to slander. Sophia scowled down at the frog. His cheerfully silly face usually lightened her mood. I can't get down and dirty with her, which is a crying shame. 
but I can slap her back legally. Listen to me first, Pilar said, leaning forward. I'm not being soft. I'm not being manipulated. Taking legal action, at least right now when we've so many other battles to fight, only gives some credence to her and what she's saying. I know your instincts are to fight, and mine are generally to retreat, but maybe this time we do neither. We just stand in place. I've thought of that. I've thought of it from both angles. But when it comes down to it, you fight fire with fire. Not always, honey. Sometimes you just drown it. We'll just drown her out with good Jim Bailey wine. Sophia inhaled, exhaled slowly as she sat back. She set the paperweight down again, turning it around and around while she considered. Behind her, the facts beeped and whined, but she ignored it while she figured the angles. That's good. Nodding, she looked at her mother again. That's very good. Drown the flames with one good flood. We're going to have a party. Spring ball, black tie. How much time do you need to put it together? To her credit, Pilar only blinked. Three weeks. Good. Work up the guest list. Once we've got invitations out, I'll plant some items with reporters. Renee opts for trash. We'll opt for elegance. A party. Tyler raised his voice over the rumble of disking. Ever hear of Nero and his fiddle? Rome's not burning. That's my point. Impatient, Sophia dragged him farther from the work. Giambelli takes their responsibilities seriously, are cooperating with the authorities here and in Italy. Merde! She swore as her cell phone rang. Wait. She pulled the phone from her pocket. Sophia Giambelli. Si. Va bene. With an absent signal to Ty, she paced a few feet away. He stood, watched her move, issue what were undoubtedly orders in Italian. Around them, the disking progressed, the noisy, systematic turning of earth and cover crop. Warmth teased the vines to bud, even as the breeze that shivered down from the mountains promised a night of chills. In the middle of it all, in the center of the ageless cycle, was Sophia, the dynamo with the future at her fingertips. The center of it, he thought again. Maybe she'd been there, always. She strode down the row, up again, then down, her voice rising, a kind of fascinating foreign music. He didn't bother to curse, didn't even bother to question when he felt that last lock snick open inside him. He'd been expecting that. He was crazy about her, he admitted. Gone, over the line, and sooner or later he'd have to figure out what to do about it. She jammed the phone back in her pocket, blew at her bangs. Italian publicity branch, she said to Ty. A few snags that needed picking loose. Sorry for the interruption. Now where? She trailed off, staring up at him. What are you grinning at? she demanded. Am I? Maybe it's because you're not so hard to look at, even in fast forward. Fast forward's the only speed that works right now. Anyway, the party. We need to make a statement. And continue with the plans for the centennial, the first gale as midsummer. We do this more intimate gathering to show unity, responsibility, and confidence. She began ticking points off with her fingers. The recall was initiated voluntarily and at considerable expense. Before it was a legal issue. La Signora and Mr. Macmillan have traveled to Italy personally to offer any assistance in the investigation. However, she continued, and we need to get to the however soon. Giambelli is confident the problem is under control. The family, and that's what we have to emphasize, remains gracious, hospitable, and involved with the community. We show our polish, while Rene digs in the muck. Polish. He studied the vines. He reminded himself to check the overhead sprinklers again, should they be needed for frost protection overnight. If we're going to be polished. How come I have to fool around with a TV crew and walk around in the mud? To illustrate the dedication and hard work that goes into every bottle of wine produced. Don't be cranky, Macmillan. The last few days have been vicious. I'd be less cranky if outsiders would stay out of the way. Does that include me? He shifted his attention from the vines, looked at her beautiful face. Doesn't seem to. Then why haven't you come sneaking through my terrace doors in the night? 
His lips quirked. Thought about it. Think harder. When she leaned into him and he stepped back, she asked, "What? Got a headache?" No. An audience. I'd as soon not advertise I'm sleeping with my coal operator. Sleeping with me has nothing to do with business. Her voice chilled several degrees, just the kind of cold snap that wrought damage. But if you're ashamed of it, she shrugged, turned, and walked away. He had to deal with the sting first, then the innate reluctance for public scenes. He caught up with her in five strides, grabbed her arm. I'm not ashamed of anything, just because I like keeping my personal life private. Her sulky jerk back irritated him enough to tighten his grip and curl his fingers around her other arm. There's enough gossip around here without adding to it. If I can't keep my mind on my work, I can't expect my men to. Ah, the hell with it! He lifted her to her toes, pressed his mouth hard to hers. There was a thrill in that, she thought, in that quick whip of strength and temper. Okay, he demanded and dropped her flat on her feet again. Almost, she ran her hands up his chest, felt him tremble. A thrill, she thought, in knowing you were physically outmatched but still had power. She laid her lips on his, teasing until his hand took a fistful of the back of her sweater, until her hands were locked possessively around his neck and her own stomach muscles went loose. That, she murmured, was just fine. Leave your terrace doors unlocked. They have been. I have to get back to work. Me too. But they stayed as they were, mouths a breath apart. Something was happening inside her, a quivering, but not that lustful shiver in the belly. This was around her heart, and more ache than pleasure. Fascinated, she started to give in to it, and the phone in her pocket began to ring again. Well, she said a little unsteadily as she eased away. Round two. I'll see you later. She dragged her phone out as she hurried away. She'd think about Ty later. Think about a lot of things later. Sofia Giambelli, Nana, I'm glad you caught me. I tried to reach you earlier, but she trailed off, alerted by her grandmother's tone. She stopped walking, stood at the edge of the vineyard. Despite the wash of sunlight, her skin chilled. She was already running back as she broke the connection. Ty. Alarmed, he whirled back, caught her on the fly. What is it? What happened? They found more, two more bottles that were tainted. Damn it! Well, we were expecting it. We knew there had to be tampering. There's more. It could be worse. Nana, she and Eli. She had to stop, organize her thoughts. There was an old man. He worked for Nana's grandfather. Started in the vineyard when he was just a boy. He retired technically over a year ago, and late last year he died. He had a bad heart. He was already following her, already feeling the dread. Go on. His granddaughter, the one who found him, says he'd been drinking our Merlot. She came to my grandmother after the news of the recall broke. They're having his body exhumed. His name was Bernardo Baptista. Sophia had all the details in neatly typed notes, but she didn't need them. She had every word in her head. He was seventy-three. He died in December from an apparent heart attack while sitting in front of his own fire after a simple meal, and several glasses of Castello Giambelli Merlot, nineteen ninety-two. As Margaret Bowers had, David thought grimly. You said Baptista had a weak heart. He'd had some minor heart problems and was suffering from a lingering head cold at the time of his death. The cold adds another layer. Baptista was known for his nose. He'd worked wine for over sixty years, but as he was ill, it was unlikely he'd have detected any problem with the wine. His granddaughter swears he hadn't opened it before that night. She'd seen it that afternoon when she'd visited him. He kept it and a few other gifts from the company on display. He was very proud of his association with Giambelli. The wine had been a gift, according to his granddaughter. Yes, from she doesn't know. He was given a retirement party, and as is customary, Giambelli presents an employee with parting gifts.
I've checked, and that particular wine was not on the gift list. He'd have been presented with a Cabernet, a white, and a sparkling. First label. However, it's not uncommon for an employee to be allowed to choose another selection or to be given wine by other members of the company. How soon will they know if the wine caused his death? Pilar moved to the desk where Sophia sat, rubbed a hand over her daughter's shoulder. A matter of days. We do what we can to track the wine, David decided. Meanwhile, we continue as we have been. I'm going to suggest to La Signora and Eli that we hire an outside investigator. I'll work on a statement. It's best if we announce the new fines and Jim Bailey's part in implementing the recall and the testing. I don't want to have to chase the release again. Let me know what I can do to help, Pilar told her. Get that guest list together. Honey, you can't possibly want to hold a party now. On the contrary. The worry, the sadness over an old man she remembered with affection hardened into determination. We'll just twist the angle. We hold a gala here, for charity. We've done it before, and a great deal more for good causes. I want people to remember that. A thousand a plate. All food, wine, and entertainment donated by Jim Bailey McMillan, with proceeds going to the homeless. She scribbled notes as she spoke already drafting invitations, releases, responses in her head. Our family wants to help yours be safe and secure. There are a lot of people who owe La Signora more than a grand for a fancy meal. If they need to be reminded of that, I'll see to it. She cocked her head, waiting for David's reaction. You're the expert there, he said after a moment. It's a shaky line to walk, but in my opinion, you have superior balance. Thanks. Meanwhile, we have to pretend a cool disinterest in the press Renee is generating. There'll be fallout from that, and it'll be personal. What's personal to Jim Belly will, naturally, touch on business. Pilar slid into a discreet chair at a quiet table in the bar at the Four Seasons. She was sure if she'd mentioned her intentions to anyone, she'd have been told she was making a mistake. She probably was. But this was something she had to do, something she should have done long ago. She ordered a mineral water and prepared to wait. She had no doubt Renée would be late, just as she'd had no doubt Renée would meet her. She wouldn't have been able to resist making an entrance or having a confrontation with an enemy she perceived as weaker. Pilar nursed her drink and sat patiently. She had a lot of experience with waiting— Renée didn't disappoint. She swept in. She was, Pilar supposed, the kind of woman who liked to sweep into a room, trailing furs though the weather was too warm for them. She looked well, fit, rested, glowing. Too often in the past, Pilar admitted, she'd studied this stunning and younger woman and felt inadequate in comparison. A natural response, she imagined, but that didn't stop it from being foolish and useless. It was easy to see why Tony had been attracted, easier to understand why he'd been caught. Renée was no empty-headed Barbie, but a tough-minded female who would have known just how to get what she wanted, and to keep it. Pilar? Renée, thanks for meeting me. Oh, how could I resist? Renée dumped her fur and slid into her chair. You're looking a little strained. Champagne cocktail, she told the waitress without glancing up. Pilar's stomach didn't clench as it once would have. You're not. You had a few weeks in Europe early this year. It must have agreed with you. Tony and I had planned on an extended vacation. He wouldn't have wanted me to sit home and brood. Renée angled herself, crossed long, silky legs. That was always your job. Renée, I was never the other woman, and neither were you. I was out of the picture long before you and Tony met. You were never out of the picture. You and your family kept your hooks in Tony, and you made sure he never got what he deserved from Jim Belly. Now he's dead, and you'll pay me what you should have paid him. She picked up her drink the minute it was served. Did you think I'd let you drag his name and mine by association through the dirt? Odd. I was going to ask you the same thing. Pilar folded her hands on the table, 
a small tidy move that gave her a moment to gather herself. Whatever else, Rene, he was my daughter's father. I never wanted to see his name sullied. I want, more than I can tell you, to know who killed him and why. You did, one way or the other, by cutting him out of the company. He wasn't meeting another woman that night. He wouldn't have dared. And I was enough for him, the way you never were. Pilar thought about mentioning Chris, but knew it wasn't worth the effort. No, I was never enough for him. I don't know who he was meeting that night or why, but I'll tell you what I think, Rene interrupted. He had something on you, you, your family, and you had him killed. Maybe you even used that little twit Margaret to do it, and that's why she's dead now. Weariness replaced pity. That's ridiculous, even for you. If this is the kind of thing you're saying to reporters that you intend to say on television, you're opening yourself up to serious legal action. Please, Renee sipped again. Do you think I haven't consulted an attorney to see what I can say and how I can say it? You saw to it that Tony was about to be cut off and that I came away with next to nothing. I intend to get what's coming to me. Really? And since we're so cold-blooded, aren't you afraid of retribution? Rene glanced toward a nearby table. Two men sat, sipping water. Bodyguards, round the clock. Don't even bother threatening me. You've created quite a fantasy world and appear to be enjoying it. I'm sorry about you and Tony, sincerely, as you were perfect for each other. I came here to ask you to be reasonable, to show some decency toward my family, and to think of Tony's child before you speak to the press. But that's a waste of time for both of us. I thought you might have loved him, but that was foolish of me. So we'll try this. She leaned in, surprising Renée with a sudden and very cold gleam in her eye. Do what you want. Say what you want. In the end, you'll only look ridiculous. And though it's small of me, I'll enjoy that. More, I think, than you will saying it or doing it. Keep being the strident trophy wife, Rene. It suits you. Pilar said as she reached in her purse for money. Just as those rather gaudy earrings suit you. A great deal more than they did me when Tony gave them to me for our fifth wedding anniversary. She tossed a twenty on the table between them. I'd consider them and anything else of mine he helped himself to over the years full payment. You'll never get anything else out of me. Or Giambelli. She didn't sweep out. She'd leave the drama for Rene. Instead, she sauntered and felt good about it, just as she felt good about dropping another bill on the table where Rene's bodyguards sat watch. This rounds on me, she told them, and walked out laughing. I put on a pretty good show. Steaming now, Pilar paced back and forth over the Aubusson in Helen Moore's living room. And by God, I think I came out on top. But I was so angry. This woman is gunning for my family, and she's wearing my damn earrings while she's taking aim. You've got documentation on the jewelry, insurance records and so on. We could take issue. I hated those stupid earrings. Pilar gave a bad-natured shrug. Tony gave them to me as a peace offering after one of his affairs. I got the bill, too, of course. Damn it, it's hard swallowing how often I was a fool. Then spit it out. Sure, you don't want a drink? No, I'm driving, and should be heading back already. Pilar hissed out a breath, sucked in another. I had to blow off steam first, or I might have given in to road rage and ended up in jail. Good thing you have a friend on the bench. Listen to me. I think you did exactly right by facing off with her. A lot of people would disagree, but they don't know you like I do. Helen poured herself a couple of fingers of vodka over ice. You had things to say, and you've waited too long to say them. It won't change anything. With her, maybe, maybe not. Helen sat, stretched out. But the point is, it changed something for you. You took charge, and personally, I'd have paid good money to see you tell her off. 
She'll go on her little rant on her trashy talk show and very likely end up getting hammered by various audience members who take offense at her designer suit and ten pounds of jewelry. Wives, she continued, who've been cheated on, left holding the bag for women like her. God, Pilar, they'll rip her to tattered shreds before it's done. And you can bet Larry Mann and his producers are counting on just that. Pilar stopped pacing. I never thought of that. Honey, Renee Fox is just one of God's many custard pies. She hit you in the face, sure, but so what? Time to wipe her off. You're right. I worry about the family, about Sophie. Even though it's tabloid press, it's press, and it's going to embarrass her. I wish I knew how to shut her up. You could get a temporary restraining order. I'm a judge. I know these things. Helen said dryly. You could file suit, libel, defamation, and you might win. Probably would. But as your lawyer and your friend, my advice is to let her have her rope. She'll hang herself with it sooner or later. The sooner, the better. We're in an awful mess, Helen. I know. I'm sorry. If she says things that hint we may have arranged for Tony to be killed, that Margaret was involved... The police have already questioned us about a relationship between Margaret and Tony. It worries me. Margaret was the unlucky victim of some maniac's lunacy. Product tempering doesn't even have a target. That's why it's lunacy. Tony was deliberate. One has nothing to do with the other, and you shouldn't start linking them in your mind. The press is linking them. The press would link a monkey with an elephant if it upped the ratings and sold papers. You're right there, too. I'll tell you something, Helen. Over the anger, under the worry I felt when I talked to Renee, I realized something. I confronted her on this point because it mattered, because it was important, because I needed to take a stand. Sipping her drink, Helen nodded. And? And it made me realize that I never, not once, confronted her or any of the others, the countless other women in and out of Tony's life, because it stopped. He stopped being important. I had no stand to take. That's very sad, she said quietly. And not all his fault. No, it wasn't. She went on before Helen could do more than spit out an oath. It takes two to make a marriage, and I never pushed him to be one of those two in ours. He started chipping at your self-esteem right from the beginning. That's true. Pilar held out a hand, took Helen's glass for a small and absent sip. But a great deal that happened, and didn't happen, between us was as much my doing as his. I'm not looking back with regret. I'm looking back, Helen, because I'm never, never going to make those mistakes again. Okay, fine. Helen took the vodka back, toasted with it. To the new Giambelli woman. Since you're forging a new path... Come sit down and tell me all about your sex life now that you have one. On a low sound of pleasure, Pilar stretched her arms to the ceiling. Since you ask, I'm having an incredible, exciting, illicit affair with a younger man. I hate you. You're going to loathe me when I tell you he has this wonderful, hard, tireless body. Bitch. Laughing, she dropped onto the arm of the sofa. I had no idea, really, how a woman could get through life without having a clue what it's like to be pressed down under a body like that. Tony was slim and rather delicate. Not much of a yardstick. You're telling me. She winced. Oh, that's terrible. That's sick. No, that's great. James has a comfortable body. Sweet old bear, Helen said fondly but you won't mind if I enjoy a few thrills through your sexual adventure? Of course not. What are friends for? Sophia was ready for a little sexual adventure of her own. God knew she needed one. She'd worked herself to near exhaustion, then worried herself over the line. A swim after she'd shut down for the day had helped, then a turn in the whirlpool to loosen muscles tensed from that work and worry. She'd added one more phase to the water therapy with a long, sumptuous bath full of oil and scent. She'd lit candles throughout the room, fragrant with lemongrass and vanilla and jasmine. 
In their shifting light, she chose a nightgown of black silk with a low, lacy bodice and thin straps. Why be subtle? She'd selected the wine from the private cellar, a young, frisky Chardonnay. She set it on ice to keep it cool, curled into a chair to wait for Ty, and fell dead asleep. It felt odd sneaking into a house where he'd always been welcome, odd and exciting. He'd had moments, off and on during his life, where he'd imagined slipping into Sophia's bedroom in the dark. Hell, what man wouldn't? But actually doing it, knowing she'd be waiting for him, was a lot better than any midnight fantasy. He knew when he opened those doors, they'd fall on each other like animals. He could already taste her. He could see the candlelight beating against the glass, exotic, sensual. The turn of the knob in his hand barely made a click and rang like a trumpet in his head. He braced for her, closing the door at his back. Then he saw her curled in a ball of fatigue in the chair. Ah, hell, Sophie, look at you. He crossed the room quietly, crouched down, and did what he rarely had the opportunity to do. He studied her without her knowing it. Soft skin that hinted of rose and gold, thick, inky lashes, and a full, lush mouth perfectly shaped to meet a man's. You're one gorgeous piece of work, he murmured. And you wore yourself out, didn't you? He glanced around the room, noting the wine, the candles, the bed already turned down and heaped with pillows. The thought's just going to have to count for tonight. Come on, baby. He whispered as he slid his arms under her. Let's put you to bed. She stirred, shifted, snuggled. He decided there had to be a medal for a man who would tuck a woman who looked, smelled, felt like this one and not crawl in eagerly after her. Mmm, Ty. Good guess. Here you go, he said, laying her down. Go back to sleep. Her eyes fluttered open as he pulled the duvet up. What? Where are you going? For a long, lonely walk in the cold, dark night. Amused at both of them now, he leaned down to brush a chaste kiss on her forehead, followed by the requisite cold shower. Why? She took his hand, tucked it under her cheek. It's nice and warm in here. Baby, you're beat. I'll take a rain check. Don't go. Please, I don't want you to go. I'll be back. He leaned down again, intending to kiss her goodnight, but her lips were soft and tasted of lazy invitation. He sank into them and into her as she reached for him. Don't go, she said again. Make love with me. It'll be like a dream. It was dreamlike, scents and shadows and sighs, slow and tender where neither had expected it where neither would have asked. He slid into bed with her, floated with her on the easy stroke of her hands, the gentle rise of her body, and the sweetness of it drifted through him like starlight. He found her mouth again, and everything he'd ever wanted. Her breathing thickened as sensations began to layer. His hands were rough from work and smoothed over her like velvet. His body was hard and covered hers like silk. His mouth was firm and took from her with endless and devastating patience. No wildness here, no greed, no brilliant flashes of urgency. Tonight was to savor and soothe, to offer and welcome. The first crest was like being lifted onto clouds. She moaned under him, one long low sound as her body bowed fluidly to his. Satisfaction and surrender. She skimmed her fingers in his hair, saw the shades of it shift in the light and shadow. He did that, she thought as she lost herself in him, shifted and changed. There were so many facets to him. And here, gently, he was showing her yet another. Her fingers curled, drawing him down until mouth met mouth, and she could answer. In the dark, he could see the glint of the candlelight in her eyes, gold dust splashed over rich pools. The air was scented sweet. She watched him, and he watched her as he slipped inside her. This is different, he told her, and touched his mouth to hers as she shook her head. This is different. Yesterday I wanted you. 
Tonight, I need you. Her vision blurred with tears. Her lips trembled with words she didn't know how to say. And then she was so full of him, she could only sob out his name and give. Chapter 19 What did a 73-year-old winemaker from Italy have in common with a 36-year-old sales executive from California? Jim Bailey, David thought. It was the only link he could find between them, except the manner of their deaths. Tests on the exhumed body of Bernardo Baptista had confirmed he'd ingested a dangerous dosage of digitalis along with his Merlot. It couldn't be construed as a coincidence. Police on both sides of the Atlantic were calling it homicide and the Giambelli wine the murder weapon. But why? What motive linked Margaret Bowers and Baptista? He left his children tucked in their beds and after checking on the Giambelli vineyards, drove toward Macmillan. As the temperature had dropped, he and Polly had turned on the sprinklers, had walked the rows as water coated the vines, and the thin skin of ice formed a protective shield against the threatening hard frost. He knew Polly would stand watch through the night, making certain there was a constant and steady flow of water. Pre-dawn temperatures were forecast to hover near the critical 29-degree mark, in an instant, vines could be murdered as efficiently and as ruthlessly as people. This, at least, he could control. He could understand the brutality of nature and fight it. How could a rational person understand cold-blooded and seemingly random murder? He could see the fine mist of water swirling over the Macmillan vines, the tiny drops going to glimmer in the cold light of the moon. He pulled on his gloves grabbed his thermos of coffee, and left the car to walk the freezing damp. He found Tyler sitting on an overturned crate, sipping from his own thermos. Thought you might be by. In invitation, Ty banged the toe of his boot on another crate. Pull up a chair. Where's your foreman? Sent him home just a bit ago. No point in both of us losing a night's sleep. The truth was, Ty liked sitting alone in the vineyard, thinking his thoughts while the sprinklers hissed. We're doing all we can do, Ty shrugged, scanning the rows that turned to a fairyland of sparkle under the lights. Systems running smooth. David settled down, uncapped his thermos. Like Ty, he wore a ski cap pulled over his head and a thick jacket that repelled both cold and damp. Polly took the watch at Jim Belly. Frost alarms went off just after midnight. We were already prepped for it. This one's usual for the end of March. It's the ones that sneak in on you at the end of April, into May. I got it covered here if you want to get some sleep. Nobody's getting much of that lately. Did you know, Baptista? Not really. My grandfather did. La Senora's taking it hard. Not that she'll let it show, he said. Not outside the family, and not much inside, for that matter. But she's knocked back by it. They all are, the Giambelli women. Product tampering. It's not just that. That's the business end. This is personal. They went over for the funeral when he died. I guess Sophia thought of him as a kind of mascot. Said he used a sneaker candy. Poor old bastard. David hunched forward, holding the thermos cup of coffee between his knees. I've been thinking on it, trying to find the real connection. Probably a waste of time since I'm a corporate suit, not a detective. Tyler studied him over his coffee. From what I've seen so far, you're not much of a time waster, and you're not so bad for a suit. With a half laugh, David lifted his own cup. Steam from it rose and merged with the mist. Coming from you, that's a hell of a kudo. Damn right. Well, from what I can tell, Margaret never even met Baptista. He was dead before she took over Ivano's account and started the travel to Italy. Doesn't matter if they were random victims. David shook his head. It matters if they're not. Yeah, I've been thinking that too. Tyler got up to stretch his legs, and they began to walk the rows together. Somewhere along the way, he realized he'd lost his resentment of David. Just as well, he thought. It took so much damn energy to hold a grudge. And it was a waste of that energy and valuable time when both of them were on the same page in any case. 
They both worked for Giambelli. Both knew the family. Ty paused. Both knew Ivano. He was dead before Margaret uncorked the bottle. Still, we don't know how long she had it. He'd have had plenty of reason to want her out of the way. Ivano was an asshole, Tyler said flatly. He was a prick on top of it. But I can't see him as a killer. Too much thought, too much effort, and not enough guts. Did anybody like him? Sophie, Tyler shrugged, and wished he could keep her out of his mind for more than ten minutes at a time. At least she tried to. And yeah, actually plenty did, and not just women. It was the first time David had been offered a straight and uncensored picture of Anthony Ivano. Because he had a good line, put on a good show, slick. I'd have said grease through a goose slick, but he got away with it. As his own father did, Ty mused. Some people, they just slither through life, knocking over bystanders with, you know, impunity. He was one of them. La Signora kept him on. For Pilar, for Sophia. That's the family end. On the business front, well, he knew how to keep the accounts happy. Yeah, his expense account shows just how much he put into that effort. So with Margaret leapfrogging over him, he was losing his opportunities to wine and dine on Giambelli's tab. Had to piss him off. At the company, at the family, at her. His style would have been to try to fuck her, not kill her. Tyler stopped, his breath streaming out as he looked over the rows, scanned them line after line. It was colder now. His eternal farmer's gauge told him it was edging down toward thirty degrees. I'm not a corporate suit, but I've got to figure all this trouble is costing the company plenty in profit and in appearances, which can translate to the same thing. If somebody wanted to cause the family trouble, they found an inventive and nasty way to do it. Between the recall, immediate public panic, and long-term consumer distrust in the label, it's going to cost millions. It's going to affect profit across the board, and that includes what's yours. Yeah. He'd already faced the grim reality of that. I figure Sophia's smart enough to take the edge off that long-term distrust. She's going to have to be more than smart. She'll have to be brilliant. She is. That's what makes her a pain in the ass. Stuck on her, are you? David waved the comment away. Sorry, too personal. I was wondering if you were asking as a corporate suit, an associate, or as the guy who's dating her mother. I was aiming toward friend. Tyler thought about it a moment, then nodded. Okay, that works for me. I guess you could say I've been stuck on her on and off since I was twenty. Sophie at sixteen. He remembered. Christ. She was like a lightning bolt. And she knew it. Irritated the hell out of me. For a moment, while the misting water sizzled and froze, David was silent. There was a girl when I was in college. He was pleasantly surprised when Tyler tugged the flask from his pocket and offered it. Marcella Rue. French. Legs up to her ears. And this sexy little overbite. An overbite. Ty settled into the image. That's a good one. Oh, yeah. David drank, letting the brandy punch into his system. God, Marcella Rue. She scared the hell out of me. A woman who looks like that, who is like that, just wears you out. Tyler took the flask, drank. Me? I figured if you had to be stuck on a woman, which is an annoyance itself, you might as well get stuck on one who's easy to be around and doesn't make you jumpy half the time. I put considerable effort into that theory the last ten years. Didn't do me a damn bit of good. I can beat that, David said after a moment. Yeah, I can beat it. I had a wife, and we had a couple of kids. Good kids. And I figured we were chasing the American dream. Well, that went into the toilet. But I had the kids. Maybe I screwed up there a few times, but that's part of the job. And my focus was on the goal. Give them a decent life. Be a good father. Women, well, being a good father doesn't mean being a monk. But you keep that area down on the list of priorities. No serious relationships, not again. No, sir, who needs it? Then Pilar opens the door and she's holding flowers. There are all kinds of lightning bolts. 
Maybe. They still fry your brain. They walked the rows in the coldest hour before dawn, while the sprinklers hissed and the vines glittered, iced silver and safe. Two hundred and fifty guests, a seven-course dinner, each with appropriate wines, followed by a concert in the ballroom and ending with dancing. It had been a feat to pull off, and Sophia gave her mother full marks for helping to perfect each detail. She added a pat on the back for herself for carefully salting the guests with recognizable names and faces from all over the globe. The U.N., she thought, as she sat with every appearance of serenity through the aria by the Italian soprano, had nothing on the Giambellis. The quarter million raised for charity would not only do good work, it was damned good PR, particularly good since all members of the family were in attendance, including her great-uncle the priest, who'd agreed to make the trip after a personal and insistent call from his sister. Unity, solidarity, responsibility, and tradition. Those were the key words she was pounding into the media, and with words went images. The gracious villa opening its doors for the sake of charity, the family, four generations, bound together by blood and wine, and one man's vision. Oh, yes, she was using Cesare Giambelli, a simple farmer who'd built an empire on sweat and dreams. It was irresistible. And while she didn't expect it to turn the tide of adversity, it had stemmed it. The only irritant in the evening was Chris Drake. Missed a step there, Sophia decided. She'd issued an invitation to Jeremy de Mornay, quite purposefully, inviting a handful of important competitors illustrated Jim Belly's openness, and again, a sense of community. It hadn't occurred to her Jerry would bring a former Jim Belly employee as his date. Should have, she reminded herself. It was clever, sneaky, and slyly amusing on his part, and just like him. On top of that, she had to give Chris credit for sheer balls. Brass ones. Scored off me this round, she admitted, but felt she'd got back her own by being flawlessly gracious to both of them. You're not paying attention. Tyler gave her a quick elbow jab. If I have to, you have to. She leaned toward him slightly. I hear every note, and I can write mental copy at the same time. Two different parts of the brain. Your brain has too many parts. How long does this last? The pure, rich notes throbbed on the air. She's magnificent and nearly finished. She's singing of tragedy, of heartbreak. I thought it was supposed to be about love. Same thing. He glanced toward her, saw the sheen of tears, the single drop that spilled from those dark, deep eyes and clung perfectly to her lashes. Are those real or for the crowd? You're such a peasant. Quiet. She linked her fingers with his, allowed herself to think of nothing, to feel nothing but the music for the final moments. When the last note shimmered into silence, she rose, along with the others, into thunderous applause. Can we get out of here for five minutes now? Ty whispered in her ear. Worse than a peasant, a barbarian. Brava, she called out. You go ahead, she added under her breath. I need to play hostess. You should grab Uncle James, who looks as miserable as you do. Go out and have a drink and a cigar and be men. If you don't think it took a man to sit here and stay awake during nearly an hour of opera, baby, you better think again. She watched him escape, then moved forward, hands extended to the diva. Signora Bellissima! Pilar did her duty as well, but her mind wasn't full of music or publicity copy. It was reeling with details and timing. The chairs had to be removed, quickly and smoothly, to clear the ballroom for dancing. The terrace doors would be flung open at precisely the right minute, and the orchestra set up there would begin to play. But not before the diva had been allowed her moment of adulation. She waited while Teresa and Eli presented the singer with roses, then signaled David, Helen, and a few hand-chosen friends to add their congratulations and praise. As others followed suit, she nodded at the waiting staff, then frowned when she saw her Aunt Francesca still sitting and obviously sound asleep. Sedated herself again, Pilar thought, winding her way through guests. Don, 
She squeezed her cousin's arm, smiling an apology to the couple he'd been speaking with. Your mother isn't well, she said quietly. Could you help me take her to her room? Sure. I'm sorry, Pilar. He continued as they moved aside. I should have kept a closer eye on her. He scanned the crowd, looking for his wife. I thought Gina was with her. It's all right. Zia Francesca. Pilar leaned down, spoke quietly, soothingly in Italian as she and Don helped the woman to her feet. Ma che vuoi? She seemed dazed as she slapped at Pilar's hand. La chame in pace. We're just going to take you to bed, mamma. Don took a firmer grip. You're tired. Si, si. She stopped struggling. Vorrei del vino. You've already had enough wine. Don told her, but Pilar shook her head at him. I'll bring you some once you're in your room. You're a good girl, Pilar. Docile as a lamb, Francesca shuffled out of the ballroom. So much sweeter of nature than Jean. Don should have married you. We're cousins, Zia Francesca. Pilar reminded her. You are? Oh, of course. My mind is muddled. Traveling is very stressful. I know. You'll feel better when you're in your nightgown and in bed. Mindful of the time, Pilar rang for a maid as soon as they'd carted Francesca to her room. Though she was sorry for it, she dumped the matter on Don and rushed back to take her place in the ballroom. Problem? Sophia asked her. Aunt Francesca. Ah, that's always fun. Well, having a priest in the family should help cancel out the odd drunk. Are we ready? We are. Pilar dimmed the lights. At the signal, the terrace doors were opened and music poured in. As Teresa and Eli led the first dance, Sophia slid an arm around her mother's waist. Perfect. Wonderful job. God bless us, everyone. She blew out a breath. I could use a drink myself. When this is over, we'll kill a bottle of champagne apiece. Right now, she gave Pilar a little nudge. Dance. It looked like socializing, but it was work. Putting on the confident front, answering questions, some subtle, some not, on the situation from interested guests and the invited press, expressing sorrow and outrage, both sincerely felt, while getting the intended message across. Jim Bailey Macmillan was alive and well and making wine. Sophia, lovely, lovely event. Thank you, Mrs. Elliot. I'm so glad you could attend. Wouldn't have missed it. You know Blake and I are very active on behalf of the homeless. Our restaurant contributes generously to the shelters. And your restaurant, Sophia thought as she made appropriate noises, cancelled its standing order on all Jim Bailey and Macmillan labels at the first sign of trouble. Perhaps at some point your business and ours could work together on a fundraiser. Food and wine, after all, the perfect marriage. Hmm, well, you've known my family since before I was born. To establish intimacy, Sophia took the woman's arm, walked with her away from the music. I hope you know how much we value that association and that friendship. Blake and I have nothing but the greatest respect for your grandmother and for Eli. We couldn't be more sorry about your recent troubles. When friends have troubles, they look to other friends for support. On a personal level, you have it. But business is business, Sophia. We have to protect our clientele. As do we. Jim barely stands by its product. Any of us at any time can be the victim of tampering and sabotage. If we, and those who do business with us, allow the perpetrators of that to win... It only opens others up to the same risk. Be that as it may, Sophia, until we're assured the Jim Belly label is clean, we can't and won't serve it. I'm sorry for it, and I'm impressed with the way you're handling your difficulties. Blake and I wouldn't be here tonight if we didn't support you and your family on a personal level. Our patrons expect fine food well served when they come to us, not to gamble on a glass of wine that may be tainted. Four bottles out of how many thousands? Sophia began. One is too many. I'm sorry, dear, but that's the reality. Excuse me. 
Sophia marched directly to a waiter, took a glass of red, and, after turning a slow circle in case anyone was watching, drank deeply. You look a little stressed. Chris sidled up beside her, chose a glass of champagne. Must come from actually having to work for a living. You're mistaken. Her voice might have frosted the air between them. I don't work for a living, but for love. Spoken like a princess. Pleased with herself, Chris sipped her wine. As far as she was concerned, she had one function to fulfill that evening: to dig under Sophia's skin. Isn't that what Tony used to call you, his princess? Yes. Sophia braced for the rush of grief, but it never came. That itself was a sorrow. He never understood me. Apparently, neither do you. Oh, I understand you and your family. You're in trouble. With Tony gone and you and farm boy in charge, your company's lost the edge. Now you're flaunting yourself in your evening gowns and your heirloom pearls to try to drum up business and cover up mistakes. Really, you're no different from the guy on the corner panhandling. At least he's honest about it. Carefully, deliberately, Sophia set her wine aside and edged forward. Before she could speak, Jerry strode over, laid a hand on Chris's arm. Chris. There was a warning in his tone. This is inappropriate, Sophia. I'm sorry. I don't need anyone to apologize for me. Chris tossed back her hair. I'm not on company time here, but my own. I'm not interested in apologies from either of you. You're a guest in my home, and as long as you behave as such, you'll be treated as a guest. If you insult me here or any of my family, I'll have you removed, just as I had you removed from my offices. Don't delude yourself into thinking I'll hesitate to cause a scene. Chris pursed her lips in a kind of kiss. Wouldn't that play nicely in the press? Dare me, Sophia spat back. Then we'll see which one of us spins it best tomorrow. Either way, Chris, you'll be out on your ass, and your new boss might not care for that, right, Jerry? Sophia, how lovely you look. Helen hugged an arm around Sophia's shoulder, squeezing hard. Excuse us, won't you? She said it brightly while she pulled Sophia away. You want to turn down the kill lights in your eyes, honey? You're scaring the guests. I'd like to fry Chris with them and Jerry with her. Not worth it, sweetie. I know it. I know it. She wouldn't have gotten to me if I hadn't already been steaming over Anne Elliot. Let's just take a little walk to the powder room while you calm down. Remind yourself you put on a terrific show here. You've made an impression. Too little for too much, Sophie. You're trembling. I'm just angry, just angry. She held it in as they walked down to the family level, and scared. She admitted when she slipped into a powder room with Helen. On Helen, I poured money into this event. Money, given the situation, I should have been more careful with. The Elliots aren't going to budge, and Chris drops down like a crow, smelling fresh kill. She's just one more of Tony's castoffs, and not worth your energy or your time. She knows the way I think. There wasn't room to pace off the heat, so Sophia simply stood and simmered in it. The way I work, I should have found a way to keep her in the company, a way to control her. Stop it! You can't take on the blame for her. Anyone can see she's viciously jealous of you. I know things are shaky now, but I talked with a number of people tonight who are solidly behind you, who are appalled by what happened. Yes, and some of them may even be swayed to put their money where their sentiments are, but there are more, too many more who won't. I had reports from the waitstaff that a number of guests are avoiding the wine or watching others drink it and live first. It's horrible, and such a strain on Nana. I'm starting to see it, and that worries me, Sophie. When a company's been in business a hundred years, it has crises. This is just one of them. We've never had anything like this. We're losing accounts, Aunt Helen. You know it. There are jokes. You've heard them. Having trouble with your wife? Don't see a lawyer. Give her a bottle of Giambelli. Honey, I'm a lawyer. We've been jokes for centuries. But she stroked Sophia's hair. She hadn't realized how much the child worried. Hadn't realized it went so deep. You're taking too much of this on yourself. It's my job to maintain the image, not only as the next generation, but as an executive.
If I can't swing this, I know I put a lot of eggs in tonight's basket, and I hate seeing some of them broken. Some, Helen reminded her, far from all. But I'm not getting the message out. We're the victims here. Why can't people see that? We were attacked. We're still being attacked, financially, emotionally, legally. The police, for God's sake. There are rumors drifting around that Margaret and my father were in some sort of conspiracy together, and Mama knew. Just Renee's blathering. Yes, but if the police start taking it seriously, start questioning her as a suspect, I don't know what we'll do. That's not going to happen. Oh, Aunt Helen, it could. With Renee streaming around from talk show to tabloid, fanning the flames, and no sign of those responsible being caught, Mama's top of the list. Right along with me, she'd thought of it, hadn't been able to help it, but hearing it said so bluntly brought a chill to Helen's skin. Now you listen, no one is going to accuse you or your mother of anything. The police may look, but only to eliminate. If they step closer than that, they'll have to go through James, through me, even Link. She drew Sophia into a hug. Don't you worry about that. She patted Sophia's back and stared at her own face in the mirror. The encouraging smile was gone, and concern had taken its place. She was grateful attorney-client privilege with Teresa prevented her from adding to the girl's fears. Only that morning, all financial records of the company had been subpoenaed. Sophia freshened her lipstick, powdered her nose, and squared her shoulders. No one would have seen the fear or despair now. She glittered and glowed, her laugh warm and careless as she joined the guests. She flirted, she danced, and continued to campaign. Her spirits lifted considerably when she charmed and cajoled another major account into lifting its ban on the Giambelli label. Pleased with herself, she took a short break to harass Link. Are you still hanging around this loser? she asked Andrea. Well, he cries every time I try to dump him. I do not. I just look really forlorn. I was about to come looking for you, he told Sophia. We're going to take off. So early. The string quartet isn't really my scene. I'm just here because Mom bribed me with pound cake. But I wanted to see you before we headed out, to ask how you're holding up. Oh, fine. He tapped her nose. It's okay. Andrea knows the score. It's rough, she admitted. Nana's having a hard time accepting what happened to Signore Baptista. He meant a lot to her. I guess we're all feeling squeezed between the various investigations. In fact, I whined all over your mom a little bit ago. She's used to it. You know you can call me and whine any time. I know. She kissed Link's cheek. You're not really so bad. And you have good taste in doctors. Go. Escape. She stepped aside. Come back. She added to Andrea and began another circuit of the room. There you are. Ty caught her, pulled her toward a corner. I can't take much more of this. I'm deserting the field. Now buck up. She measured the crowd, beginning to thin, she judged, but not by much. That was a good sign. Hold out another hour, and I'll make it worth your while. My while's worth quite a bit. I'll bear that in mind. Go charm Bettina Rinaldi. She's old, influential, and very susceptible to rugged young men with tight butts. Boy, are you going to owe me. Just ask her to dance and tell her how much we value her patronage. If she pinches my tight butt, I'm taking it out on you. Mmm, I look forward to it. She circled just in time to spot an argument brewing between Don and Gina. Quickly, she cut across the ballroom. Let's not do this here. In what would be taken as an affectionate gesture, she stepped between them and linked arms. We don't need to add to the gossip mill. You think you can tell me how to behave? Gina would have wrenched her arm free if Sophia hadn't borne down. You, whose father was a gigolo, whose family has no honor. Careful, Gina, careful. That family keeps you in diapers. Let's go outside. You go to hell. She rammed Sophia hard against Don. You and all of you. Her voice spiked, causing several heads to turn. Sophia managed to drag her to the doorway of the ballroom before she broke free. 
If you cause a scene here, Sophia said, it'll cost you as much as the rest of us. Your children are Jambeli, remember it. Gina's lip quivered, but she lowered her voice. You remember it. You both remember it. And that what I do, I do for them. Don, damn it, go after her. Calm her down. I can't. She won't listen. He moved behind the doors, took out a handkerchief to wipe his sweaty brow. She's pregnant again. Oh. Torn between relief and annoyance, Sophia patted his arm. Congratulations. I didn't want another child. She knew. We fought about it. Then she tells me tonight, as we're dressing and the children are screaming and my head's bursting. She expects me to be thrilled, and when I'm not, she rips at me. He shoved the cloth back in his pocket. I'm sorry, really, very sorry, but impressions tonight are vital. Whether or not you're happy about this, you have to fix it. She's pregnant, vulnerable, and her hormones are raging. Added to that, she didn't get in that condition by herself. You need to go to her. I can't, he said again. She won't speak to me now. I was upset. All during the evening she soaked or reminded me it was God's will, a blessing. I needed to get away from her. Five precious minutes away from that nagging, so I slipped out to make a phone call. I called... There's another woman. Oh, perfect. She didn't bother to curse. Isn't that just perfect? I didn't know Gina followed me. Didn't know she'd overheard. She waited until I was back inside to confront me, to accuse, to claw. No, she won't speak to me now. Well, you both picked your moment. Please, I know what I have to do, and I will. Promise me you won't tell Tia Tarets of this. Do you think I'd go running to Nana like a tattletale? Sophie, I didn't mean it that way. Relieved at her angry claim not to be a gossip, he took her hands. I'll fix it. I will. If you could just go after Gina now, convince her to behave, to be patient, not to do anything rash. Already with the investigation, I'm under such pressure. This isn't about you, Donato. She pulled her hands away. You're just one more man who couldn't keep his dick in his pants. But it is about Jim Bailey. So I'll do what I can with Gina. For once, she actually has my sympathy. And you will fix it. You'll break it off with the other woman and deal with your marriage and your children. I love her. Sophie, you understand what it is to be in love. I understand you have three children and another on the way. You'll be responsible to your family, Donato. You'll be a man. Or I'll personally see you pay for it. Capiche? You said you wouldn't go to La Signora. I trusted you. La Signora isn't the only Giambelli woman who knows how to deal with cheats and liars. Or cowards. He went white. You're too hard. Try me, and you'll see just how hard. Now be smart. Go back in and smile. Announce to your aunt that you're about to bring another Giambelli into the world. And stay away from me until I can stand the sight of you again. She left him there, quivering with rage. Hard, she thought, maybe. And maybe part of her rage had been directed at her father. Another cheat, another liar. Another father who ignored his responsibilities. Marriage, she thought, meant nothing to some. No more than a game whose rules were broken for the thrill of it. She hurried through the family wing, but found no sign of Gina. Idiot woman, she decided, and was unsure who she disliked more at the moment— Gina or Donato? She called out quietly, peeked into the nursery where the children and the young woman hired to tend them for the evening slept. Thinking Gina might have taken her rage outside, she stepped out on the terrace. Music from the orchestra drifted out into the night. She wished she could drift herself, just leave it all to work itself out. Enraged wives, straying husbands, cops and lawyers and faceless enemies. She was tired of it. All of it. She wanted Ty. She wanted to dance with him with her head on his shoulder and all her worries in someone else's brain for a few hours. Instead, she ordered herself to go back and do what needed to be done. She heard a faint sound from the room behind her and started to turn. Gina? A vicious shove sent her flying back. Her heels skidded, lost purchase on the terrace floor. She caught a blur of movement as she fell 
and when her head hit the stone of the rail, she saw nothing but an explosion of light. Chapter 20 Tyler decided to finish off his evening by dancing with Teresa. She felt small but reassuringly sturdy in her beaded gown. Her hand was dry and cool in his. Why aren't you exhausted? he asked her. I will be when the last guest leaves. Over her head he scanned the room. Too many people left, he thought, and it was already after midnight. We could start booting them out. Unfailingly gracious. I like that about you. When he grinned down at her, she studied him carefully. None of this means anything to you. Of course it does. The vineyards. Not the vineyard style. She gestured toward the terrace doors, the lights, the music. These. The fancy clothes. The inane chatter. The wash of guilt. Not a damn thing. But you come. For your grandfather. For my grandfather. And for you, la senora. For the family. If it didn't matter, I'd have taken a hike last year when you reorganized my life. <laughs> you haven't quite forgiven me for that. She chuckled. Not quite. But he shifted her hand and, in a rare gallant gesture, kissed her knuckles. If you'd walked away, I'd have found a way to bring you back. I'd have made you sorry, but I'd have brought you back. You're needed here. I'm going to tell you something, because your grandfather won't. Is he sick? Tyler missed a step as he turned his head to seek out Eli in the crowd. Look at me. At me, she said with quiet intensity. I'd rather he didn't know what we're speaking of. Has he seen a doctor? What's wrong with him? He is sick. But in his heart, your father called him. What does he want, money? No. He knows he'll get no more money. She would have kept it to herself. She detested passing burdens. But the boy, she'd decided after much thought, had a right to know, a right to defend his own, even against his own. He's outraged. The recent problems, the scandals are interfering with his social calendar and causing him, he claims, considerable embarrassment. Apparently, the police have asked questions about him in the course of their investigation. He blames Eli. He won't call again. I'll take care of it. I know you will. You're a good boy, Tyler. He looked down at her again, forced a smile. Am I? Yes, good enough. I wouldn't shift this burden to you, but Eli has a soft heart. This has bruised it. I don't have the soft heart. Soft enough. She lifted her hand from his shoulder to his cheek. I depend on you. When his face registered surprise, she continued, Does hearing that surprise you or frighten you? Maybe both. Adjust. It was an order, smoothly given, as she stepped back from him. Now you're dismissed. Go find Sophia and lure her away. She's not easily lured. I imagine you can handle her. There aren't many who can. I haven't seen her for some time now. Go find her. Take her mind off work for a few hours. And that, Tyler mused, was akin to a blessing. He wasn't sure that he wanted it, didn't know what he planned to do with it. For the moment, he was going to tuck it away and follow the spirit of Teresa's order, find Sophia, and escape. She wasn't in the ballroom or on the terrace. He avoided asking people if they'd seen her as that smacked too close to an eager idiot trying to find his date, which he supposed was pretty much the case. Regardless, he prowled the wing, poking into a reception room where some of the guests had gathered to sit and chat. He found the Moors there, with James puffing on a cigar and Helen sipping tea while he discoursed on some ancient landmark case. Link and his date who he'd thought left an hour before, were either held hostage or enthralled on the sofa. Ty, come on in, have a cigar. No, thanks, I'm just... La Senora asked me to find Sophia. I haven't seen her for a while. Wow, look at the time. Link surged to his feet, dragging Andrea to hers. We've really got to go. 
She might have gone downstairs, Ty, Helen offered, to freshen up or catch her breath. Yeah, right. I'll check. He started down and ran into Pilar on the steps. Your mother's wondering where Sophia is. Isn't she upstairs? Distracted, Pilar shook back her hair. She wanted nothing more than ten minutes of fresh air and a tall glass of water. I haven't seen her for, oh, half an hour at least. I was just down trying to talk to Gina through the door of her room. She's locked herself in, fighting with Don, apparently. She's throwing things around, weeping hysterically, and, of course, she's woken the children. They're shrieking. Thanks for the tip. I'll make sure to avoid that part of the house. Why don't you check her room? I got enough out of Gina to know Sophia tried to referee. She might be in there cooling off. Is David in the ballroom? Didn't see him, Ty said as he walked by. He's probably around somewhere. He turned toward Sophia's room. If he found her, he thought it might be a fine idea to lock the doors and take her mind off work, as ordered. He'd been wondering all night just what she had on under that red dress. He knocked lightly, eased the door open. The room was dark and cold. With a shake of his head, he started across to close the terrace doors. You're going to freeze your excellent ass off in here, Sophia, he muttered, and heard a quiet moan. Puzzled, he stepped out and saw her in the sprinkle of light that dripped down from the ballroom. She was sprawled on the terrace, braced on one elbow as she tried to shift. He leaped forward, dropped down on his knees beside her. Easy, baby. What'd you do, take a spill? I don't know. I... Ty? Yeah, Jesus, you're freezing. Come on, let's get you inside. I'm okay. Just a little jumbled. Let me get my head clear. Inside. You took a knock, Soph. You're bleeding. I'm... She touched her fingers to the pump of pain on her forehead, then stared dully at the red smear she took away. Bleeding, she managed as her lids closed again. Oh, no, no, you don't. He shifted his grip. No passing out. His heart staggered in his chest as he lifted her. Her face was sheet white, her eyes glazed, and the scrape on her forehead was oozing blood. That's what you get for wearing those skinny heels. I don't know how women walk on them without breaking their ankles. He kept talking, to calm them both, as he laid her on the bed and turned back to shut the terrace doors. Let's warm you up some, and we'll take a look at the damage. Ty. She gripped his hand as he pulled a throw over her. Despite the pain, her mind was clearing now. I didn't fall. Somebody pushed me. Pushed you? I'm going to turn on this light so I can see where you're hurt. She turned her head away from the glare. I think I'm hurt everywhere. Quiet now, just lie still. His hands were gentle, even as his temper raged. The head wound was nasty, a vicious scrape already swelling and full of grit. Her arm was scraped as well, just below the shoulder. I'm going to get you out of this dress. Sorry, handsome. I have a headache. Appreciating her attempt at humor, he eased her forward, searching for a zipper, buttons, hooks, something. Honey, how the hell does this thing work? Under the left arm. Every inch of her was beginning to ache. Little zipper, then you sort of peel it off the rest of the way. I've been wondering what you had on under here, he babbled as he undressed her. He imagined there was a name for the strapless deal that cinched at her waist and curved up high at the hips. He'd have just called it stupendous. Stockings came up to her thighs and were hooked by little garters shaped like roses. While he appreciated the architecture of the underwear, he was more relieved that there wasn't extensive damage to the woman in it. Her right knee was a little scraped up, and the sheer silky stocking was a ruin. Someone, he promised himself, was going to pay and pay dearly for putting marks on her. But that would have to wait. Not so bad, see? His voice was easy as he helped her sit up a little to see for herself. Looks like you fell on your right side, a little bruise coming up on your hip there, scraped knee and shoulder. Your head took the worst of it, so that's lucky, considering. That's a really amusing way to tell me I have a hard head. Ty, I didn't fall. I was pushed. I know. We'll get to that after I clean you up some. When he rose, she just lay back. Get me a bottle of aspirin while you're in there. I don't think you should take anything before you get to the hospital. I'm not 
going to the hospital for a couple of scrapes and bumps. She heard water hitting the sink in the adjoining bath. If you try to make me, I'll cry and go very female and make you feel horrible. Believe me, I'm ready to make someone feel horrible. And you're in the line of fire. Don't use my good washcloths. There are some everyday ones in the linen closet and antiseptic and aspirin. Shut up, Sophie. She tugged the blanket higher. It's cold in here. He came back in carrying her Murano glass bowl, one of her best guest towels, already wet, slopping inside, and a glass of water. What did you do with the potpourri that was in that dish? Don't worry about it. Come on, let's play doctor. Aspirin, I'm begging you. He pulled a bottle out of his pocket, opened it, and shook out two. Please, let's not be stingy. I want four. He let her take them and began cleaning the head wound. It took effort to keep his hands steady, to draw breath smoothly. Who pushed you? I don't know. I'd come down looking for Gina. She and Don had a fight. Yeah, I heard about it. I couldn't find her. Came in here. I wanted a minute to myself and some air, so I went out on the terrace. I heard something behind me, started to turn around. The next thing I know, I'm skidding. Couldn't catch my balance. Then lights out. How bad's my face? Nothing bad about your face. That's part of your problem. You're going to have a knot up here, right along the hairline. Cut's not deep, just a good-sized shallow scrape. You have any impression who pushed you, man, woman? No. It was fast and it was dark. I guess it might have been Gina or Don, for that matter. They were both furious with me. That's what happens when you get in the middle. If it was either of them, they're going to look a whole lot worse than you before I'm finished. The quick little leap of her heart made her feel foolish and went a long way to cooling her own bubbling temper. My hero. But I don't know if it was either of them. Could just as easily have been someone who'd come in to poke around in my room and gave me a shove so I wouldn't catch them. We'll take a look around, see if anything's missing or messed with. Hold your breath. What? Hold your breath, he repeated, then watched her face contort in pain as he used the peroxide he'd had in his other pocket. Festa di cazzo! Coglione! Mostro! A minute ago I was a hero. Sympathetically, he blew on the sting. Better in a minute. Let's deal with the rest. La via. Would you mind cursing at me in English? I said go away. Don't touch me. Come on, be a big, brave girl. I'll give you a lollipop after. He yanked the blanket aside, dealt quickly, ruthlessly with the other scrapes. I'm going to put this gunk on them. He pulled out a tube of antiseptic cream, bandaged them up. How's your vision? Her breath was puffing from the exertion of trying to fight him off, and he wasn't even winded. It killed her. I can see you well enough, you sadist. You're enjoying this. It does have certain side benefits. Name the first five presidents of the United States. Sneezy, Dopey, Mo, Larry, and Curly. Christ, was it any wonder he'd fallen for her? Close enough. Probably don't have a concussion. There you go, baby. He kissed her sulking lips gently. All done. I want my lollipop. You bet. But he just leaned down, held on. Scared me, he murmured against her cheek. Scared hell out of me, Sophie. Hearing that, knowing that, had her heart making that same little leap. It's okay now. You're not really a bastard. Still hurting? No. How do you say liar in Italian? Never mind. It feels better when you're holding me. Thanks. No charge. Where do you keep your glittery things? Jewelry? Costume is in the jewelry armoire. The real things are in my safe. You think I surprised a thief? Easy enough to find out. He sat up, then rose to turn on the rest of the lights. They saw it at the same time. Despite the lingering pain, Sophia shot straight out of bed. There was as much anger as terror in her belly as she read the message, scrawled in red. On her mirror. Bitch number three. Chris. Damn it. That's her style. If she thinks I'm going to let her get away with... She trailed off as terror overwhelmed every other feeling. Number three. Mama. Nana. Put something on. 
Tyler ordered, and lock the doors. I'll check it out. No, you won't. She was already marching to her closet. We'll check it out. Nobody pushes me around, she said as she dragged on a sweater and pants. Nobody. They found similar messages on the bureau mirrors in Pilar's and Teresa's rooms, but they didn't find Chris Drake. There must be something else we can do, Sophia wiped furiously at the letters smearing her mirror. The local police had responded, taken statements, examined the vandalism, and had told her nothing she hadn't concluded for herself. Someone had entered each bedroom, left an ugly little message written in red lipstick on the glass, and had knocked her down. There's nothing else we can do tonight. Tyler took her wrist, drew her hand down. I'll take care of that. It was addressed to me, but she threw the rag down in disgust. The cops are going to question her, Sophie. And I'm sure she'll tell them she waltzed in here, scrawled this love note, and knocked me down. She let out a sound of frustration, then clamped her teeth down on it. Doesn't matter. The police may not be able to prove she did this, but I know she did. And sooner or later, I'll make her pay for it. And I'll hold your coat. In the meantime, go to bed. I can't sleep now. He took her hand, led her to the bed. She was still in her clothes, and he wore his shirt and tuxedo pants. He eased onto the bed with her, pulled up the blanket. Try. She lay still a moment, amazed when he made no move to touch her, to seduce, to take. He reached over, turned out the light. Ty? Mm hmm? It doesn't hurt as much when you hold me. Good. Go to sleep. And settling her head on his shoulder, she was able to do as he asked. Claremont stretched back in his chair as McGuire read the incident report. So what do you think? The youngest Miss Jim Bailey gets knocked down, banged up a little. All three of them receive an unpleasant message that smudges up their mirrors. On the surface, she said, tossing the paperwork back on his desk, looks like a prank, a female one. And under the surface? Sophia G. wasn't hurt badly, but if it had been her grandmother who walked in at the wrong time, it could have been a lot more serious. Old bones break easier. And from the timeline the locals were able to put together, she was lying out there in the night chill for at least fifteen, twenty minutes. Very unpleasant. Might have been longer if our young hunk hadn't gone hunting for her. So we have a mean prank and somebody who's doing whatever's handy to needle them. And from the youngest Jim Belly's statement, Kristen Drake fits the bill. She's denied it, vehemently, McGuire countered. But they both knew she was playing devil's advocate. Nobody can place her in that part of the house during the evening. No handy fingerprints to tie her in. Sophia G's lying about it. Mistaken? I don't think so. McGuire pursed her lips. No point in lying about it, and she doesn't strike me as a woman who does anything without a point. Careful, too. She wouldn't accuse unless she was sure. The Drake woman took a slap at her. It might be as simple as that, or it may be a lot more. It bothers me. If we have somebody who's gone to the time trouble the risk to taint wine... Somebody who was willing to kill. Why would that person bother with something as petty as a message on a mirror? We don't know it's the same person. Links, clicking on to links. That's the way he saw it. Hypothetically, using a vendetta against the Giambellis to connect. To kick at them, then. Gonna throw a big party, are you? Want to pretend everything's getting back to normal? Take this. Maybe. Drake's a connection. She worked for the company. She had an affair with Ivano. If she's pissed enough to have caused the trouble at the party, she might have been pissed enough to put a couple bullets in a lover. Ex-lover, according to her statement. She frowned. Frankly, partner, she was a dead end before, and I don't see this little sneak attack pinning her to the Ivano homicide. Different styles. It's interesting, though, isn't it? The Jim Bellies go for years, decades without any substantial trouble. In the past few months, they've had nothing but. It's interesting. Tyler paced outside with the phone, 
The house seemed too small when he was talking to his father. California seemed too small when he was talking to his father. Not that he was doing any talking at the moment, just listening to the usual gripes and complaints. He let them run through his head. The country club was rife with gossip and black humor involving him. His current wife, Ty had actually lost track of how many Mrs. McMillans there had been by this time, had been humiliated at the spa. Expected invitations for various social functions had not been forthcoming. Something had to be done about it, and quickly. It was Eli's responsibility to keep the family name above reproach, which he had obviously ignored by marrying the Italian woman in the first place. But be that as it may, it was essential, it was imperative, that the Macmillan name, label, and company be severed from Giambelli. He expected Tyler to use all his influence before it was too late. Eli was old and obviously long past the time for retirement. Finished. Tyler didn't wait for his father's assent or objection. Because here's how it's going to be. You have any complaints or comments, you direct them to me. If you call and harass Granddad again, I'll do whatever I can, legally, to revoke that trust fund you've been living off of for the last thirty years. You have no right to. No, you have no right. You never worked a day for this company any more than you and my mother worked a day to be parents. Until he's ready to step aside, Eli McMillan runs this show, and when he's ready to step aside, I'll run it. Believe me, I won't be as patient as he's been. You cause him one more moment's grief, and we'll have more than a phone conversation about it. Are you threatening me? Do you plan to send someone after me like Tony Ivano? No. I know how to hit you where it hurts. I'll see to it all your major credit cards are canceled. Remember, you're not dealing with an old man now. Don't fuck with me. He jabbed the off button, considered heaving the phone, then spotted Sophia standing at the edge of the patio. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to eavesdrop. If he'd looked angry, she could have brushed it off. But he looked miserable. She knew, how well she knew, what it was like. So she went to him, cupped his face in her hands. Sorry, she said again. No big deal. Just a conversation with dear old Dad. Disgusted, he tossed the phone onto the patio table. What do you need? I heard the weather report, so I know there's a frost warning tonight. I wondered if you wanted any company out there. No, thanks. I can handle it. He lifted her bangs, studied the healing wound. Very attractive. Those things always look worse a few days later, but I don't feel stiff when I wake up in the morning anymore. Ty, tell me what's wrong. Nothing. I handled it. Yes. Yes, you can handle anything. Me, too. We're so annoying. She gave his shoulders a squeeze. I told you where it hurt. Now you tell me. He started to shrug her off, then realized he didn't want to. My father. He's sniping at my grandfather about all the bad press, all the police business, interfering with his tennis lessons or something. I told him to lay off. Will he? If he doesn't, I'm going to talk to Helen about putting some leaks in his trust fund. That'll shut him up quick enough. The son of a bitch. The son of a bitch never did a day's work in his life. Worse, never stirred himself up to show an ounce of gratitude for what he was given. Just takes and takes. The whines if he runs into a bump. No wonder he and your father got along so well. He caught himself, cursed. God damn it, Sophie. Sorry. No, don't be. You're right. There was a bond here, she thought. That neither of them had acknowledged before. Perhaps this was the time. Ty, have you ever considered how lucky we are, you and I, that certain genes skipped a generation? Don't close off, she said before he could draw away. You're so like Eli. She combed her fingers through his hair. She'd come to love the way she could tease out the reds. Tough guy, she said as she touched her lips to his cheek. Solid as a rock. Don't let the weak space between you and Eli cut at you. As his temper deflated, he laid his forehead lightly on hers. I never needed him, my father. Not, he thought, the way you needed yours. Never wanted him. And I needed, wanted too much from mine for too long. 
That's part of what made us what we are. I like who we are. I guess you're not half bad, considering. He gave her arms a casual caress. Thanks. He leaned down, kissed the top of her head. I wouldn't mind a little company on Frost Watch tonight. I'll bring the coffee. Chapter 21 Tiny flowering buds, bursting open as the lengthening days bathed them in sunlight, covered the vines. The earth was turned, open to hold the promise of new plantings. Trees held their spring leaves in tight fists of stingy green, but here and there sprouts, brave and young, speared out of the ground. In the woods, nests were heavy with eggs, and mother ducks guarded their newly hatched babies while they swam in the stream. April, Teresa thought, meant rebirth, and work, and hope that winter was over at last. The Canada geese are about to hatch, Eli told her as they took their morning walk in the cool and quiet mist. She nodded. Her father had used that same natural barometer to judge the timing of the year's harvest. She had learned to watch the sky, the birds, the ground, as much as she watched the vines. It'll be a good year. We had plenty of winter rain. Still a couple weeks yet to worry about frost, but I think we've timed the new plantings well. She looked over the rise of land to where the ground was well plowed. She'd given fifty acres for the new plantings, vines of European origin grafted to rootstock native to America. They'd chosen prime varieties, Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot, Chenon Blanc, and, consulting with Tyler, had done much the same on Macmillan ground. In five years, perhaps four, would have seen them bear fruit. She had learned, too, to look from the moment to the future in one sweeping glance. Cycle would always spin into cycle. We'll have been together a quarter of a century, Eli, when what we plant now comes home to us. Teresa. He took her shoulders, turned her to face him, and she felt a shiver of alarm. This is my last harvest. Eli, I'm not going to die. To reassure, he ran his hands down her arms. I want to retire. I've been thinking of it, seriously thinking of it, since you and I traveled to Italy. We've let ourselves become too rooted here and there, he said, gesturing toward Macmillan land and at the Castello. Let's do this last planting, you and I, and let our children harvest. It's time. We talked of this. Five years or so, we said before we stepped aside. A gradual process. I know, but these last months have reminded me how quickly a life, even a way of life, can end. There are places I want to see before my time's up. I want to see them with you. I'm tired, Teresa, of living my life to the demands of each season. My life... The whole of it has been Giambelli. Teresa stepped away from him, touched a delicate white blossom. How can I turn from it now, when it's wounded? Eli, how can we pass something to our children that's blighted? Because we trust them. Because we believe in them. Because, Teresa, they've earned the chance. I don't know what to say to this. Think about it. There's plenty of time before the harvest. I've thought. I don't want to give Ty what he's earned, what he deserves, in my will. I want to give it to him while I'm alive. There's been enough death this year. He looked over the buds toward the new plantings. It's time to let things grow. So she turned from the vines toward him, a tall man, weathered by time, by sun, by wind, with an old and faithful dog at his side. I don't know if I can give you what you're asking me, but I'll promise to think about it. Effervescence is the essential ingredient in a sparkling wine. Pilar led a winery tour through a favorite phase, the creation of champagne. But the first stage is to make the still wine. These, she pointed at the racked bottles in the cellars, are aged for several months, then blended. We call the blend cuvée from the French, where it's believed the process has its origin. We're grateful to that very fortunate monk, Dom Perignon, 
for making the discovery and being the first to, as he called it, drink stars. If it's just wine, what makes it bubble? The second fermentation, which Dom Perignon discovered in the 17th century, her answer was smooth and practiced. Questions tossed out by groups no longer spooked her or made her scramble for answers. Dressed in a trim suit and low heels, she stepped to the side as she spoke so her group could take a closer look at the racked wine. It was initially thought to be a problem, she continued. Wine bottled in fall, popping their corks, or what was in those days cotton wadding, in the spring. Very troublesome, and in particular in the Champagne district of France. The Benedictine, the cellar master at the abbey in Auvillers, applied himself to this problem. He ordered thicker stoppers, but this caused the bottles themselves to break. Determined, he ordered stronger bottles. Both the stoppers and the bottles held, and the monk was able to sample the re-fermented wine. It was the first champagne toast. She paused to give the group an opportunity to shuffle around the racks. Voices echoed in the cellars, so she waited until they subsided. Today, a little flutter of anxiety rippled through her when David joined her group. Today we create champagne quite purposely, though for the best we follow the traditional methods developed centuries ago in that French abbey. Using method champenoise, the winemaker bottles the young blended wines. A small quantity of yeast and sugar is added to each bottle, then the bottle is capped, as you see here. She took the sample bottle to pass among the tour. The additive triggers the second fermentation, which we call, again in the French, brise de mousse. The bubbles result from the conversion of sugar into alcohol. Capped, the bubbles can't escape into the air. These bottles are then aged from two to four years. There's gunk in here, someone commented. The sample bottle demonstrates sedimentation and particle separation. This is a natural process during this second aging and fermentation. The bottles are stored neck down on these inclined racks and are lifted out and twisted every day for months. By hand? Pilar smiled at the woman who frowned at the wall of bottles. Yes. As you've seen through the tour, Jim Bailey Macmillan believes every bottle of wine offered to the consumer requires the art, the science, and the labor necessary to earn the label. This turning process is called riddling, or in French, remouage, and accelerates the particle separation so that in a matter of months the wine is clear. When it is, the bottles are racked upside down to keep the particles in the neck. If they drink that stuff, it's no wonder it kills them. It was said in a whisper, but it carried. Pilar tensed, felt her rhythm break, but kept going. It's the winemaker's task to determine when the wine's reached its peak. At this point, the bottle is frozen at the neck in a solution of brine. In that way, the cap can be removed. No wine is lost, and the frozen sediment slides out. Degorgement, or disgorging. The bottle is topped off with more wine or a bit of la dosage, brandy or sugar to sweeten it, or a little digitalis. Her rhythm faltered again and a number of people shifted uneasily. Still, she shook her head as David took a step forward. Throughout the process, as with any wine bearing our label, there are safety checks and security measures. When the sparkling wine is judged ready, it's corked and shipped to market so that you can bring it to your table for your own celebration. There are cheaper and less cumbersome ways to create champagne, but Jim Bailey Macmillan believes tradition quality, and attention to detail are essential to our wines. She smiled as she took back the sample bottle. At the end of the tour, you'll be able to judge for yourself in our tasting room. Pilar let the guests mingle in the tasting room, enjoy their complimentary samples, and answered individual questions. It was, she'd discovered, very much like entertaining. That she'd always had the knack for. Better. It made her feel not just part of the family, but part of the team. Nice job, David stepped up beside her. Thanks, despite the heckler. He isn't my first. I think I've gotten the hang of it. At least my palms don't sweat anymore. I'm still studying. 
There are times I feel like I'm back in school cramming for exams, but it's satisfying. I still have to. She broke off as a man at the end of the bar began to gag. He clutched his throat, staggered back. Even as Pilar rushed forward, he began to laugh uproariously. The same joker, David realized, who'd made the sarcastic cracks in the cellar. Before he could deal with the situation, Pilar was taking over. I'm sorry. Her voice was a coo of polite concern. Isn't the wine to your taste? He gave another snort of laughter, even as his wife jabbed her elbow viciously into his side. Cut it out, Barry. Ah, oh, come on, it's funny. Humor's often subjective, isn't it? Pilar said pleasantly. Of course, we at Jim Bailey Macmillan have difficulty finding amusement in the tragic deaths of two of our own, but we appreciate your trying to lighten the mood. Perhaps you should try it again with our Merlot. She signaled to the bartender. It's more appropriate. No, thanks. He patted his belly. I'm more of a beer man. Really, I'd never have guessed. You're such a jerk, Barry. His wife snatched her purse off the bar and steamed out the door. It was a joke, jeez! Hitching up his belt, he hurried after her. Can anybody take a joke? Well, now, Pilar turned to her group. People were either goggling or pretending to look elsewhere. Now that we've had our comic relief, I hope you've enjoyed your tour. I'm here to answer any questions you may have. Please feel free to visit our retail shop, where our wines, including those you've sampled, are available. We at Villagium Belli hope you'll visit us again and stop by our sister facility at the Macmillan Winery, only minutes away here in Napa. We wish you buon viaggio, wherever your travels take you. David waited until people began to wander off before he took Pilar's arm and led her outside. I was premature on the nice job. I should have said fabulous. Fabulous job. Though I'd have been more inclined to crack that idiot over the head with the bottle of Merlot than offer him one. Oh, I do, mentally. She drew a deep breath, stepped away from the vine-covered stone of the old winery. We get someone like Barry once or twice a week. Responding in an obnoxiously pleasant manner seems to work best. It helps that I'm family. I haven't come in before during your tours— didn't want you to think I was checking up on you. He lifted her pearls, let them run through his fingers. You, Miss Giambelli, are a natural. You know what? You're right. She agreed, delighted with herself. Just as you were right to push me into this, it gives me something tangible to do. I didn't push you. The fact that no one does is one of your secrets. You figured out a long time ago how to live your life the way that made sense to you at the time. Times changed. I opened a door, but you're the one who walked through it. That's very interesting. Amused at both of them, she cocked her head. I'm not sure my family would agree with you. I'm not sure I do. It took spine to stay in a marriage that wasn't a marriage because you took your vows seriously. It would have been easier to walk away. I know all about that. You give me too much credit. I don't think so. But if you want to be grateful I gave you a nudge into this job, I'll take it. Especially, he added, sliding his hands up her arms, if you think of a way to pay me back. I could think of something. She let her fingers link with his. Flirting, she thought, got easier with practice. She'd certainly been enjoying her lessons. We could start with dinner. I've been scoping out this little inn. That's very nice. But dinner at the inn was a date, and formal however much they enjoyed each other's company. She was, she realized, looking for something less, and something more. But I meant cooking you dinner, you and your children. Cooking? For all of us? I'm a very good cook, she informed him. And it's a rare thing for me to have a kitchen to myself. You have a nice kitchen. But if you think it'd be awkward or your kids would be uncomfortable with the idea, the inn would be fine. Cooking, he said again. Like at the stove, with pots. He lifted her off her feet for a kiss. When do we eat? We're getting a home-cooked meal tonight. Pilar's cooking. I don't know what's on the menu, but you will like it. Be home by six. Until then, try to pretend you're human children and not the mutants I won in a poker game. 
Love, Dad. Maddie read the note stuck on the refrigerator, grimaced. Why did they have to have company? How come she didn't have a say in who got to come over? Did he really think she and Theo were so brain damaged they'd believe a woman came over and fiddled around in a guy's kitchen just to cook? Please. Okay, she amended. Maybe Theo was brain damaged enough, but she'd fix that. Taking the note, she jogged upstairs. Theo was already in his room, already on the phone, already ruining his eardrums with the music up to scream. He didn't need to hit the kitchen for fuel after school, she thought with a sniff. He, in direct violation of house rules, kept enough junk food stockpiled in his room to feed a small country. She had that information tucked into her Get Back at Theo file. Miss Jim Belly's fixing dinner. What? Go away. I'm on the phone. You're not supposed to be on the phone until after you do your homework. Miss Jim Belly's coming over, so you'd better get off. She might tell Dad you're screwing off again. Sophia? No jerkweed. Listen, call you back. My sister's being a pest, so I have to kill her. Yeah, later. He hung up. Stuffed taco chips in his mouth. Who's coming over for what? The woman Dad's sleeping with is coming over to fix dinner. Yeah? Theo's voice brightened. Like on the stove? Don't you get it? Disgusted, she waved the note. It's a tactic. She's trying to squeeze in. Hey, anybody wants to squeeze into the kitchen who can actually cook is fine with me. What's she making? It doesn't matter what she's making. How can you be so slow? She's pushing it to the next level. Cooking for him, for us, showing him what a big happy family we can be. I don't care what she's doing as long as I get to eat. Get off it, Maddie. I mean get off it. Dad's entitled to have a girlfriend. Moron, I don't care if he's got ten girlfriends. What are we going to do if he decides he wants a wife? Theo considered it, crunched on more chips. I don't know. I don't know, she mocked. She'll start changing the rules, start taking over. That's what happens. She's not going to care about us. We're just add-ons. Miss Giambelli's cool. Sure, now. She's sweet and nice. When she gets what she wants, she won't have to be sweet and nice and cool. She can start telling us what to do and what not to do. It'll all have to be her way. She turned her head as she heard the kitchen door open. See? She's just walking right in. This is our house. Maddie stomped to her room, slammed the door. She intended to stay there until her father got home. She made it an hour. She could hear the music from downstairs, the laughter. It was infuriating to hear her brother's horsey laugh, the traitor. It was more infuriating that no one came up for her or tried to talk her out of her sulks. So she'd showed them she didn't care either way. She wandered down, nose in the air. Something smelled really good, and that was just another strike against Pilar in Maddie's mind. She was just showing off, that was all, making some big fancy dinner. When she walked into the kitchen, she had to grit her teeth. Theo was at the kitchen table, banging on his electric keyboard while Pilar stood stirring something at the stove. You need to add lyrics, Pilar said. He liked playing his music for her. She listened. When he played her something that sucked, she said so. Well, in a nice way, Theo thought. That kind of thing told him she was paying attention, real attention. Their mother never had. Too much of anything. I'm not good with the word part. I just like doing the melody. Then you need a partner. She turned, set down her spoon. Hi, Maddie. How's the essay going? What essay? She caught Theo's warning hiss and shrugged, not sure whether she was furious or grateful that he'd covered for her. Oh, it's okay. She opened the refrigerator, took her time selecting a soft drink. What's this gunk in here? Depends. There's cheese gunk for the manicotti. The other's a marinade for the antipasto. Your father tells me you like Italian food, so I figured I was safe. I'm not eating carbs today. She knew it was mean, and didn't need Theo's glare to tell her so. But when she made a face at him behind Pilar's back, he didn't respond in kind as he usually did. Instead, he just looked away, like he was embarrassed or something. And that stung. Anyway, 
I made plans to go to a friend's house for dinner. Oh, that's too bad. Casually, Pilar got out a bowl to begin mixing the filling for tiramisu. Your father didn't mention it. He doesn't have to tell you everything. It was the first directly rude comment the girl had made to her. Pilar calculated the barriers were down. He certainly doesn't. And as you're nearly fifteen, you're old enough to know what you like to eat and where you like to eat it. Theo, would you excuse Maddie and me for a minute? Sure. He grabbed his keyboard, sent Maddie a disgusted look. Who's the moron? He muttered as he walked by her. Why don't we sit down? Maddie's insides felt sticky, her throat hot. I didn't come down to sit and talk. I just came to get a drink. I have to finish my essay. There isn't any essay. Sit down, Maddie. She sat, sprawled, with a look of deliberate unconcern and boredom on her face. Pilar had no right lecturing her, and Maddie intended to make that very clear after the woman had blown off steam. Pilar poured herself a demitasse of the espresso she'd brewed for the tiramisu. She sat across from Maddie at the table, sipped. I should warn you I have an advantage here as I not only was a fourteen-year-old girl, but was once the mother of one. You're not my mother. No, I'm not. And it's hard, isn't it, to have a woman come into your home this way? I'm trying to think how I'd feel about it. Probably very much the way you do, annoyed, nervous, resentful. It's easier for Theo. He's a boy and doesn't know the things we know. Maddie opened her mouth, then shut it again when she realized she didn't know how to respond. You've been in charge a long time. Your men wouldn't agree, would likely be insulted by that statement, she added, and was pleased to see the faint smirk curve Maddie's lips. But the female force, a smart female force, usually pushes the buttons. You've done a good job keeping these guys in line, and I'm not here to take your control away. You're already changing things. Actions have reactions. It's scientific. I'm not stupid. No, you're smart. Scared little girl, Pilar thought, with a grown-up brain. I always wanted to be smart and never felt smart enough. I compensated, I think, by being good, being quiet, keeping peace. Those actions had reactions, too. If you keep quiet, nobody listens. You're absolutely right. Your father, he makes me feel smart enough and strong enough to say what I'm thinking, what I'm feeling. That's a powerful thing. You already know that. Maddie frowned down at the table. I guess. I admire him, Maddie. The man he is, the father he is. That's powerful, too. I don't expect you to throw out the welcome mat for me, but I'm hoping you won't lock the door in my face. Why do you care what I do? Couple of reasons. I like you. Sorry, but it's true. I like your independence and your mind and your sense of family loyalty. I imagine if I wasn't involved with your father, we'd get along very well. But I am involved with him, and I'm taking some of his time and attention away from you. I'd say I was sorry about that, but we'd both know it wasn't true. I want some of his time and attention, too. Because, Maddie, another reason I care what you do is, I'm in love with your father. Pilar pushed her cup away, and, pressing a hand to her stomach, rose. I haven't said that out loud before. That habit of keeping quiet, I suppose. Boy, feels strange. Maddie shifted in her chair. She was sitting up now ramrod straight, and her own stomach was jumping. My mother loved him, too, enough to marry him. I'm sure she did. She... No. You're going to make all the excuses, all the reasons why, and they're all bullshit, all of them. When it wasn't just exactly the way she wanted, she left us. That's the truth. We didn't matter. Her first instinct always was to comfort, console. There were a dozen things she could say to soothe, but this little girl with wet, defiant eyes wouldn't hear them. Why should she? Pilar decided. No, you're right. You didn't matter enough. Pilar sat again. She wanted to reach out, to draw this young girl close, but it wasn't the way or the time. I know what it's like not to matter enough. I do, Maddie. 
she said firmly, laying a hand over the girl's before she could jerk away. How sad and angry it makes you feel. How the questions and doubts and wishes run through your head in the middle of the night. Adults can come and go whenever they want. Kids can't. That's right. Your father didn't leave. You mattered to him. You and Theo matter most to him. You know that nothing I could say or do or be will change that. Other things could change. And when one thing does, others do. It's cause and effect. Well, I can't promise you that things won't change. Things do. People do. But right now your father makes me happy. And I make him happy. I don't want to hurt you because of that, Maddie. I can promise to try very hard not to hurt you or Theo, to respect what you think and what you feel. I can promise that. He was my father first, Maddie said in a fierce whisper. And he'll be your father last, always. If I wanted to change that, if I wanted for some reason to ruin that, I couldn't. Don't you know how much he loves you? You could make him choose. Look at me, Maddie. Look at me, she said quietly and waited for the girl's gaze to lift. If it's what you want so much, you could make him choose between you and me. I wouldn't have a chance. I'm asking you to give me one. If you can't, just can't, I'll make an excuse, clean this stuff up and be out of here before he gets home. Maddie wiped a tear off her cheek as she stared across the table. Why? Because I don't want to hurt him either. Maddie sniffled, frowned down at the table. Can I taste that? Pilar lifted a brow at her cup of espresso, then silently slid it toward Maddie. The girl sniffed it first, wrinkled her nose, but lifted the cup and tasted. Oh, it's horrible. How can anybody drink that? An acquired taste, I guess. You'd like it better in the tiramisu. Maybe. Maddie pushed the cup back across the table. I guess I'll give it a chance. One thing Pilar was sure of. No one had a problem with her cooking. It had been a long time since she'd personally prepared a family dinner, long enough for her to be outrageously pleased at the request for second helpings and the cheerful compliments between bites. She'd used the dining room for the meal, hoping that thin layer of formality would be less threatening to Maddie. But the formality had broken down the minute Theo had the first bite of her manicotti and announced it, Awesome Grub. Theo did most of the talking, with his sister watching, digesting, then occasionally skewering through with a pointed question. It made her laugh, then it warmed her heart when David used a sports metaphor to illustrate an opinion and Maddie and she shared female amusement over the male mind. Dad played baseball in college, Maddie told her. Really? Another hidden talent. Were you good? I was great. First base. Yeah, and he was so worried about his batting average, he never got past first base with the girls. Theo snickered and easily ducked David's swing. A lot you know. I was a home run. He trailed off. Any way I play that, I'm in trouble. So instead I'll just say that was an amazing meal. On behalf of myself and my two gluttons, I thank you. You're welcome. But on behalf of your two gluttons, I'd like to point out you out ate the table. I have a fast metabolism, he claimed as Pilar got to her feet. That's what they all say. Oh, no. He laid a hand over hers before she could stack the dishes. House rule. He who cooks cleans not. I see. Well, that's a rule I can get behind. She lifted her plate, offered it to him. Enjoy. Another house rule, he said over Theo's whoop of laughter. Dad gets to delegate. Theo and Maddie will be delighted to do the dishes. Figures, Maddie heaved a sigh. What do you get to do? I get to work off some of this excellent meal by taking the chef for a walk. Testing the waters with his kids, he leaned in and kissed Pilar warmly. That work for you? Hard to complain. She went with him, pleased to be out in the spring night. That's a lot of mess to leave two teenagers to handle. Builds character. Besides, it'll give them time to talk about how I lured you outside for a make-out session. Ooh, 
Have I been lured? Sure hope so. He turned her into his arms, drawing her closer when she lifted her mouth to his. A long, slow thrill rippled through him at the way she sighed against him, the way she fit. Haven't had much time to be together lately. It's hard, so much going on. Content for now, she rested her head on his shoulder. I know I've been hovering around Sophie. I can't help it, thinking of her being attacked right in our own home, knowing someone walked in and out of her room and mine and my mother's. I've caught myself lying in bed at night listening for sounds the way I never have before. I look out my window some nights across the fields and see your light. I want to tell you not to worry, but until this is settled, you will. We all will. If it helps... I feel better when I look out my window and see the light in yours. It helps knowing you're so close. Pilar. He drew her away, then lowered his forehead to hers. What is it? There are some problems in the Italian offices, some discrepancies in the figures that have turned up during the audit. I might have to go over for a few days. I don't like leaving now. His gaze shifted past her, back to the house with the kitchen lights bright in the window. The kids can stay at the villa while you're gone. We'll take care of them. David, you don't have to worry about that. No. Teresa had already decreed that his children would be guests of the villa during his travel. Still, he would worry about them, about everyone. I don't like leaving you, either. Come with me. Oh, David. There was a rush of excitement at the thought. The Italian spring, the balmy nights, a lover— how wonderful that her life had taken this turn, that such things were possible. I'd love that. But it won't do. I wouldn't feel right about leaving my mother just now. And you'd do what you have to do faster and easier if you knew I was here with your children. Do you have to be so practical? I don't want to be, she said softly. I'd love to say yes, to just run away. Feeling young, foolish ridiculously happy. She turned in a circle. To make love with you in one of those huge old beds in the castello. To sneak away for an evening to Venice and dance in the piazza. Steal kisses in the shadows of the bridges. Ask me again, she spun back to him. When all this is over, ask me again. I'll go. Something was different. Something more free about her, he realized. That made her only more alluring. Why don't I ask you now? Go with me to Venice when this is over. Yes. She threw out her hand, gripped his. I love you, David. He went very still. What did you say? I'm in love with you. I'm sorry, it's too much too fast, but I can't stop it. I don't want to stop it. I didn't ask for qualifications, just for you to repeat yourself. This is handy. Very handy. He jerked her forward, and when she started to spill into his arms, he lifted her, spun her in a circle. I had it figured wrong. By my astute calculations, it was going to take at least another two months before I could make you fall in love with me. His lips raced over her face. It was tough on me, he continued, because I was already in love with you. I should have known you wouldn't let me suffer for long. She pressed her cheek to his. She could love. Her heart glowed with the joy of it, and be loved. What did you say? Let me paraphrase. He eased her back again. I love you, Pilar. One look at you, one look, and I started to believe in second chances. He brought her close again, and this time his lips were tender. You're mine. Chapter 22 Venice was a woman, la bella donna, elegant in her age, sensual in her watery curves, mysterious in her shadows. The first sight of her, rising over the Grand Canal with her colors tattered and faded like old ball gowns, called to the blood. The light, a white washing sun, would sweep over her and lose itself like a wanderer in her sinuous veins, her secret turns. Here was a city whose heart was sly and female, and whose pulse beat in deep, dark rivers. Venice wasn't a city to be wasted on meetings with lawyers and accountants. 
It wasn't a city where a man could be content shut up in an office hour by hour, while the sweet seductress of spring sang outside the stone and glass of his prison. Reminding himself Venice had been built on commerce didn't help David's mood. Knowing the curvy streets and bridges were even now jammed with tourists burning up their visa cards in the endless shops where tacky was often mistaken for art, didn't stop him from wanting to be among them. It didn't stop him from wishing he could stroll those ancient streets with Pilar and buy her some ridiculous trinket they would laugh over for years. He'd have enjoyed that, enjoyed watching Theo inhale a gelato like water. Listening to Maddie interrogate some hapless gondolier over the history and architecture of the canals, he missed his family, he missed his lover, and he hadn't been gone fully sixty-eight hours. The accountant was droning on in Italian and in a whispery voice, difficult enough to understand when full attention was paid. David reminded himself he hadn't been sent to Venice to daydream, but to do a job. Scusi, he held up a hand. Flipped over another page of a report, fully an inch thick. I wonder if we might go over this area again. He spoke slowly, deliberately stumbling a bit over the Italian. I want to make sure I understand clearly. As he'd hoped, his tactic hit its target with the Italian's manners. The new section of figures was explained patiently. The numbers, the Italian said, switching out of compassion to English. Do not match. Yes, I see. They don't match in a number of departmental expenditures across the board. This perplexes me, Signore. But I'm more perplexed by the activities attributed to the Cardinali account: orders, shipments, breakage, salaries, expenses, all very clearly recorded. See,、si. in that area there is no. What is it? Discrepancy. The figures are correct. Apparently they are. However, there is no Cardinali account, no Giambelli client or customer by that name. There's no Cardinali warehouse in Rome at the address recorded in the files. If there's no customer, no client, no warehouse, where do you suppose these orders over the last three years have been sent? The accountant blinked behind the lenses of wire-framed glasses. I could not say. There is a mistake, of course. Of course, there's a mistake, and David believed he knew who'd made it. He swiveled in his chair and addressed the lawyer, Signore. Have you had the opportunity to study the documents I gave you yesterday? I have. And the name of the account executive in charge of this account, listed as Anthony Avano. And the invoices. The expense chits, the correspondence relating to the account, were signed by Anthony Avano. They were. Until December of last year, his signature appears on much of the paperwork. After that time, Margaret Bower's signature appears in the file. We'll need to have those signatures verified as genuine. I understand. And the signature who approved and ordered the shipments, the expenditures, and signed off on the payments from the account, Donato Giambelli. Signore Card, I will have the signatures verified. We'll look into this matter from a legal point of view and advise you of your position and your recourse. I will do that," he added, "when I have the permission to do so from Signora Giambelli herself. This is a delicate matter. I realize, which is why Donato Giambelli was not informed of this meeting. I trust your discretion, Signore. The Giambellis won't wish more public scandal." As a company or as a family, if you would give me a moment, please, to contact La Signora in California and relate to her what we've just discussed. It was always tricky for an outsider to question the integrity, the honesty of one of the core. David was neither Italian nor a Giambelli. Two strikes, he decided. The fact that he'd been brought into the organization barely four months before was the third. He was going up against Donato Giambelli, with one out already on his slate. There were two ways, in his opinion, to handle the situation: he could be aggressive and swing away, or he could wait, with the bat on his shoulder, for the perfect pitch. Back to sports metaphors, he thought as he stood at the window of his office, hands in his pockets, and watched the water traffic stream by. Apt enough. 
What was business but another game? Skill, strategy, luck were required. Donato would assume he had home field advantage, but the minute he walked into the office, he would be on David's turf. That David intended to make clear. His interoffice phone buzzed. Signore Giampelli is here to see you, Signore Carta. Thank you. Tell him I'll be right with him. Let him sweat just a little. David decided. If the grapevine here climbed as quickly as it did in most companies, Don already knew a meeting had been held. Accountants, lawyers, questions, files, and he would wonder. He would worry. He would, if he was smart, have some reasonable explanation in hand. Answers lined up, fall guy in place. Smartest move would be fury, outrage. And he would be counting heavily on family loyalty, on the stream of blood to carry him through the crisis. David walked to the door himself, opened it, and watched Donato pace the outer office. Don, thanks for coming in. Sorry to keep you waiting. You made it sound important, so I made time. He stepped into the office, scanned the room quickly, relaxed a little when he found it empty. If I'd been informed before you made your travel arrangements, I would have cleared my calendar so that I could have shown you Venice. The arrangements were made quickly, but I've seen Venice before. I'm looking forward to seeing the Castello, though, and the vineyards. Have a seat. If you let me know when you plan to go, I'll arrange to escort you. I go there myself regularly to make certain all is as it should be. He sat, folded his hands. Now. What can I do for you? Swing away, David decided, and took his place behind his desk. You could explain the Cardinelli account. Don's face went blank. As his eyes darted from side to side, he worked up a puzzled smile. I don't understand. Neither do I, David said pleasantly. That's why I'm asking you to explain it. Ah well, David. You give my memory too much credit. I can't remember every account or details of it. If you'll give me time to pull files and information, oh, I already have them. David tapped a finger on the file on his desk. Not so smart, he decided, surprised and not prepared. Your signature appears on a number of expense chits, correspondence, and other paperwork pertaining to this account. My signature appears on many such account papers. Don was beginning to sweat, lightly, visibly. I can hardly remember all of them. This one should stick out, as it doesn't exist. There is no Cardinelli account, Donato. There's considerable paperwork generated for it, a great deal of money involved, invoices and expenses, but no account. No man by the name of. He paused, flipped open the file, and drew out a sheet of Giambelli letterhead. Giorgio Cardinelli, with whom you appear to have corresponded several times over the last few years. He doesn't exist, nor does the warehouse with an address in Rome to which several shipments of wine are listed to have been shipped. This warehouse, where you, on company expense, traveled to on business twice in the last eight months, isn't there. How would you explain that? I don't understand. Donato sprang to his feet, but he didn't look outraged. He looked terrified. What are you accusing me of? At the moment, nothing. I'm asking you to explain this file. I have no explanation. I don't know of this file, this account. Then how is it your signature appears on it? How is it your expense account was charged more than ten million lira in connection to this account? A mistake. Donato moistened his lips. He snatched the letterhead from the file. A forgery. Someone uses me to steal money from La Signora, from my family, mia familia. He said, and his hand shook as he thumped it against his heart. I look into this immediately. No, not smart at all. David decided, not nearly smart enough. You have forty-eight hours. You would dare. You would dare give me such an ultimatum when someone steals from my family? The ultimatum, as you call it, comes from La Signora. She requires your explanation within two days. In the meantime, 
All activity on this account is frozen. Two days from now, all paperwork generated from this matter is to be turned over to the police. The police? Don went white. His composure in tatters, his hands began to tremble and his voice to hitch. This is ridiculous. It's obviously an internal problem of some kind. We don't want an outside investigation, the publicity. La Signora wants results, whatever the cost. Now he paused, struggled to think, to find a rope swinging over the pit he'd so suddenly found himself standing over. With Tony Avano as account executive, it's easy to see the source of the problem. Indeed, but I didn't identify Avano as the account exec. Naturally, I assumed. Don wiped the back of his hand over his mouth. A major account. I didn't qualify Cardinelli as major. Take your two days, David said quietly, and take my advice. Think of your wife and children. La Signora will be more likely to show compassion if you stand up for what's been done and stand up for your family. Don't tell me what to do about my family, about my position. I've been with Jim Bailey all my life. I am Jim Bailey, and will be long after you're gone. I want that file. You're welcome to it. David ignored the imperious and outstretched hand and closed the folder. In forty-eight hours. It puzzled David that Donato Jim Bailey was so unprepared, so clueless, not innocent. He thought as he crossed St. Mark's Square. Donato had his hand in the muck up to his elbow, but he hadn't put the scam together. He hadn't run the show. Avano, possibly, quite possibly, though the amount skimmed under his name was petty cash next to what Donato had raked in, and Avano had been dead four months. The detectives in charge of his homicide investigation would likely be interested in this new information, and how much of that dingy light would land on Pilar? Swearing under his breath, he moved toward one of the tables spilling out on the walkway. He sat and, for a time, simply watched the flood of tourists pour across the stones, in and out of the cathedral, and in and out of the shops that lined the square. Avano had been milking the company. He thought that was a given and already known. But what David now carried in his briefcase took things to another level. Donato stepped it all up to fraud, and Margaret. There was nothing to indicate she'd had knowledge of or participation in any skimming prior to her promotion. Had she turned so quickly, or had she learned of the false account, and that knowledge had led to her death? Whatever the explanation, it didn't answer the thorniest of questions: Who was in charge now? Who was it Donato was surely calling in panic for instructions, for help? Would whoever that was believe, as easily as Donato had believed, that La Signora intended to take the matter to the police, or would they be cool-headed and call the bluff? In any case, within two days, Donato Giambelli was going to be out on his ass, which added one more layer to David's headache. Don would have to be replaced, and quickly. The internal investigation would have to continue until all leaks were plugged. His own time in Italy would likely be extended, and at a point in his life where he wanted and needed to be home, he ordered a glass of wine, checked the time, then took out his cell phone. Maria, this is David Cutter. Is Pilar available? One moment, Mister Cutter. He tried to imagine where she was in the house, what she was doing. The last night they'd been together, they'd made love in his van on the edge of the vineyard. Like a couple of giddy teenagers, he remembered, so eager for each other, so desperate to touch, and remembering brought on a painful longing. It was easier, he found, to imagine her sitting across from him while the light dimming toward dusk struck the dome of the cathedral like an arrow, and the air filled with the flurry of pigeons on the wing. When all this is over, he promised himself he would have that moment with her, David. The fact that she was a little breathless made him smile. She'd hurried. I was just sitting here in St. Mark's Square. He picked up the glass of wine the waiter brought him, sipped, drinking an interesting little Chianti and thinking of you. Is there music? A small orchestra across the plaza, playing American show tunes, sort of spoils the moment. Not at all. Not for me. How are the kids? They're fine. 
Actually, I think Maddie and I are cautiously approaching friendship. She came out to the greenhouse yesterday after school. I got a lesson on photosynthesis, most of which was over my head. Theo broke up with a girl he's been seeing. Julie. Julie was last winter. David, keep up. Carrie, he and Carrie broke up, and he moped for about ten minutes. He's sworn off girls, and he intends to dedicate his life to his music. Been there. That should last maybe a day. I'll let you know. How's everything there? Better now for talking to you. Will you tell the kids I'll call them tonight? I'll make it about six your time. All right. I guess you don't know when you might be coming home. Not yet. There are some complications. I miss you, Pilar. I miss you too. Do me a favor. You've got it. Just sit there a while. Drink your wine. Listen to the music. Watch the light change. I'll think of you there. I'll think of you here too. Bye. When he hung up, he lingered over the wine. It had been an experience to talk to a woman, to her, about his children that way, to someone who understood them, appreciated them. It connected them in a way that made them almost like family, and that he realized was what he wanted. He wanted a family again, all the links that made the circle. On an unsteady breath, he set down his wine. He wanted a wife. He wanted Pilar to be his wife. Too fast, he wondered. Too much? No, no, it wasn't. Any way he looked at it, it was exactly right. They were grown-ups with half their lives behind them. Why should they waste the rest of it inching along in stages? He got to his feet, tossed some lira on the table. Why should he waste another minute? What better place to buy a ring for the woman he loved than Venice? When he turned, and the first window to catch his eye was a jeweler's, David considered it a sign. It wasn't as easy as he assumed it would be. He didn't want a diamond. It occurred to him that Ivano had probably given her one, and he discovered in himself a deep-seated aversion to giving Pilar anything Ivano had. He wanted something that spoke to the two of them, something that showed her he understood her as no one else had or could. Competitive. He supposed as he wandered into yet another shop, and so what? He climbed the stairs on the jammed Rialto Bridge, where the stores were shoved cheek by jowl on that rise above the water. Eager shoppers elbowed and shoved their way through, as if terrified the last souvenir would be snatched away before they could buy it. He bumped his way past the stalls offering leather goods, T-shirts, and trinkets, and tried to focus on the shop windows. Each one ran like rivers with gold, gems. A dazzle that confused the eye. Discouraged, annoyed, tired from the long hike, he nearly called in a night. He could wait, ask his Venice assistant for a recommendation. Then he turned, looked into one more window, and saw it. The ring was set with five stones, all in delicate heart shapes that made a quiet stream of color, like her flowers. He thought, five stones. He thought, stepping closer, one for each of them. And each of their children, he imagined the blue was sapphire, the red ruby, the green emerald, the purple and the gold stones. He wasn't as sure of. What did it matter? It was perfect. Thirty minutes later, he walked out. He had the description of the ring, amethyst and citron for the last two stones. He reminded himself in his pocket. The ring was tucked in his pocket as well. He'd had it engraved with the date he'd bought it. He wanted her to know always that he'd found it on the evening he'd sat in Campo San Marco while the light went soft, talking to her. His steps were lighter than they had been as he left the bridge. He wandered the narrow streets now, giving himself the treat of an aimless walk. The crowds were thinning as night fell and turned the canals a glossy black. Now and then he could hear the echo of his own footsteps or the lap of water against a bridge. He decided not to go back to his apartment. But ducked under the awning of a sidewalk trattoria. If he went back, he'd work and spoil the pleasure, the anticipation of the evening. He ordered the turbot, a half carafe of the house white. He idled his way through the meal, smiling sentimentally at a couple obviously honeymooning, enjoying the little boy who escaped from his parents to charm the waiters. It was, he supposed, 
a typical reaction of a man in love that he'd find everyone and everything a simple delight. He lingered over coffee and thought of what he would say, how he would say it, when he offered the ring to Pilar. Most of the squares were empty as he headed back across the city. The shops were shut down and the sidewalk grifters had long since packed up their wares. Now and then he saw the little beam of light from a gondola carrying tourists down a side canal, or heard a voice rise and carry over the water. But for the most part, he was, at last, alone in the city. Enjoying himself, he took his time, walked off the meal and let the stress of the day drain while he absorbed Venice after dark. He crossed another bridge, walked through the shadows of another twisting street. He glanced up when light poured out of a window above him, and smiled as a young woman began to draw in the wash that fluttered faintly in the breeze. Her hair was dark and tumbled around her shoulders. Her arms were long and slim, with a flash of gold at her wrist. She was singing, and the cheerful bell of her voice rang into the empty street. The moment etched itself on his brain. The dark-haired woman, who was late bringing in the day's wash, but singing nonetheless, the scent of her supper that wafted down. She caught his eye laughed, a sound full of fun and flirtation. David stopped, turned, intending to call a greeting up to her, and doing so, likely, saved his own life. He felt the pain, a sudden, horrendous fire in the shoulder, heard, dimly, a kind of muffled explosion even as the woman's face blurred. Then he was falling, falling slowly and forever to the sounds of screams and running feet, until he lay bleeding and unconscious on the cool cobbles of the Venetian street. He wasn't out for long. There was a moment when his world seemed washed with red, and through that dull mist voices rose and fell. The Italian slipped incomprehensibly through his numb brain. He felt heat more than pain, as if someone held him over the licking flames of a fire, and he thought quite clearly, I've been shot. Someone tugged at him, stirred his body so that pain woke and cut through the fire like a silver sword. He tried to speak, to protest, to defend himself, but managed little more than a moan as his vision grayed. When it cleared again, he found himself staring up into the face of the young woman he'd watched pulling in her wash. You must have worked late tonight. The words came clear in his head, slurred through his lips. Signore! Pier piacere, sta zitto, riposta, l'aiuto sta venendo. He listened solemnly, translating the Italian as slowly, as painstakingly as a first-year student. She wanted him to be quiet, to rest. That was nice of her, he thought dimly. Help was coming. Help for what? Oh, that's right. He'd been shot. He told her so, first in English— then in Italian, I need to call my children. I need to tell them I'm all right. Do you have a phone? And with his head cradled in her lap, he went back under. You're a very lucky man, Mr. Carter. David tried to focus on the man's face. Whatever drugs the doctors had pumped into him were high test. He wasn't feeling any pain, but he was hard-pressed to feel anything. It's hard to agree with you at the moment. I'm sorry, I've forgotten your name. De Marco. I'm Lieutenant De Marco. Your doctor says you need rest, of course, but I have just a few questions. Perhaps if you tell me what you remember. He remembered a pretty woman drawing in the wash and the way the lights glimmered on the water, on the stones. I was walking, he began, then struggled to sit up. Oh. Pilar's ring. I just bought a ring. I have it. Calm yourself. I have the ring, your wallet, your watch. They'll be safe. The police, David remembered. People called the police when someone got shot on the street. This one looked like a cop, not as slick as the detective back in San Francisco. DeMarco was a little dumpy, a little bald. He made up for both with a luxurious black mustache that flowed over his upper lip. His English was precise and correct. I was walking back to my apartment, wandering a little. I'd done some shopping. The ring. After work. Had some dinner. 
It was a nice evening, and I'd been shut up in an office all day. I saw a woman in a window. She was pulling in her wash. She made a picture. She was singing. I stopped to look up. Then I hit the street. I felt. Gingerly, he lifted an arm to his shoulder. I knew I'd been shot. You've been shot before. No, David grimaced. It felt. Just like you think it would. I must have passed out. The woman was there with me when I came to. She ran down, I guess, when she saw what happened. And did you see who shot you? I didn't see anything but the cobbles rushing up at me. Why do you think, Mister Cutter, that someone would shoot you? I don't know. Robbery, I guess. Yet your valuables were not taken. What is your business in Venice? I'm chief operating officer for Jim Bailey McMillan. I had meetings. Ah, you work for La Signora. I do. There is some trouble, yes, for La Signora in America. There has been, but I don't see what it has to do with my getting mugged in Venice. I need to call my children. Yes, yes, this will be arranged. Do you know anyone in Venice who might wish you harm, Mister Carter? No. As soon as he denied it, he thought of Donato. No, he repeated. I don't know anyone who'd shoot me down on the street. You said you had my valuables, Lieutenant. The ring I bought, my wallet, my watch, my briefcase. No briefcase was found. Demarco sat back. The woman who'd witnessed the shooting had claimed the victim was carrying a briefcase. She had described him very well. What were the contents、uh, of this briefcase? Papers from the office, David said. Just paperwork. It was difficult, Teresa thought, to stand up under so many blows, under such constant assault. The spirit began to wilt. She kept her spine straight as she walked with Eli into the family parlor. She knew the children were there, waiting for the call from their father. Innocence, she mused as she looked in to see Maddie sprawled on the sofa with her nose in a book, Theo banging away on the piano. Why did innocence have to be stolen this way, and so quickly? She gave Eli's arm a squeeze to reassure him, to brace herself, then stepped inside. Pilar glanced up from her needlework. One look at her mother, and her heart froze. The embroidery hoop slid out of her hands as she got slowly to her feet. "Mamma, please sit." Theo, she gestured to quiet him. "Maddie, first I must tell you, your father is all right." "What happened?" Maddie rolled off the couch. "Something happened to him. That's why he hasn't called. He's never late calling." He was hurt, but he's all right. He's in the hospital. An accident. Pilar stepped up, laid a hand on Maddie's shoulder. When the girl would have shrugged her off, she merely clung tighter. No, not an accident. He was shot. Shot. Theo shoved away from the piano. Terror coated his throat like bile. That's wrong. That's a mistake. Dad doesn't go around getting shot. He was taken right away to the hospital. Teresa continued, "I've spoken with the doctor who treated him. Your father's doing very well. He's already listed in good condition." Listen to me. Eli moved forward, took Maddie's hand, then Theo's. We wouldn't tell you he's all right if he wasn't. I know you're scared and you're worried, and so are we. But the doctor was very clear. Your father's healthy and strong. He's going to make a full recovery. I want him to come home. Maddie's lip trembled. I want him to come home now. He'll come home as soon as they release him from the hospital. Teresa told her, "I'm going to make the arrangements." Does your father love you, Madeline? Sure, he does. Do you know how worried he is about you right now, about you and your brother? And how this worry makes it harder for him to rest, to heal. He needs you to be strong for him. When the phone rang, Maddie whirled away, leaped on it. Hello, hello, Daddy. T 
tears gushed out of her eyes, shook her body down to the toes. Still, she slapped at Theo when he tried to grab the phone. It's okay, her voice broke, and she turned to Teresa. It's okay, she repeated, swiping a hand under her nose, breathing deep. So hey, do you get to keep the bullet? She listened to her father's voice and watched La Signora nod at her. Yeah, Theo's right here shoving at me. Can I hit him? Too late, she responded. I already did. Yeah, here he is. She passed the phone to her brother. You're a strong young woman, Teresa told her. Your father should be very proud. Make him come home, okay? Just make him come home. She walked into Pilar's arms and felt better for crying there. Chapter 23 Her head throbbed like an open wound, but it was nothing compared to the ache in her heart. She ignored both and took her place behind her desk. Over Eli's and Pilar's objections, Teresa allowed the children to attend this emergency meeting. She was still head of the Giambelli family, and they had a right to know why she believed their father had been hurt. They had a right to know it fell to her blood. I've spoken with David, she began, and smiled at his children. Before his doctor came in and forced him to rest. It's a good sign, Sophia ranged herself beside Theo. He looked so young, so defenseless. Guys are such babies when they're hurt. They just can't stop talking about it. Get out, we're like stoic. Theo was trying to be, but his stomach kept pitching on him. Be that as it may, Teresa continued. With his doctor's approval, he'll fly home in just a few days. Meanwhile, the police are investigating the incident. I've also talked to the man in charge of the investigation, and had, in short and ruthless order, researched his record. DeMarco would do. Teresa folded her hands on the lieutenant's file. There were a number of witnesses. They have a description, though not a particularly good one, of the assailant. I don't know that they'll find him, or that he particularly matters. How can you say that? Maddie jerked up in her chair. He shot my father. Approving the reaction, Teresa spoke to her as she would to an equal. Because I believe he was hired to do so as one buys and uses any tool. To take away papers in your father's possession, a misguided and despicable act of self-protection. There have been discrepancies in a number of accounts. The details of that can wait. It became clear earlier today, through David's work, that my nephew has been funneling money from the company into a dummy account. Donato? Sophia felt a sharp pinch in the heart. Stealing from you? From us. That Teresa had already accepted and absorbed. He met with David on my orders this afternoon in Venice and would have realized his actions would soon be uncovered. This was his response. My family has caused your pain, she said to Theo and Maddie. I'm head of the family and responsible for that pain. Dad works for you. He was doing his job. As his stomach continued to shudder, Theo clenched his teeth. It's that bastard's fault, not yours. Is he in jail? No. They've yet to find him. It appears he's run. Disdain edged her voice. Left his wife, his children, and has run. I promise you he will be found. He will be punished. I'll see to it. He'll need money. Resources, Ty put in. You'll need someone in Venice to clear this up, Sophia rose. I'll leave tonight. I won't put another of mine in danger. Nana, if Donato was using an account to skim funds, he had help. My father, it's my blood. She continued in Italian, as much as yours. My honor as much as yours. You can't deny me my right to make amends. She took another breath. Switch to English. I'll leave tonight. Hell, Tyler scowled. We'll leave tonight. I don't need a babysitter. Yeah, right. He lifted his gaze now, met hers with chilled steel. 
We've got an equal stake in this, Jim Belly. You go, I go. I'll check out the vineyards, the winery, he said to Teresa. If anything's off there, I'll spot it. I'll leave the paper trail to the paper pusher. So, Teresa thought as she looked at Eli across the room, the next step in the cycle, we pass the burdens to the young. Agreed. Teresa ignored Sophia's hissing breath. Your mother will worry less if you're not alone. No, I'll just spread the worry out over two people. Mama, Gina, and her children. They'll be provided for. I don't believe in the sins of the father. Teresa shifted her gaze to Sophia's, held it. I believe in the child. The first thing David did when he was released from the hospital, or more accurately, when he released himself from the hospital, was buy flowers. When the first bouquet seemed inadequate, he bought another, then a third. It wasn't easy carrying a huge load of flowers, one arm in a sling, through the crowded streets of Venice, but he managed it, just as he managed to find the spot where he'd been shot. He'd prepared himself for the jolt, but hadn't realized there'd be fury along with it. Someone had thought him dispensable, had pierced his flesh with steel, spilled his blood, and had come very close to making his children orphans. Someone, David promised himself as he stood on the stains of his own blood with his good arm full of flowers, was going to pay for thinking it, whatever and however long it took. He glanced up. Though there was no wash hanging out today, the window was open. He shifted his flowers, turned away from the street, and entered the building. It amazed him how exhausted he was after the climb. Limbs weak, skin slicked with sweat. It pissed him off to find himself gasping for air and leaning limply on the wall outside the apartment door. How the hell was he supposed to get back to the Giambelli apartment, pack, book a flight, when he could barely make it up these stairs? The fact that the doctor had said essentially that before David had signed himself out only annoyed him. So much so, still puffing, he straightened and knocked. He didn't expect her to be home, intended to leave the flowers on her doorstep or hunt up a cooperative neighbor who'd take them for her. But the door opened, and there she was. Signorina. See? Si. She stared at him blankly, then her pretty face lit up. Signore, come sta? Oh, oh, che bellezza! She gathered the flowers and gestured him in. I called the hospital this morning, she continued in rapid Italian. They said you were resting. I've been so frightened. I couldn't believe such a thing could happen right outside. Oh, she tapped her head with her hand. You're American, she said in careful English. Scusa me. Sorry, I don't have a good English. I speak Italian. I wanted to thank you. Me? I did nothing. Please, come in, sit. You look so pale. You were there. He glanced around her apartment, small, simple, with pretty little touches. If you hadn't been, if I hadn't looked up because you were late bringing in your wash and made such a lovely picture doing it, I might not be standing here now. Signorina. He took her hand, lifted it to his lips. Mille grazie. Prego. She angled her head. A romantic story? Come, I'll make you coffee. You don't need to trouble. Please, if I've saved your life, I have to tend to it. She carried the flowers to the kitchen. Um, one of the reasons I was walking by so late was that I'd done some shopping before dinner. I'd just bought a ring, an engagement ring for the woman I love. Oh. She sighed, laid the flowers on the counter. She took another long look at him. Pity for me. Lucky for her. I'll still make you coffee. I could use some. Signorina, I don't know your name. Elana. Elana, I hope you'll take this as intended. I think you're the second most beautiful woman in the world. She laughed and began to fill a vase with flowers. Yes. Very lucky for her. David was fed up with pain, fatigue, doctors, and the pedestrian jumble that was Venice by the time he made it back to his rooms.
He'd already come to the conclusion that he wouldn't be heading back home that evening. He'd be lucky to undress himself and get into bed, much less stay on his feet long enough to pack. His shoulder was screaming, his legs unsteady, and he cursed as he fought to work the key into the lock left-handed. Still, that left hand came up, fisted to fight, when the door jerked open. There you are, Sophia jammed her hands on her hips. Are you out of your mind? Checking yourself out of the hospital, wandering around Venice by yourself. Look at you, pale as a sheet. Men are such morons. Thanks, thanks a lot. Mind if I come in? I think this is still my room. Ty's out hunting for you right now. She took his good arm as she spoke and helped him inside. We've been worried to death since we went by the hospital and found out you'd left over doctor's orders. Even in Italy, they can't seem to make hospital food palatable. Giving in, he sank into a chair. A man could starve to death in there. Besides, I wasn't expecting anyone this soon. What did you do? Beam yourselves here? We left last night. I've been traveling a very long time on very little sleep and have spent entirely too long pacing these rooms, worried about you. So don't mess with me. She uncapped a bottle, handed him a pill. What is this? Pain medication. You left the hospital without your prescription. Drugs. You brought me drugs. Will you marry me? Morons. She repeated and stalked to the mini fridge for a bottle of water. David, where have you been? Taking a beautiful woman flowers. He sat back, reaching for the bottle, then sighing when Sophia jerked it out of reach. Come on, don't tease a man about his pharmaceuticals. You've been with a woman, having coffee. He said, with the woman who saved my life. I took her some flowers to thank her. Considering, Sophia cocked her head. He looked exhausted. A little sweaty and very romantic, with his arm in a sling and the shadows under those deep blue eyes. I suppose that's all right. Is she pretty? I told her she was the second most beautiful woman in the world. But I'll happily bump her down to third place if you give me that damn water. Don't make me chew this pill. I'm begging you. She handed over the bottle, then crouched in front of him. David, I'm so sorry about this. Yeah. Me too. The kids are okay, right? They're fine. Worried about you, but reassured enough that Theo's starting to think it's pretty cool that you got shot. Not everybody's father. Honey, don't do that to yourself. I won't. I'm not. She drew a deep breath. Anyway, Maddie was kidding about the bullet last night. She said something to you about keeping it. But she's into it now. According to my mother, wants to study it. That's my girl. They're great kids, David. Probably comes from having a father who'd think of buying flowers for a woman when he felt like something recently scraped off the sidewalk. Come on, let's get you into bed. That's what they all say. The slow, goofy grin he gave her told Sophia the medication was doing the job. Your mother can't keep her hands off me. Good drugs, huh? Really good. Maybe if I could lie down for a minute. Sure. Why don't you try it on a large flat surface? She levered him up. Sophie, Pilar's not all twisted up about this, is she? Of course she is, but she'll get untwisted when you get home where she can fuss over you. I'm okay. Just a little fuzzy in the head now. He chuckled, leaning heavily on her as she led him to the bedroom. And would have sworn he was floating. Better living through chemistry. You bet. Almost there. I want to go home. How am I going to pack one-handed? Don't you worry. I'll pack for you. You will. Really. He turned his head to give her a kiss on the cheek and missed by three inches. Thanks. No problem. Here we go. All the way down. Easy. I don't want to hurt. Oh. Oh, oh, oh! I'm sorry," she said when he yelped. "No, it's not the arm. It's in my pocket. The box rolled on it." He groped for it, swore, and felt only mildly embarrassed when she reached in to retrieve it herself. Buying baubles, are we? She flipped the box open, blinked. "Oh my!" I 
guess I should tell you. I bought it for your mother. Gonna ask her to marry me. He pulled himself up a bit on the pillow and slid straight down again. Got a problem with that? I might. Seeing as you proposed to me five minutes ago, you fickle bastard. A little teary-eyed, she sat on the side of the bed. It's beautiful, David. She'll love it. She loves you. She's everything I've ever wanted. Beautiful, beautiful Pilar. Inside and out. Second chances all around. I'll be careful with her. I know you will. I know it. The year's not half over, she said quietly. Everything's moving so fast. But some things, she added, some things are moving in the right direction. She leaned over, kissed his cheek. Close your eyes for a while, Papa. When Tyler got back, she was making minestrone. It always knocked him back a step to see her working in the kitchen. He's here, she said without looking around, sleeping. I told you he could take care of himself. Yes, he did a wonderful job of that by getting shot, didn't he? Stay away from that soup, she added as he leaned over the pot. It's for David. There's enough here for everybody. It's not done yet. You should drive up to the vineyard. You can stay at the Castello tonight. I'm having files messengered over. I can work on the computer here. Well, you worked all that out, didn't you? We're not here to sightsee. She walked out of the kitchen. He took a moment to make sure his temper was on a leash, then followed her into the small office. Why don't we just have this out? Nothing to have out, Ty. I've got a lot on my mind. I know why you didn't want me to come. Really? She booted up the computer. Could it be that I have a great deal of work to do in a short amount of time? It could be that you're pissed off, betrayed, hurt. Those things slice at you. And when you're hurt, you're vulnerable. Defenses go down. You're afraid I'll get too close. Don't want me too close, do you, Sophia? He took her chin so that she had no choice but to look at him. You never did. I'd say we've been as close as it gets, and it was my idea. Sex is easy. Stand up. I'm busy, Ty, and just not in the mood for a quick office fuck. He hauled her up fast enough, violently enough, to upend her chair. Don't try to boil everything down to that. Moving too fast, she thought again. Too many things with too much speed. If she wasn't at the wheel, how could she maintain the right direction? I don't want any more than that. Anything else is too much trouble. I said I've got a lot on my mind, and you're hurting me. I've never hurt you. He eased his grip. Maybe that's part of the problem. You ever ask yourself why you end up with the kind of guy you usually end up with? No, she tossed her chin up. Older guys, slick guys, the kind who slide right out the door when you give them the boot. I'm not slick, Sophie, and I won't slide. Then you'll just end up with rug burn on your ass. Like hell. His smile was lethal as he lifted her onto her toes. I don't slide, Sophie. I stick. You better take some time and think about that. He let her go, strode to the door. I'll be back. Frowning after him, she rubbed her arms. Big son of a bitch had probably left bruises, she thought. Don't rush on my account. She started to drop back down in the chair, changed her mind, and kicked the desk. The petty gesture made her feel marginally better. Why didn't the man ever do what she expected him to do? She figured he'd make a show at the public relations deal, then slither away, bored brainless. But he'd stuck, and that thought made her kick the desk again. They'd acted on some pure, healthy animal lust, she thought, and picked up the chair. Had some stupendous sex. She'd expected him to cool off in that area, too. But no. And what if it was true that she was a little worried because she didn't show any signs of cooling off, either? She was used to certain patterns in her life. Who wasn't? She'd never had any intention of developing serious feelings for Tyler McMillan. God, it was infuriating to know she had. Worse, he'd been exactly and perfectly right in his rundown of her. She was pissed off, 
She did feel betrayed. She was feeling hurt and vulnerable, and she wished Tyler was six thousand miles away in California, because she wanted so desperately for him to be right here, within easy leaning distance. She wasn't going to lean. Her family was a mess. The company she'd been raised to run was in trouble, and the man who would very likely become her stepfather was lying in the next room with a bullet hole in his shoulder. Wasn't that enough to worry about without thinking about her fear of commitment? Not that she had a fear of commitment, exactly. And if she did, Sophia decided and sat down again. She'd just have to think about it later. He slept for two hours and woke feeling like a man who'd been shot. David supposed, but one who'd lived through it. Now that he was sitting up and being fed minestrone, he decided he could start thinking again. You've got your color back, Sophia told him. Most of my brain too, enough to realize she was playing with her soup rather than eating it. Feel like filling me in? I can tell you what's been done or what I know. I don't imagine I can fill in all the gaps. They're looking for Donato, not only the police but a private investigator hired by my grandparents. They've interviewed Gina. I'm told she's hysterical and claims not to know anything. I believe her. If she did know something, and Don dumped her and the kids in the middle of this mess, she'd scramble to make trouble for him. They haven't been able to identify the woman he's been seeing. If he's in love with her, as he told me, I imagine Don took her along for company, so to speak. Rough on Gina. Yeah. She pushed away from the table, tired of pretending to eat. Yeah. I was mildly fond of Don. Could barely tolerate Gina and felt even less warmly toward her progeny. Now she's deserted by her cheating, stealing, possibly murderous husband. And, damn it, I can't feel for her. I just can't. It's not impossible she pushed Don financially, so he started to dip. Even if she did, he's responsible for his own choices, his own actions. Anyway, it's not that. I just can't stand her. Just can't. I'm a horrible person, but enough about me. She waved that away, picked up a small hunk of bread to nibble and tear at while she paced. It's assumed that Don had funds stashed, funds he'd bled from the company, enough to run on for a while, I suppose. But to be frank with you, he's just not smart enough to stay underground. I agree with you. He had help in all of this. My father, to a point, David said, watching her. And after he died, maybe Margaret. Their take in this, if they had one, was minimal, not enough to convince me that either of them had a starring role. She paused. You think they were used rather than users? I think your father might have simply looked the other way. As for Margaret, she was just finding her rhythm. And she was killed, Sophia said quietly. My father was killed. It could all circle back to this. Somehow, possibly. Still, Don isn't cool-headed enough, isn't long-thinking enough to have set up the kind of scam that slipped by the Giambelli accountants for several years. He was the inside man with the connections, but somebody drew the blueprint. Maybe the mistress. He added with a shrug. Maybe, they'll find him, either sunning himself by the surf on some tropical beach or floating face down in it while they look. We put the pieces back together. She came back, sat. Donato could have tampered with or hired someone to tamper with the wine. I know. I'm having trouble with the reason. Revenge? Why damage the reputation and thereby the fiscal security of the company that feeds you and kill to do it? She paused, studied his bandaged arm. Well, I guess he's shown he has no real problem with that area. He could have done it all. She pressed her fingers to her temples. Killed my father. Renee's a high maintenance woman, and Dad needed plenty of money. He knew he was being phased out of Giambelli. He'd burned his bridges with Mama, and I'd let him know he'd set the ones between us smoldering. He was responsible for his own choices, Sophia. David used her words, his own actions. I'm resigned to that, or very nearly. And I can imagine what those choices might have been. He could have pressured Don for more, a bigger cut, whatever. 
It wouldn't have been out of character for him to have threatened blackmail, in a civilized way, of course. He might have known about the tampering, about poor Signore Baptista. Then Margaret, because she wanted more, or because he was afraid she'd find out about the embezzlement. You, because he realized there was no way out. Why steal the paperwork? I don't know, David. He couldn't have been thinking rationally. I suppose he thought you'd be dead. He'd have the files, and that would be that. But you weren't dead, and it must have gotten through his head the files weren't going to hang him. He'd already hanged himself. Meanwhile, we have another public relations nightmare to get through. Ever think about ditching us and running back to Lacour? Nope. Sophia, why don't you try eating that bread instead of shredding it? Yes, Daddy. She winced at the petulant sound in her own voice. Sorry. Jet lag and general nastiness. Why don't I go deal with that packing for you, since you insist on leaving rather than staying in my sparkling company? You've got a very early flight tomorrow. He was sweating like a pig. The terrace doors were wide open, and the cool air rising off Lake Como swept into the room. It didn't stop the sweat, only turned it to ice. He'd waited until his lover was asleep before he'd crept out of bed and into the adjoining parlor. He hadn't been able to perform, but she'd pretended it hadn't mattered. How could a man maintain an erection at such a time? Perhaps it didn't matter, really. She'd been thrilled with the trip, with his sweeping her away to the elegant resort on the lake, something he'd promised dozens of times in the past and had never fulfilled. He'd made a game of it, given her a ridiculous amount of cash, so she could charge the room to her card. He wasn't known there, he told her. He wanted it to stay that way. What would he do if someone mentioned seeing him there with a woman other than his wife? He thought that had been clever, very clever. He had almost believed it a game himself, until he'd seen the news report, seen his own face. He could only be grateful his mistress had been in the salon. He could easily keep her away from newspapers, from the television. But they couldn't stay. Someone would see him, recognize him. He needed help, and knew only one source. His hand shook horribly as he dialed New York. It's Donaldo. I expected it would be. Jerry glanced at his watch, calculated. Jim Bailey had the 3 a.m. sweats, he thought. You've been a very busy boy, Don. They think I shot David Carter. Yes, I know. What were you thinking? I wasn't. I didn't. His English was failing him. Dio, you told me to get out of Venice right away when I told you what Carter said. I did. I never even went home to my family. I can prove it, he whispered desperately. I can prove I wasn't in Venice when he was shot. Can you? I don't know what good that's going to do you, Don. The story I get is you hired a trigger. Hired? What is this? They say I hired someone to shoot him. For what reason? The damage was done. You said so yourself. Here's how I look at it. Oh, it was getting better, Jerry thought. Better. Sweeter than he'd ever imagined. You killed two people. Probably three with Ivano. David Cutter he continued, amused by Donato's panic sputter. What's one more? You're royally fucked, pal. I need help. I have to get out of the country. I have money, but not enough. I need a, a, a passport, a new name, a change of my face. That all sounds very reasonable, Don, but why tell me? You can get these things. You overestimate my reach and my interest in you. Let's consider this conversation a severing of our business association. You can't do this. If they take me, they take you. No, I don't think so. There's no way to connect me to you. I've made sure of that. In fact, when I hang up the phone, I intend to call the police and tell them you contacted me, that I tried to convince you to turn yourself in. It shouldn't take them too long to trace this call back to you. That's fair warning. Given our previous relationship, I'd hit the road and hit it fast. None of this would have happened. It was your idea. I'm just full of ideas. Serenely, Jerry examined his manicure. 
But you'll note, I never killed anyone. Be smart, Don, if you can manage it. Keep running. He hung up, poured himself a glass of wine, lit a cigar for good measure. Then he picked up the phone and called the police. Chapter 24 With a mixture of regret and relief, David watched Venice recede. There's no reason for you to haul yourself out of bed and tag along to the airport this way, he told Tyler as the water taxi plowed its way through early morning traffic. I don't need a babysitter. Yeah, I'm getting a lot of that lately. Tyler sipped his coffee and hunched his shoulders against the cool, damp air. It's starting to piss me off. I know how to get on a plane. Here's the deal. I put you on at this end. They pick you up on the other end. Live with it. David took a closer look. Tyler's face was unshaven, his expression foul. For some reason, it perked David up. Rough night. I've had better. You going to be able to get back okay? Your Italian's pretty limited, isn't it? Kiss ass. David laughed, gently shifted his shoulder. There. I feel better now. Sophia giving you a hard time. She's been giving me a hard time for twenty years. It's stopped spoiling my day. If I offer you some advice, are you going to pitch me overboard? Remember, I'm wounded. I don't need any advice where Sophia's concerned. Despite himself, Tyler frowned over at David. What is it? Keep pushing. I don't think anyone's ever kept pushing her. Not the male of the species, anyway. If she doesn't kill you for it, she's yours. Thanks, but maybe I don't want her. David settled back to enjoy the ride. Oh, yeah, he chuckled. You do. Yeah, Tyler admitted. He did. Which was why he was risking her considerable wrath. She didn't like anyone touching her things, didn't like being told what to do, even— No, he corrected as he packed up her little portable office, especially when it was what was best. What the hell are you doing? He glanced up and there she was, still damp from the shower and sending off sparks of temper. Packing your saddlebags, partner. We're riding out. Get your hands off my stuff. She rushed in, snatched back her laptop— pressing it against her like a beloved child. I'm not going anywhere. I just got here. I'm going back to the Castello. Where I go, you go. Any reason you can't work there? Yes, several. And they are. She hugged the computer tighter. I'll think of them. While you're thinking, pack the rest of your gear. I just unpacked. Then you should remember where everything goes. With this indisputable logic... He strolled out. It irritated her. He caught her off guard, and when her brain was still mushy from a sleepless night. It annoyed because she'd been planning on making the drive north and spending at least a day or two working out of the Castello. It irked as she recognized how petty it was for her to sulk in silence on the drive. And it added one more layer of temper that he seemed so sublimely unconcerned. We're taking separate bedrooms, she announced. It's time we put the brakes on that area of our relationship. Okay. She'd already opened her mouth to skewer him, and his carelessly agreeable response had it hanging slack. Okay, she managed. Fine. Okay, fine. You know, we're weeks ahead in the growing season back home. Looks like they're just finishing up the new plantings. Talked to the operator yesterday. He tells me the weather's been good. No frost for weeks. And they're seeing the beginnings of new bloom. Keeps up warm through the bloom. We'll get a normal set. Oh, that's the conversion of flower to grape. I know what a normal set is, she said between her teeth. Just making conversation. He turned off the highway and started the drive through the gentle hills. It's pretty country. I guess it's been a few years since I made the trip over. Never seen it this early in the spring. She had, but had nearly forgotten. The quiet green of the hills, the pretty contrast of colorful houses, the long, sleek rows riding the slopes, fields of sunflowers waiting for summer, and the shadow of far-off mountains that were a faint smudge against a blue sky. The crowds of Venice, the urbanity of Milan, were more than highway miles from here. 
This was a little heart of Italy that pumped steadily, fed by the earth and rain. The vineyards here were the root of her destiny, had ordained it when Cesare Giambelli planted his first row. A simple dream, she thought, to grand plan. A humble enterprise to international empire. Now that it was threatened, was it any wonder she'd use whatever came to hand to defend it? She saw the winery, the original stone structure and its various additions. Her great-great-grandfather had placed the first stones. Then his son had added more. Then his son's daughter. One day, she thought, she might place her own. On the rise, with the fields spreading out like skirts, the castello ruled, gracious and grand with its colonnaded facade, its sweep of balconies, its high arching windows, it stood as a testament to one man's vision. He would have fought, she thought, not just for the ledgers, not only for the profit, for the land, for the name. It struck her here more deeply than in the fields at home, more than within the walls of her offices and meeting rooms. Here, where one man changed his life, and by doing so, forged hers. Tyler stopped so the car faced the house, its entrance gardens in young bud. Great place, he said simply and climbed out of the car. She got out more slowly, breathing in the sight of it as much as she breathed in the lightly scented air. Vines spilled over decorative mosaic walls. An old pear tree bloomed wildly, already shedding some of its petals like snow. She remembered suddenly the taste of the fruit. Sweet and simple, and how when she'd been a child the juice trickled down her throat as she walked down the rows with her mother. You wanted me to feel this, she stated, and with the hood of the car between them turned to him. Did you think I didn't? She pressed a closed fist to her heart. Did you think I didn't feel it before? Sophie, he leaned on the hood, a friendly, companionable stance. I think you feel all sorts of things but I know some of them can get lost in the worry and the, well, the now. Focus too hard on the now, you lose sight of the big picture. So you badgered me out of the penthouse in Venice so I'd see the big picture. That's part of it. It's blooming time, Sophie. Whatever else is going on, it's blooming time. You don't want to miss it. He walked back to the trunk, popped it. Is that a metaphor? She asked as she joined him, reaching by to grab her laptop herself. Me? I'm just a farmer. What do I know from metaphors? Just a farmer, my ass. She hitched the strap of the laptop over her shoulder, plucked out her briefcase. Excuse me, but I'm no longer supposed to think about your ass. He pulled his suitcase out, then studied hers in disgust. Why is your suitcase twice as big as mine and three times as heavy? I'm bigger than you. Because, she fluttered her lashes, I'm a girl. I suppose I should apologize for being snotty to you. Why? He hauled her case out. You wouldn't mean it. I'd sort of mean it. Here, let me give you a hand. She reached in, picked up the little tote that held her cosmetics, then slowly strolled away. Pilar opened the door to the police. At least this time, she thought, she'd been expecting them. Detective Claremont, Detective McGuire. Thanks for coming. She stepped back in welcome, gestured to the parlor. It's a beautiful day for a drive, she continued, but I know you're both very busy, so I appreciate the time and trouble. She'd already arranged for coffee and biscotti, and moved to serve the moment the cops were seated. Claremont and McGuire exchanged looks behind her back, then McGuire shrugged. What can we do for you, Miss Giambelli? Reassure me, I hope, which I know isn't your job. She passed out the coffee, impressing McGuire by remembering how each of them took it. What reassurances are you looking for? Claremont asked her. I realize your department is in contact with the Italian authorities. Pilar took her seat but didn't touch her coffee. She was jumpy enough. As you may already know, my mother has some influence over there. Lieutenant DeMarco has been as forthcoming as possible with information— I'm aware that my cousin contacted Jerry de Mornay yesterday, and that Jerry informed the New York police of the phone call. Jerry was concerned enough to call my stepfather to tell him directly. If you're that well informed, I don't know what we can tell you. Detective Claremont, this is my family. 
Pilar let that statement hang. I know that the authorities were eventually able to trace Don's call to the Lake Como area. I also know he was gone when they arrived to take him into custody. I'm asking you whether, in your opinion, my cousin killed my... Killed Anthony Ivano. Miss Giambelli. McGuire set her coffee aside. It isn't our function to speculate. We gather evidence. We've been connected, you and I, for months. You've looked into my life, into the personal details of it. While I understand that the nature of your business requires a certain professional distance, I'm asking for a little compassion. It's possible Donato was still in Italy. My daughter's in Italy, Detective McGuire. A man I care for very much was nearly killed. A man I was married to for half my life is dead. My only child is six thousand miles away. Please, don't leave me helpless. Miss Giambelli. Alex. McGuire began before he could finish. I'm sorry, Pilar. I can't tell you what you want to hear. I just don't have the answer. You know your cousin better than I do. Tell me. I've thought of it, of little else for days, Pilar began. I wish I could say we were close, that I understood his heart and his mind, but I don't. A week ago I would have said, oh, Donato, he can be foolish, but he has a good nature. Now there's no doubt he was a thief, that he and the man I was married to were in league together, stealing from the woman who allowed them to make a living. She picked up her coffee cup to fill her hands. Stealing from me from my daughter. But even then, even knowing this, when I tried to picture him sitting in my daughter's living room, facing a man he'd known all those years and killing him, I can't do it. I can't put the gun in Don's hand. I don't know if that's because it doesn't belong there, or because I can't bear to believe it. You're worried he'll go after your daughter. There's no reason for him to do that. If he's done all these things— isn't the fact that she exists reason enough? In her office, behind closed doors, Chris Drake raged. The Giambellis, headed by that little bitch Sophia, were still trying to ruin her. Sicked the cops on her, she thought as she pounded a fist into her palm. It wouldn't do them a damn bit of good. They thought they could weasel it all around, pin her with Tony's murder even tie her to the product tampering, to Big Shot Cutter's little accident in Venice. Shaking with fury, she thumbed open a pill bottle, dry-swallowed a tranquilizer. They couldn't prove she'd been the one to give Sophia that helpful shove on the terrace. They couldn't prove anything. So what if she'd slept with Tony? It wasn't a crime. He'd been good to her, appreciated her, understood her and what she wanted to accomplish. He'd made her promises. Promises the Giambelli bitches had seen to he couldn't keep. The lousy cheat, she thought with affection. They'd have made a good team if he'd just listened to her, if he hadn't let that whore talk him into marriage. But it all lay down on the Giambellis, she reminded herself. They'd made certain that slut Renee Fox knew about her, too. Now her name was being tossed around in the press, and she was getting smirking looks from co-workers. Just as she had at Giambelli. She'd come too far, worked too hard, to let those Italian divas ruin her career. Without Jerry's support, she might already be out on her ear. Thank God he was standing up for her, that he understood she was a victim, a target. She owed him the inside information she was passing on. Let Jim Belly try to sue her over it. Lacour would fight for her. Jerry had made that clear from the beginning. She was valued here. Lacour was going to give her everything she'd always wanted. Prestige, power, status, money. By the time she was forty, she'd be listed as one of the top one hundred women in business. She'd be the fucking female executive of the year. And not because someone had handed it to her in the cradle. Because she'd earned it. But it wasn't enough. Not enough payback for the interrogations by the police, for the smears in the press, for the slights given her when she'd been at Giambelli. Gm Belly was going down, she thought, but there were ways to make the family tremble as it fell. It was a long flight across an ocean, across a continent. He slept through most of it, and when he'd revived himself with coffee, 
called in for an update. Though he reached Eli and got filled in on what happened in Italy since he'd left, he was disappointed to have missed his kids and Pilar. He wanted home, and by the time he landed at the Napa airfield, he resented even the short drive that separated him from it. Then he crossed the tarmac to where he'd been told his driver would be waiting, and found it. Dad. Theo and Maddie sprang from opposite doors of the limo. The rush of emotion had him dropping his briefcase as he lunged toward them. He grabbed Maddie with his good arm, then had a line of pain spurting through his shoulder as he tried to hug Theo. Sorry, bad wing. When Theo kissed him, surprise and pleasure flustered him. He couldn't remember the last time this boy, this young man, had done so. God, I'm glad to see you. He pressed his lips to his daughter's hair, leaned into his son. So glad to see you. Don't ever do that again. Maddie kept her face pressed against his chest. She could smell him, feel his heartbeat. Not ever again. That's a deal. Don't cry, baby. Everything's okay now. Afraid he was going to blubber as well, Theo pulled himself back, cleared his throat. So did you bring us something? You've heard of Ferraris? Holy shit, Dad! I mean, wow! Theo looked toward the plane as if he expected to see a sleek Italian sports car unloaded. Just wondering if you'd heard of them, but I did manage to pick up a couple things that actually fit in my suitcases, which are right over there. David jerked his head. Man, and if you haul them for me like a good slave, we'll go car shopping this weekend. Theo's jaw dropped. No joke. No Ferrari, but no joke. Cool. Hey, why'd you wait so long to get shot? Smart ass. It's good to be home. Let's get out of here and. He trailed off as he looked back toward the car. Pilar stood beside it, her hair blowing in the wind. As their eyes met, she began walking toward him. Then she was running. Maddie watched her and took her first shaky step toward adulthood by moving aside. What's she crying for now? Theo wanted to know as Pilar clung to his father and sobbed. Women wait until it's over before they cry, especially when it's important. Maddie studied the way her father turned his face into Pilar's hair. This is important. An hour later, he was on the living room sofa being plied with tea. Maddie sat at his feet, her head resting on his knee while she toyed with the necklace he'd brought her from Venice. Not a little girl's trinket. She had a good eye for such things, but a real piece of jewelry. Theo was still wearing the designer sunglasses and occasionally checked himself out in the mirror to admire his European cool. Well, now that you're settled, I've got to get going. Pilar leaned over the back of the sofa, brushed her lips over David's hair. Welcome home. He might have been handicapped, but his good arm was quick enough. He reached back, grabbed her hand. What's your hurry? You've had a long day. We're going to miss you guys over at the main house, she said to Theo and Maddie. I hope you'll keep coming around. Maddie rubbed her cheek on David's knee, but her eyes were on Pilar's face. Dad, didn't you bring Miss Giambelli a present from Venice? As a matter of fact, well, that's a relief. Pilar gave his uninjured shoulder a squeeze. You can give it to me tomorrow. You need to rest now. I rested for six thousand miles. I can't handle any more tea. Would you mind taking that into the kitchen? Give me a minute here with the kids. Sure, I'll give you a call tomorrow. See how you're feeling. Don't run off, he said as she began to clear the tray. Just wait. He shifted on the couch, tried to put the words he wanted to use together in his mind as she took the tray out. Listen, Theo, you want to sit down a minute? Obligingly, visions of sports cars dancing in his head. Theo plopped down on the couch. Can we look at convertibles? It'd be so cool to tool around with the top down. Chicks really dig on that. Jeez, Theo. Maddie turned herself around until she was kneeling, her hands resting on David's knees. You don't score a convertible by telling him you're going to use it to pick up girls. Anyway, shut up so Dad can tell us how he wants to ask Mrs. Giambelli to marry him. David's grin at the first half of her statement faded. How the hell do you do that? He demanded. It's spooky. 
It's just following logic. That's what you wanted to tell us, right? I wanted to talk to you about it. Any point in doing that now? Dad, Theo gave him a manly pat. It's cool. Thank you, Theo. Maddie? When you have a family, you're supposed to stay with them. Sometimes people don't. Maddie? Uh-uh. She shook her head. She'll stay because she wants to. Maybe sometimes that's better. A few minutes later, he was walking Pilar home across the edge of the vineyard. The moon was beginning its slow rise. Really, David, I know the way home, and you shouldn't be out in the evening air. I need the air and the exercise and a little time with you. Maddie and Theo are going to need a lot of reassurance. And how about you? She laced her fingers with his. I'm feeling considerably steadier. I didn't mean to fall apart at the airport. I swore I wouldn't. You want the truth? I liked it. It's good for the ego for a man to have a woman cry over him. He brought their joined hands to his lips, kissed her knuckles as they stepped onto the garden path. Remember that first night? I ran into you out here. Christ, you were gorgeous and furious, talking to yourself. Sneaking a temper cigarette, she remembered and very embarrassed to have been caught at it by the new COO. The new fatally attractive COO. Oh, yes, that too. He stopped, pulled her gently into an embrace. I wanted to touch you that night. Now I can. He skimmed his fingers down her cheek. I love you, Pilar. David, I love you too. I called you from St. Mark's. Talk to you while the music played and the light faded. Remember that? Of course I do. It was the night you were... Shh. He laid a finger over her lips. I hung up and sat there thinking of you. And I knew. He took the box out of his pocket. She stepped back. Pressure dropped onto her chest, leaden weights of panic. Oh, David, wait. Don't put me off. Don't be rational, don't be reasonable. Just marry me. He struggled a moment, then let out a frustrated laugh. <laughs> Can't open the damn box. Give me a hand, will you? Starlight glittered on his hair, bright silver on deep gold. His eyes were dark, direct, and full of love and amusement. As her breath jerked, she could smell a hint of night jasmine and early roses. All so perfect, she thought. So perfect it terrified her. David, we've both been here before. Both know it doesn't always work. You have young children who've already been hurt. We haven't been here together, and we both know it takes two people who want to make it work. You won't hurt my kids, because as my odd and wonderful daughter just told me, you won't stay because you're supposed to, but because you want to. And that's better. Some of the weight lifted. She said that? Yes. Theo, being a man of few words, just told me it was cool. Her eyes wanted to blur, but she blinked tears away. It was a time for clear sight. You're going to buy him a car. He'd tell you anything you want to hear. See why I love you? You've got him nailed. David, I'm nearly fifty. He only smiled. And? And I... Suddenly it felt foolish. I suppose I just had to say it one more time. Okay, you're old. Got it. Not that much older than... She broke off this time, blowing out a breath when he laughed. I can't think straight. Good. Pilar, let me put it this way. Whatever your birth certificate says, whatever you've done or haven't done up to this moment, I love you. I want to spend the rest of my life with you, to share my family with you, and to share yours. So help me open this damn box. I'll do it. She expected her fingers to tremble, but they didn't. The pressure in her chest was gone, and a lightness took its place. It's beautiful. She counted the stones, understood the symbol. It's perfect. He took it out of the box, slid it onto her finger. That's what I thought. 
When Pilar went in the house, Eli was brewing tea in the kitchen. How's David doing? Well, I think, better than I'd imagined. She ran her thumb over the ring that felt so new and so right on her finger. He just needs to rest. Don't we all? He sighed. Your mother went up to her office. I'm worried about her, Pilar. She's barely eaten today. I'll go up, take her some tea. She rubbed a hand over his back. We'll all get through this, Eli. I know it. I believe it, but I'm starting to wonder at the cost. She's a proud woman. This is damaging that part of her. Eli's worry wormed its way into Pilar as she carried the tray to her mother's office. It occurred to her that it was the second time in one evening she'd brought tea to someone who probably didn't want it. Still, it was a gesture meant to soothe, and she would do her best. The door was open, and Teresa was at her desk. A logbook was open on it. Mama, Pilar sailed in. I wish you wouldn't work so hard. You put the rest of us to shame. I'm not in the mood for tea, Pilar, or company. Well, I am. She set the tray on the table and began to pour. David's looking remarkably well. You'll see for yourself tomorrow. It shames me. One of my own would do such a thing. And of course you're responsible as always. Who else? The man who shot him. I used to think, used to let myself think that I was responsible for the shameful things Tony did. You weren't blood. No, I chose him, and that's worse. But I wasn't responsible for what he did. He was. If there was responsibility on my part, it was for allowing him to do what he did to me and to Sophia. She brought the tea to the desk, set the cup down. Giambelli is more than wine. Ah, you think I need to be told that? I think you need to be told it now. I think you need to be reminded of all it's done, all the good, the millions of dollars to charity the family has dispersed over the years, the countless families who've made their livings through the company, field workers, winemakers, bottlers, distributors, factory workers, clerks. Every one of them depends on us. And what do we do, Mama? She sat on the side of the desk, saw with satisfaction that she had her mother's full attention. We work, worry, and we gamble every season on the weather. We do our best, and we hold faith. That hasn't changed. It never will. Was I unfair to him, Pilar? To the notto? You'd question yourself. Now I see why Eli's worried. If I tell you the truth, will you believe me? Tired, Teresa got up from the desk, walked to the window. She couldn't see the vineyards in the dark, but she saw them in her mind. You don't lie. Why wouldn't I believe you? You can be hard. It's frightening sometimes. When I was little, I'd see you striding out along the rows, and I'd think you were like a general out of one of my history books, straight and stern. Then you might stop, study the vine, speak with one of the workers. You always knew their names. A good general knows her troops. No, Mama, most don't. They're faceless, nameless pawns. Have to be for the general to so ruthlessly send them to battle. You always knew their names because it always mattered to you who they were. Sophia knows too. That was your gift to her. God, you comfort me. I hope I do. You've never been unfair, not to Donato, not to anyone, and you aren't responsible for the acts of greed or cruelty or selfishness of those who only see faceless pawns. Pilar, Teresa laid her forehead on the window glass, such a rare gesture of fatigue that Pilar rose quickly to go to her. Signore Baptista, he haunts me. Mama, he'd never blame you. He'd never blame La Signora, and I think he'd be disappointed in you if you blamed yourself. I hope you're right. Maybe I will have tea. She turned, touched Pilar's cheek. You have a good, strong heart. I always knew that, but you have clearer vision than I once gave you credit for. Broader, I think. It took me a long time to work up the courage to take the blinders off.
It's changed my life. For the good. I'll think about what you said. She started to sit, then saw the flash of stones on Pilar's finger. Teresa's hand whipped out, snake fast, and grabbed. So, what is this? It's a ring. I see it's a ring, Teresa said dryly. But not, I think, another you've brought to replace what you once wore there. No, I didn't buy it, and it's not a replacement. Your tea's getting cold. You weren't wearing such a ring when you left to pick up David to take him home. Nothing wrong with your eyesight, even when you're brooding. All right. I just wanted to call Sophia first to... Mama, David asked me to marry him. I said yes. I see. That's it? That's all you have to say? I'm not finished. Theresa tugged Pilar's hand under the desk light, examined the ring, the stones. She, too, recognized symbols and valued such things. He gave you a family to wear on your hand. Yes, his and mine, ours. Difficult for a woman with your heart to refuse such a gesture. Her fingers curled tight into Pilar's. You told me what you thought about something in my heart. Now, I'll tell you. Once, a man asked you to marry him. You said yes. Ah. She lifted a finger before Pilar could speak. You were a girl then. You're a woman now. And you've chosen a better man. Tar. Teresa framed Pilar's face, kissed both her cheeks. I'm happy for you. Now I have a question. All right. Why did you send him home, then bring me tea? Why didn't you bring him in to ask my blessing, and Eli's and drink champagne as is proper? Never mind. She waved it away. Call him now. Tell them all to come. Mama, he's tired, not well. Not so tired and well enough to have mussed your hair and kissed the lipstick off your mouth. Call. She ordered in a tone that cut off any argument. This needs to be done properly, with family. We'll go down, open our best vintage, and call Sofia at the Castello. I approve of his children, she added, turning to the desk to close her logbook and return it to its place. The girl will have my mother's seed pearls, and the boy my father's silver cuff links. Thank you, Mama. You've given me, all of us, something to celebrate. Tell them to hurry up, she ordered, and strode out, straight and slim, calling for Maria to bring the wine. Part 4 The Fruit Who buys a minute's mirth to wail a week, or sells eternity to get a toy? For one sweet grape, who will the vine destroy? William Shakespeare Chapter 25 Tyler was filthy. His back carried a nagging ache dead center, and he had a nasty scrape, poorly bandaged, across the knuckles of his left hand. He was in heaven. The mountains here weren't so different from the jagged outcroppings of his own vacas. Where his soil was gravelly, this was rocky, but still high in the pH that would produce a soft wine. He could understand why Cesare Giambelli had put the roots of his dream here, had fought his plow through this rocky soil. There was a rough beauty in the shadow of these hills that called to certain men, that challenged them. It wasn't a matter of taming it, Ty reflected, but of accepting it for what it was, and all it could be. If he had to spend time away from his own vineyards, this was the place to do it. The weather was perfect, the days long and sweet— and the Castello operator more than willing to use the time and skill of another vintner. And the muscle of one, Tyler thought as he strolled back through the rows toward the great house. He'd spent a good part of his days helping the crew install new pipelines from the reservoir for the young plantings. It was a good system, well planned, and the hours he'd spent with the crew had given him a chance to have a hand in this arm of the company, and to casually question the men about Donato. The language barrier wasn't as much of a problem as he'd anticipated. 
Those who didn't speak English were still willing to talk, with hand signals, facial expressions, and the generous assistance of various interpreters. Tyler got a clear enough picture. There wasn't a man in the fields who considered Donato Giambelli more than a joke. Now, with the shadows lengthening toward evening, Tyler considered that opinion. He moved from field to garden where hydrangeas bloomed big as basketballs, and rivers of pale pink impatiens wound a trail up a slope toward a grotto. Water spewed there in a fountain guarded by Poseidon. The Italians, he thought, were big on their gods and their fountains and flowers. Cesare Giampelli had certainly used them all here in this pretty palace tucked in the hills. A very rich little palace, Tyler mused, setting his hands on his hips as he turned a slow circle. The kind of place an ambitious man with a demanding wife would covet. Personally, he thought it was a nice place to visit, but how could anyone live there with all those rooms, all those servants? The grounds alone with the gardens, the lawns, the trees, the pools and statuary would require a small army to maintain. Then again, some men like to have little armies at their disposal. He passed between the mosaic walls with their bas-relief figures of well-endowed nymphs, walked down the steps circling yet another pool swimming with lily pads. From there he couldn't see the fields, the heart of the realm. More accurately, he decided, those who worked the fields couldn't see whoever lingered here. He supposed Cesare had wanted some privacy in certain corners of his empire. What could be seen, beyond the flowers, the sprawl of terraces, was the swimming pool, and rising out of it like Venus was Sophia. She wore a simple black suit that sleeked over her body like the water that streamed from it. Her hair was slicked back, and he could see the glint of something, probably diamonds, fire at her ears. Who but Sophia would swim wearing diamonds? Watching her, he felt an uncomfortable combination of lust and longing. She was perfect, elegant, lusty, and clever. He wondered, as his belly tightened at the sight of her, if there was anything more unsettling to a man than perfection in a woman. One thing he decided as he started toward her, loving that woman to the point of stupidity. Water must be cold. She went still the towel she'd picked up concealing her face for another instant. It was. I wanted it cold. Casually, she laid the towel aside and took her time slipping into a terry cloth robe. She knew he looked at her, studied her in that thorough and patient way of his. She wanted him to. Every time she'd passed a window that day, she looked toward the fields, picked him out among the men. She studied him. You're filthy. Yeah. And pleased to be so, she decided. Filthy, she thought, sweaty, and gorgeous in a primitive way that shouldn't be so damned appealing. What did you do to your hand? Scraped several layers of skin off, that's all. He turned it over, glancing at it. I could use a drink. Honey, you could use a shower. Both. Why don't I clean up? I'll meet you in the center courtyard in an hour. Why? We'll open a bottle of wine and tell each other all about our day. Couple things I want to run by you. All right, that suits me. I have a few things of my own. Some of us can dig without ending up covered with dirt. Wear something pretty, he called after her, and grinned when she glanced back over her shoulder. Just because I'm not touching doesn't mean I don't like to look. He picked up the damp towel when she went into the house, breathed in the scent of her. Beauty, he thought, was rough on a man. No, he didn't want to tame her any more than he wanted to tame the land, but by God, it was time for acceptance on both sides. She was going to give him plenty to look at, plenty to wish for. She was, after all, an expert at packaging. She wore blue, the color of a lightning strike. The bodice dipped low to frame the rising swell of her breasts, rose high to showcase the long, slim length of her thighs. She added a thin chain of diamonds with a single sapphire drop that lay cozily at her cleavage. She slipped into ice-pick heels, dabbed scent in all the right places, and considered herself ready, and looked at herself in the mirror. Why was she so unhappy? The turmoil around her was upsetting. It was challenging. 
but it wasn't the cause of this gut-deep unhappiness. She was all right when she was working, when she was focused on what had to be done and how best to do it. But the minute she stopped, the minute her mind drifted from the immediate task at hand, there it was, the dragging sadness, the flattening of spirit, and with it, she admitted, an anger she couldn't identify. She didn't even know whom she was angry with anymore. Don, her father, herself, Ty. What did it matter? She would do what needed to be done and worry about the rest later. For now, she'd have some wine and conversation, fill Tyler in on what she'd learned that day, and have the side benefit of putting him in a sexual spin. All in all, a fine way to spend the evening. God, I hate myself, she said aloud, and I don't know why. She kept him waiting, but he'd expected that. The fact was it gave him time to put everything in place. The tiled courtyard was shadowy with evening. Candlelight speared up from the table, from torchères lanced in the circling garden, from luminaries tucked among the flower pots. He'd chosen the wine, a soft young white, and had begged some canapes from the kitchen staff, the staff, he'd noted, who were devoted to Sophia and appreciated the flavor of romance. A good thing, he decided, as they'd been the ones to scurry around setting up the candles, adding little bottles of spring flowers he'd never have thought of, even putting music on low through the outdoor speakers. He could only hope he lived up to their expectations. He heard the sound of her heels on the tiles, but didn't get up. Sophia, he thought, was too used to men springing to attention in her presence, or falling at her feet. What's all this? The staff got into it. He gestured to the chair beside him. Ask for a little wine and cheese around here, you get the royal treatment. He looked at her while he took the wine from the bucket. Look what happens when I ask you to wear something pretty. Comes from being in a castle. Not your style, but you seem to be coping. Digging a few ditches today put me in a good mood. He handed her a glass, tapped his to it. Salute. As I said, I did some digging of my own. The domestic staff's been very informative. I've learned Don made regular visits here, unreported visits, while he never stayed here alone. He rarely came with Gina. Ah, the love nest. Apparently. The mistress's name is Signorina Quetzo. She's young, blonde, silly, and likes breakfast in bed. She's been a frequent guest for the last few years. Don insulted the staff by bribing them to keep her visit secret, but since no one here has any love for Gina, they took his money and complied. They'd have been discreet without the money, of course. Of course. They tell you about his other visitors? Yes. My father, but we'd already deduced that, and the woman my father came with once, who wasn't Renee. Chris. Tyler frowned into his wine. I didn't get that from the vineyard. Easier for me to nudge it out of the domestic staff. Anyway, it's hardly fresh news. It's fairly obvious he'd used my apartment for assignations when it suited him. Why not the Castello? You don't want me to say I'm sorry, but I am. No, I don't mind you saying it. I'm sorry, too. It makes it that much more lovely that Mama's found someone who'll make her happy, someone she can trust, someone we all can trust. I say that knowing he once worked for Jerry de Mornay at Lacour and that Jerry's also been a guest here. This time Tyler nodded. I thought so. The crew could only give me a description, and that wasn't clear. They tend to pay more attention to women than men in suits. Ties it together, doesn't it? Does it? Restless, she rose, sipping her wine as she paced. Jerry hated my father. A civilized sort of loathing I'd always assumed. Why? You really stay out of the loop, don't you? she replied. A few years back, my father had a blistering affair with Jerry's wife. They kept it quiet, but it was still fairly common knowledge in the inner circle. She left Jerry, or he kicked her out. That piece of the pie gets served up differently depending on who's cutting it. Jerry and my father had been reasonably friendly before that, and after things chilled. But there was some heat under the chill, which I discovered two years ago when Jerry hit on me. He came on to you? Clear and strong. I wasn't interested. He was annoyed and had a number of uncomplimentary things to say about my father, me, my family. 
Damn it, Sophie, why didn't you mention this before? Because he made a point of coming to see me the very next day full of apologies. He said he'd been more upset about the divorce than he'd realized, felt terrible and ashamed at taking it out on me, and that he'd come to terms with the fact that his marriage had been over before all of that happened, and so on and so forth. It was reasonable, understandable. He said all the right things, and I didn't think of it again. What do you think of it now? I see a crafty little triangle. My father, Chris, Jerry. Who was using whom, I can't say, but I think Jerry's involved, or at least knows about the embezzlement, maybe even the tampering. It would be profitable for Lacour, has been, for Jim Belly to be fighting consumer unease, public scandal, internal discord. Add Chris in, and you have my plans, my campaign, my work tossed in their lap before I have a chance to implement them. Corporate sabotage, spies, that's common enough in business. Murder isn't. No, that's what makes it personal. He could have killed my father. I can more easily see him with a gun in his hand than I can Donato. I don't know if that's wishful thinking. It's a long way from corporate espionage to cold-blooded murder, but... But? Hindsight, she said with a shrug. Thinking back on the things he said to me when he lost control, and more, how he said them. He was a man on the edge, and one ready to dive off. Within twelve hours, he's apologetic, sheepish, controlled, and bringing me dozens of roses. And still, in a mildly civilized way, hitting on me. I should have seen the first incident was truth, and the rest facade. But I didn't, because I'm used to men hitting on me. The unhappiness... The dissatisfaction struggled toward the surface again before she tamped it down. And I use it, when it suits me, to get what I want. Why shouldn't you? You're smart enough to use the tools at hand. If a guy lets you, it's his problem, not yours. Well, she laughed a little, sipped her wine. That's unexpected, coming from a man I've used them on. Didn't hurt me any. He stretched out his legs crossed his ankles, and knew she was trying to puzzle him out. Fine and good, Ty thought. Let her do the wondering for a change. Anyway, the guy fitting to Mornay's description spent time in the winery, Tyler told her. Had access to the bottling plant, with Donato. Ah, how sad, she thought. So the triangle reforms into a four-sided box. Jerry links to Don. Don links to my father. Both Jerry and Dad linked to Chris. Tidy. What do you want to do about it? Tell the police, here and at home. And I want to talk to David. He'll know more about Jerry's work at Lacour. She plucked a strawberry from a dish, bit into it slowly. Tomorrow I'm going into Venice. I've agreed to give some interviews, during which I'll hang Don up by the balls. Disgrace to the family, a betrayal to the loyal employees and customers of Jim Belli. Our shock, sorrow, and regret, and our unhesitating cooperation with the authorities in the hopes that he will be brought to justice quickly and spare his innocent and pregnant wife, his young children, his grieving mother any more pain. She reached for the bottle to fill her glass again. You think that's cold and hard and just a little nasty? No. I think it's hard on you. Hard to be the one saying those things, keeping your head up when you do. You've got your grandmother's spine, Sophie. Again, unexpected, but grazie. I'm going to have to deal with Gina and my aunt as well, if they want family support, emotional and the all-important financial. They'll cooperate with the line we're taking publicly. What time are we leaving? I don't need you for this. Don't be stupid, it doesn't suit you. Macmillan is just as involved, just as vulnerable. It'll play better in the press if we do this as a team. Family, company, partnership, solidarity. We leave at seven sharp. She sat again. I'll type up a statement, some responses for you. You can go over them on the way in, so they'll be fresh in your mind, should you be questioned. Fine. Well, let's try to keep that the only area where you put words in my mouth. It's hard to resist with you taciturn types, but I'll try. He spread some pâté on a cracker, handed it to her. So let's change channels a while.
What do you think about your mother and David? I think it's great. Do you? Yes, don't you? As a matter of fact, but it seemed to me you've been a little off since they called with the big announcement. I think, under the circumstances, I'm allowed to be a little off. But that's one turn of events I can be pleased about. It feels right. I'm happy for her, for them. He'll be good to her, and for her, and the kids. She always wanted more children. Now she'll have them, even if they come half grown. I was half grown, and she managed to be more of a mother to me than my own. Her shoulders, tensed when he'd tossed the question at her, relaxed again. She's too young to be your mother. That's what I used to tell her, and she'd say it's not the age, it's the seniority. She loves you, a lot. Feelings mutual. What are you smiling at? I don't know. I suppose I've been a little down today with one thing or another, and I didn't expect to end the day sitting out here with you, actually relaxing. Feels better to have said all that ugly business out loud. Cleanse the palate. She added with another sip of wine, then move on to something pleasant we can actually agree on. We've got more common ground than either of us might have thought a year ago. I suppose we do. And I'm impressed that instead of having this discussion inside with your boots propped up on a coffee table, we're sitting out here, wine, candlelight, even music. She leaned back, looked up at the sky. Stars. It's nice to know you can appreciate an attractive venue, even for a discussion that's primarily business and distressful. There's that. But mostly I wanted to set this up out here so we'd have a pretty setting when I seduce you. She choked on her wine, managed to laugh it off. <laughs> Seduce me. Where is that on your agenda? Coming right up. He grazed a fingertip over her thigh, just below the hem of her skirt. I like your dress. Thank you. I put it on to torment you. Figured that. His gaze met hers. Bullseye. She leaned over for the bottle again, filled his glass. When it came to sexual skirmishes, she considered herself a veteran. We agreed that part of our relationship was over. No, you were having a snit about something, and I let you. A snit. She dipped a fingertip in her wine, tapped it gently on her tongue. I don't have snits. Yeah, you do. All the time. You've always been a brat, a really sexy brat. And for the last while... You've had some pretty rough times. The spine he'd just complimented her on stiffened. I'm not looking for your sympathy, Macmillan, or your tolerance. See? His grin, a calculated insult, flashed. You're working up toward a snit. Temper snuck up her backbone, added heat to rigidity. Let me tell you something. If this is your idea of a seduction, it's a wonder you've ever scored with a woman. Here's a difference between me and most of the men you know. His legs were stretched out, his voice lazy. I don't keep score. I don't think about you like a notch on the bedpost or a trophy. Oh, yes, Tyler McMillan, high-minded, moralistic, reasonable. Again he grinned at her, but this time it was full of fun. You think that insults me? You're just using temper as a defense. It's your mechanism. Mostly I don't mind much giving it right back to you, but I'm not in the mood for a fight. I want to make love with you, starting out here, slow, and working our way in, upstairs into that great big bed in your room. When I want you in my bed, you'll know it. Exactly. Taking his time, he rose, pulled her to her feet. You're really stuck on me, aren't you? Stuck? Her mouth would have fallen open if she hadn't been so busy sneering. Please, you'll embarrass yourself. Crazy about me. He slipped his arms around her, chuckling when she pushed against his chest and arched away. I saw you today more than once, standing at the window looking at me. I don't know what you're talking about. I might have looked out the window, looking at me, he continued, slowly drawing her against him, the way I was looking at you. Wanting me. He nuzzled gently at her neck, the way I was wanting you, and more. His lips brushed her cheek as she turned her head away. There's more than the wanting between us. There's nothing. 
She gasped when his hand squeezed the back of her neck, then moaned when his mouth crushed down on hers. If it was just this, just the heat, you wouldn't be so scared. I'm not afraid of anything. He eased back. You don't need to be. I'm not going to hurt you. She shook her head, but his lips came back to hers again, gentle now and unbearably kind. No, she thought as she softened against him. He wouldn't hurt her. But she was bound to hurt him. Ty. She started to push at him again and ended by gripping his shirt. She'd missed this, the warmth he brought into her those twisted sensations of risk and safety. This is a mistake. It doesn't feel like one. You know what I think? He lifted her into his arms. I think it's stupid to argue, especially when we both know I'm right. Stop it. You're not carrying me into the house. The staff will gossip about it for weeks. I figure they've already laid bets on how this was going to turn out. He elbowed open a door. And if you don't want servants talking about what you do, you shouldn't have servants. When we get home, I figure you should move in with me. Then it'll be nobody's business what we do. Move? Move in with you? Have you lost your mind? Put me down, Ty. I'm not going to be carried up the steps like a heroine in a romance novel. You don't like it? Okay. We'll do it this way. He shifted, hauling her up and over his shoulder. Better. This isn't funny. Baby. He patted her butt. It is from where I'm standing. Anyway, there's plenty of room for your stuff at my place. Got three extra bedrooms with empty closets. That ought to be enough for your clothes. I'm not moving in with you. Yes, you are. He walked into her bedroom, kicked the door shut behind him. He had to give the staff credit. He hadn't seen one of them on the trip upstairs. Hadn't heard a peep. He gave Sophia full marks, too. She wasn't kicking and screaming. Too much class, he supposed, as, still carrying her, he lit the candles scattered through the room. Tyler, I can recommend a good therapist. There's absolutely no shame in seeking help for mental instability. I'll keep it in mind. God knows I haven't been clear in the head since I got tangled up with you. We can make an appointment together, after you move in. I'm not moving in with you. Yes, you are. He let her slide down until she was back on her feet and facing him. Because it's what I want. If you think I give a single damn about what you want right now, because, he continued, skimming his fingers along her cheek, I'm as crazy about you as you are about me. That shut you up, didn't it? It's time, Sophia. We started dealing with it instead of dancing around it. I'm sorry. Her voice shook. I don't want this. I'm sorry you don't want it, too, because it's the way it is. Look at me. He framed her face with his hands. I wasn't looking for this, either, but it's been there for a long time. Let's see where it takes us. He lowered his mouth to hers. Just us. Just him, she thought. She wanted to believe it, Wanted to trust all these soft and liquid feelings that were flowing into her. To love someone and have it be strong and true. To be capable of that. Worthy of it. She wanted to believe it. To be loved by an honest man. One who would make promises and keep them. Who would care for her, even when she didn't deserve it. That was a miracle. She wanted to believe in miracles. His mouth was warm and firm on hers, patiently stirring desire. The steady, irresistible rise of passion was a relief. This she could understand. This she could trust. And this, she thought as she wrapped her arms around him, she could give. She went with him willingly when he lowered to the bed. He kept the heat banked. This time there would be no mistaking what happened between them was an act of love. Generous, selfless, and sweet. He linked his fingers with hers as he deepened the kiss as he tasted the beginning of surrender on her lips. It was meant to be there, in the old bed in the castello where it had all begun a century before. There, another beginning, another promise, another dream. As he looked down at her, he knew it. Blooming time, he said quietly. Ours. 
always the farmer, she said with a smile as she unbuttoned his shirt. But her hand trembled, went limp when he took it in his, pressed it to his lips. Ours, he repeated. He undressed her slowly, watched the candlelight shimmer over her skin, listened to the way her breath caught, released, caught again when he touched her. Did she know the barriers between them were crumbling? He did. He felt them fall when she quivered, and knew the precise moment her body yielded to her heart. They seemed to sink into the bed like lovers in a pool. She gave herself to the sensations of those hard palms sliding over her, that persuasive mouth roaming where it pleased. She reached for him, rose to him, and answered. The quiet beauty of knowing he would be there, that he would hold on even as she did, poured through her like wine in the blood. When he pressed his lips to her heart, she wanted to weep. No one else, he thought as he lost himself in her. No one else had ever unlocked him this way. He felt her rise under him, an arch of welcome. He heard her broken moan merge with his as she crested, and knew when he looked down at her that she was steeped in what they gave each other. A blend, rare and perfect, finally shared. Once again he linked his hands with hers, holding tight now. Take me in, Sophie. His body shook, control ruthlessly held, as he slipped inside her. Take me. I love you. Her breath caught again as sensation swarmed into her, tore at her heart, fear and joy bursting. Ty, don't. He laid his lips on hers, the kiss gentle, devastating. I love you. Take me. He kept his eyes open, and on hers, watching tears swim and shimmer. Tell me. Ty, her heart quaked, seemed to spill over, then her fingers curled strong to his. Ty, she said again. The amo. She met his mouth with hers now, clung, and let him sweep her away. Say it again. Drifting, Ty ran a fingertip up and down her spine. In Italian like that. She shook her head, her only sign that she heard the request and kept her cheek against his heart. I like the way it sounds. I want to hear it again. Ty. There's no point trying to take it back. He continued his lazy stroke, and his voice was clear and calm. You won't get away with it. People say all kinds of things in the heat of passion. She scooted away and nearly made it off the bed. Heat of passion. You start using clichés like that, I know you're fumbling. In one easy move, he flipped her back on the bed. Say it again. It's not as hard the second time, believe me. I want you to listen to me. She pushed herself up, dragged at the bed covers. For the first time she could remember, her own nudity left her feeling uneasy and exposed. Whatever I might be feeling at the moment doesn't mean... God, I hate when you look at me like that. Amused patience. It's infuriating. It's insulting. And you're trying to change the subject. I'm not going to fight with you, Sophia. Not about this. Just tell me again. Don't you understand? She bunched her hands into fists. I know what I'm capable of. I know my strengths and my weaknesses. I'll just screw this up. No, you won't. I won't let you. She raked a hand through her hair. You underestimate me, Macmillan. No, you underestimate yourself. It was that, she realized as she slowly lowered her hand again. That simple and quiet faith in her more than she had in herself, that left her helpless. No one else would ever say that to me. You're the only one who'd say that to me. Maybe that's why I'm... His nerves were starting to stretch, but he gave her ankle an easy pat. Keep going. Almost there. That's something else. You push. Nobody else ever pushed. None of the others ever loved you. You're stalling, Sophie. Chicken. She narrowed her eyes. His were that calm lake blue, she thought, just a little amused, just a little. No, she realized with a hard jolt, not smug and amused. There was strain behind them and nerves, and still he waited for her to give him what he needed. You're not the first man I've been with, she burst out. Stop the presses. 
He leaned forward, caught her chin in his hand. The patience on his face was beginning to shift toward temper. It delighted her. But here's a flash for you. I'm damn well going to be the last. And that, she decided, was exactly right. Okay, Ty, here it is. I've never said it to another man. Never had to be careful not to because it was never an issue. I'm probably not doing you any favors by saying it to you, but you'll have to deal with it now. I love you. There. That wasn't so hard. He ran his hands over her shoulders as relief pumped into him. But you didn't say it in Italian. It sounds really great in Italian. You idiot. Ti amo. She laughed, launching herself at him. Chapter 26 Lieutenant DeMarco smoothed the fingertip along his mustache. I appreciate your coming in, signorina. The information you and Signore McMillan bring me is interesting. It will be looked into. What exactly does that mean, looked into? I'm telling you my cousin used the Castello for assignations with his mistress, for clandestine meetings with a competitor and with an employee I personally terminated. None of which is illegal. DeMarco spread his hands. Interesting, even suspicious, which is why I will uh, look into it. However, the meetings were hardly clandestine as many employees at the Castello and at the vineyards were aware of them. They weren't aware of Jeremy de Mornay's identity or his connection with Lacour. Tyler put a hand over Sophia's as he spoke. If he wasn't mistaken, she was about to shoot off her chair and directly through the roof. What this implies is that de Mornay was involved in the sabotage that's resulted in several deaths. Possibly others at Lacour are involved, or at least aware. Since she couldn't shove away Ty's hand, Sophia fisted her own. Jerry is the grand-nephew of Lacour's current president. He's an ambitious and intelligent man who had a grudge against my father, and very likely against my family. Every market share Giambelli's lost during these crises has been profit in Lacour's pockets. As a family member, that's profit in Jerry's pocket, and personal satisfaction along with it. DeMarco heard her out. And I have no doubt that when presented with this information, the proper authorities will want to question this Jeremy de Mornay. Obviously, as he's an American citizen residing in New York, I'm unable to do so. At this point, my main concern is the apprehension of Donato Giampelli. Who's eluded you for nearly a week, Sophia pointed out. We learned uh, the identity of his traveling companion, or I should say the woman we believe to be traveling with him only yesterday. Signorina Ketzo's credit card has several extensive charges. I am even now waiting for further information. Of course he used her credit card, Sophia said impatiently. He's an idiot, but he's not a fool. He's certainly smart enough to cover his tracks there and to get out of Italy the quickest and easiest way. Over the border into Switzerland, I'd imagine. He contacted Jerry from the Como district. The Swiss border is minutes away. The guards there barely look at a passport. We're aware of this, and the Swiss authorities are assisting us. It's only a matter of time. Time is a valuable commodity. My family has suffered personally, emotionally, and financially for months. Until Donato was apprehended and questioned, until we have the answers and assurances that no other sabotage is planned, we can't end it. My father was part of this. How much a part, I don't yet know. Can you understand how this feels? Yes, I believe I understand, signorina. My father is dead. I need to know who killed him and why. If I have to hunt down Don myself, if I have to confront Jerry de Mornay personally and take on the entire Lacour organization to get those answers, believe me, that's what I'll do. You're impatient. On the contrary, I've been remarkably patient. She got to her feet. I need results. He held up a finger as the phone rang. His expression changed slightly as he listened to the stream of information. When he hung up, he folded his hands. You have your results. 
The Swiss police have just taken your cousin into custody. It was an education to watch her in action. Tyler didn't say a word. Wasn't sure he'd have gotten one in if he'd tried. She'd peppered DeMarco with demands, questions, scribbling down information in her notebook. When she'd marched out of DeMarco's office, Tyler had to lengthen his considerable stride just to keep up. She moved like a rocket with a cell phone attached to her ear. He couldn't understand half of what she was saying anyway. She started in Italian, switched to French somewhere along the line, and went back to Italian with a few short orders in English. She mowed her way through the tourists thronging the narrow streets, clipped busily over the pretty bridges and beelined across squares, and never stopped talking, never stopped moving, even when she had to cock the little phone between her ear and shoulder to drag out her filofax and make more notes. She passed shop windows without so much as a glance. He figured if she breezed by Armani without it putting a hitch in her stride, nothing was going to stop her. At the main dock, she jumped on a water taxi, and he caught the word for airport in her brisk stream of Italian. He figured it was a good thing he had his passport in his pocket, or he'd be left in her dust. She didn't sit even then, but braced herself on the rail beside the driver and made still more calls. Fascinated, he wedged himself in on the other side and watched her. The wind teased her short cap of hair. The sun bounced off the dark lenses of her glasses. Venice washed by behind her, an ancient and exotic backdrop to a contemporary woman with places to go and people to see. Small wonder he was crazy about her. Tyler folded his arms, tipped back his head, and let himself enjoy the last breezes of the city built on water. If he knew this woman, and he did, they were going to be spending some time in the Alps. Tyler. He tuned back in when she snapped her fingers at him. How much money do you have? Cash? On me? I don't know. A couple hundred thousand in lira. Maybe a hundred American. Good. She swung toward the stairs as the boat docked. Pay the driver. Yes, ma'am. She cut her way through the airport just as she had through the city streets. Per her orders, the corporate jet was waiting, fueled and cleared for the flight. Less than an hour after she'd received the news her cousin was in custody, she was strapped in for takeoff, and for the first time in that hour, she turned off her phone, shut her eyes, and took a breath. Sophia? Okay. What? You kick ass. She opened her eyes again, and her smile came slow and sharp. Damn straight. He'd been taken from a tiny resort nestled in the mountains north of Kerr and near the Austrian border. The farthest he'd thought ahead was perhaps getting over that border, or alternately into Liechtenstein. The goal had been merely to put as many countries between him and Italy as possible. But while looking north, Donato had failed to look at his own ground. His mistress wasn't as dim as he'd supposed, nor half as loyal. She'd seen a news report on the television while lounging in a bubble bath and had found his cache of cash in his traveling case. She'd taken the money, booked a flight, placed a single anonymous call, and had been on her way, considerably richer, to the French Riviera when the efficient Swiss police had broken into Donato's room and plucked him out from under the bed covers. Now he was in a Swiss cell, bemoaning his fate and cursing all women as the bane of his existence. He had no money to hire a lawyer, and desperately needed one to fight extradition for as long as possible, for as long as it took, for God's sake, for him to think his way clear. He would throw himself on the mercy of La Signora. He would escape and run to Bulgaria. He would convince the authorities he'd done nothing more than run off with his mistress. He would rot in prison for the rest of his life. With his thoughts circling this same loop, around and around, he looked up to see a guard on the other side of the bars. Informed he had a visitor, he got shakily to his feet. At least the Swiss had had the decency to let him dress, though he'd been allowed no tie, no belt, not even the laces in his Gucci's. He smoothed his hair with his hands as he was taken to the visiting area. He didn't care who'd come to see him, as long as someone would listen. When he saw Sophia on the other side of the glass, his spirit soared. Family, he thought. Blood would listen to blood. Sofia, grazie a Dio. He fell into his chair, 
fumbled with the phone. She let him ramble, the panic, the pleas, the denials, the despair, and the longer he did so, the thicker the shell grew around her heart. Stai zitto. He did indeed shut up at her quiet order. He must have seen that she stood for her grandmother now, and that her expression was cold and merciless. I'm not interested in excuses, Donato. I'm not here to listen to your pitiful claims that it's all been a horrible mistake. Don't ask for my help. I'm going to ask the questions. You'll give the answers. Then I'll decide what will be done. Is that clear? Sophia, you have to listen. No, I don't. I don't have to do anything. I can get up, walk away. You, on the other hand, can't. Did you kill my father? No, in nome di Dio. You can't believe that. Under the circumstances, I find it easy to believe. You stole from the family. He started to deny it, and, reading his answer in his eyes, Sophia set the phone down, began to get to her feet. Panicked, Don slapped his palm on the glass, shouted. When the guards started forward, she coolly gestured them back, picked up the phone again. You were about to say? Yes. Yes, I stole. I was wrong. I was stupid. Gina, she makes me crazy. She nags for more. More babies, more money, more things. I took money. I thought, what did it matter? Please, Sophia, car. You won't let them keep me in prison over money. Think again. I would, yes. My grandmother might not. But it wasn't just money. You tampered with the wine. You killed an old, innocent man. For money, Don? How much was he worth to you? It was a mistake, an accident, I swear it. It was only supposed to make him a little sick. He knew, he saw. I made a mistake. His hand shook as he rubbed it over his face. Knew what, Donato? Saw what? In the vineyard, my love. He disapproved and might have spoken of it to Zia Teresa. If you continue to play me for a fool, I'll walk away and leave you to rot. Believe it. The truth, Don, all of it. It was a mistake, I swear it. I listened to poor advice. I was misled. Desperate, he dragged at his already loosened collar. His throat was closing, choking him. I was to be paid, you see, and I needed money. If the company had some trouble, if there was bad press, lawsuits, I would be paid more. Baptiste, he saw, people I spoke with. Sophia, please, I was angry, very angry. I've worked hard my whole life. La Signora never valued me. A man has his pride. I wanted her to value me. And killing an innocent old man, attacking her reputation, was the answer? The first, that was an accident. And it was the company's reputation. It's one in the same. How could you not know that? I thought, if there's trouble, then I'll help fix it and she'll see. And you'd get paid from both ends, Sophia finished. It didn't work with Signore Baptista. He didn't get sick. He died. And they buried him, believing his heart had just given out at last. How frustrating for you. How annoying. Then almost immediately, Nana reorganized the company. Yes. Yes. And does she reward me for my years of service? No. Sincerely outraged, he thumped a fist on the counter. She brings in an outsider. She promotes an American woman who then can question me. So you killed Margaret and tried to kill David? No, no. Margaret, an accident. I was desperate. She was looking at the accounts, at the invoices. I needed, wanted, only to delay her. A short time. How was I to know she would drink so much of the wine? A glass, even two, would only have made her ill. It was inconsiderate of her to spoil things. You sent bottles, poisoned wine, out on the market. You risked lives. I had no choice. No choice. You must believe me. Did my father know about the wine, the tampering? No. No. It was just a game to Tony. The business was his game. 
He didn't know about the dummy account because he never took time to look. He didn't know Baptista because he knew no one who worked in the fields. It wasn't his life. Sophia, it was my life. She sat back briefly. Her father had been weak, a sad excuse for a husband, even a man. But he'd had no part in murder or in sabotage. It was, at least, some small comfort. You brought de Mornay to the Castello, to the winery. You took money from him, didn't you? He paid you to betray your own blood. Listen to me, his voice dropped to a whisper. Stay away from de Mornay. He's a dangerous man. You have to believe me. Whatever I've done, you have to believe I'd never want to hurt you. He'll stop at nothing. Murder? My father? I don't know. I swear to you in my life, Sophia, I don't know. He wants to ruin the family. He used me for that. Listen to me, he repeated, laying his palm on the glass again. I took money. I stole. I did what he told me to do to the wine. I was misled. Now he let me hang for it. I'm begging you to help me. I'm begging you to stay away from him. When I knew Carter would expose me, I ran. I only ran, Sophia. I swear to it. They're saying I hired someone, some thug from the streets, to shoot him and steal the papers. It's a lie. Why would I? It was over already for me. It was done. The twists of lies and truth had to be unknotted. It would take a cold and steady hand to do so, she thought. Even now, after all she knew of him, part of her wanted to reach out. She couldn't allow it. You want my help, Don? Tell me everything you know about Jerry de Mornay. Everything. If I'm satisfied, I'll see to it Jim Bailey arranges for your legal needs and that your children are cared for and protected. When Sophia came back, Tyler thought she looked exhausted, wilted. Before he could speak, she touched a hand to his. Don't ask me yet. I'm going to arrange a conference call on the flight so I only have to say it all once. Okay. Let's try this instead. He pulled her in, held her. Thanks. Can you do without the things you took to the Castello for a few days? I'll have them packed up and sent. We need to go home, Ty. I need to be home. Best news I've had in days. He kissed the top of her head. Let's go. Do you believe him? Tyler waited until she'd completed the call, until all had been said. She was up now, pacing the cabin, sipping her third cup of coffee since takeoff. I believe he's a stupid man with a weak and selfish core. I believe he's convinced himself that Signore Baptista and Margaret were unfortunate accidents. He let himself be used for money and for ego by someone a great deal more clever. Now he's sorry, but sorriest for being caught. But I believe absolutely that he's afraid of Jerry. I don't think Don killed my father. I don't think he tried to kill David. You're looking at de Mornay. Who else? Proving it won't be so easy. Tying Jerry to any of this and making it hold won't be so easy. Tyler rose, took the coffee from her hand. You're revving yourself too high. Turn it off a while. Can't. Who else, Ty? I could see you didn't agree when we were on the call. I can see it now. I'm not sure what I think just yet. I take longer than you to process things. But I can't figure out why your father'd have a meet in your apartment with Jerry, or why after all this time, all this planning, Jerry would kill him, would risk that, would bother. Doesn't ring for me. But I'm not a cop, and neither are you. They'll have to question him. Even on the word of someone like Donato, they'll have to. He'll slither and he'll slide, but... She stopped, took a breath. We'll be stopping in New York to refuel. Three countries in one day. Welcome to my world. You won't get anything out of him, Sophie. Just the chance to spit in his face. Yeah, there's that. And he'd get a charge out of watching her do it. You know how to track him down? It's a big city. She sat again and pulled out her filofax. Making connections is one of my best things. Thanks. Hey, I'm just along for the ride. 
Let me tell you something that didn't escape my notice today. Sophie, nothing does. Exactly. I was plowing my way through this mess, making calls, arrangements, pushing all the buttons. You never interrupted me, never asked me any questions, never patted my head and told me to step back so you could handle it. I don't happen to speak three languages. That wasn't it. It didn't occur to you to flex your muscles and take over, to show me you could handle things for me, just like it didn't dent your ego that I knew what I had to do and how to do it. You don't have to flex your muscles because you know they're there, and so do I. Maybe I just like watching you flex yours. She got up just to crawl into his lap, curl there. All my life, I've made certain to hook myself up with weak men. All show, no substance. With her head on his shoulder, she could finally rest. Now look what I've done. Jerry made several calls himself from payphones. He didn't consider Donato much of a problem, but more of an inconvenience. And even that would be seen to before long. He'd accomplished what he'd set out to accomplish. Giambelli was fighting its way out of yet another crisis. The family itself was in turmoil. Consumer trust was diving toward an all-time low, and he was reaping the rewards personally, professionally, financially. Nothing he'd done, nothing he'd done that could be proved, had been illegal. He'd simply done his job, as an aggressive businessman would, and had seized opportunities that had come his way. He was more amused than annoyed when lobby security announced he had visitors prepared to be entertained. He cleared them, then turned to his companion. We have company, an old friend of yours. Jerry, we've got two solid hours of work to get through tonight. Chris uncurled her legs from the couch. Who is it? Your former boss. Why don't we open a bottle of the Puy Fusse, the ninety-six? Sophia? Chris surged to her feet. Here? Why? We're about to find out, he said as the buzzer sounded. Be a good girl, won't you? Fetch the wine. He strolled to the door. Isn't this a lovely surprise? I had no idea you were in town. He actually leaned forward to kiss Sophia's cheek. She was quick, but Tyler was quicker. His hand rammed sharply into Jerry's chest. Let's not start out being stupid, he advised. Sorry. Holding up both hands, Jerry stepped back. Didn't realize things had changed between you. Come in. I was just about to open some wine. You both know Chris. Yes. How cozy. Sophia began. We'll pass on the wine, thanks. We won't be here long. You appear to be enjoying all your new employee benefits, Chris. I much prefer the style of my new boss to the style of my old one. I'm sure you're a lot more friendly with your associates. Ladies, please, Jerry pleaded as he closed the door. We're all pros here, and we know executives switch companies every day. That's business. I hope you're not here to scold me for snatching one of yours. After all, Jim Bailey wooed one of our best away just last year. How is David, by the way? I heard he had a close call in Venice recently. He's doing very well. Fortunately for Chris, Jim Bailey has a firm policy against trying to kill former employees, but apparently not a strong enough one against internal wars. I was shocked to hear about Donato. Jerry lowered to the arm of his sofa. Absolutely shocked. We're not wired to Mornay. Tyler ran an arm down Sophia's arm to calm her. So you can save the act. We paid Don a visit before we left Europe. He had some interesting things to say about you. I don't think the police will be far behind us. Really? He'd been fast, Jerry thought, but apparently not quite fast enough. I have more faith in our system than to believe the police or. Anyone else, for that matter, will put much credence in the ravings of a man who'd steal from his own family. This is a difficult time for you, Sophia. He stood again. Is there anything I can do? You could go to hell, but I'm not sure they'd have you. You should have been more careful. She continued. Both of you, she added with a nod toward Chris, spending time at the castello, the winery, the bottling plant. It's not illegal. 
Jerry shrugged. In fact, it's not an uncommon practice for friendly competitors to visit each other that way. We were invited, after all. You and any member of your family are always welcome at any liqueur operation. You use Donato. Guilty. Jerry spread his hands. But again, nothing illegal about it. He approached me. I'm afraid he's been unhappy at Jim Belly for quite some time. We discussed the possibility of him coming aboard at liqueur. You told him to tamper with the wine. Told him how to do it. That's ridiculous and insulting. Be careful, Sophia. I understand you're upset, but trying to deflect your family's troubles onto me and mine isn't the answer. Here's how it was. Tyler had spent the hours in the air working it out in his head. Now he sat, made himself comfortable. You wanted to cause trouble, serious trouble. Avano'd bounced on your wife. Hard for a man to take that even if the other guy's busy bouncing on every woman he can find. But trouble just slides right off of Anno. Nothing sticks. He keeps his wife just where he wants her, which is out of his way, but close enough to lock in his position with her family organization. That's a pisser for you. My ex-wife is none of your business, McMillan. But she was yours, and so was Ivano. Goddamn Jim Bellies gave the son of a bitch free reign. Now there ought to be a way to take that rain and hang all of them. Maybe you know Ivano's skimming. Maybe you don't. But you know enough to look at Don. He cheats on his wife, too, and he's pretty friendly with Ivano. Don's a friendly guy. Wouldn't be hard for you to get close to him. Hint that Lacour would love to have him on the team. More money, more power. You could play into his complaints, his ego, his needs. You find out about the dummy account— and now you've got something on him. You're fishing, Macmillan, and fishing bores me. It gets better. Ivano's snuggling up to Sophia's second-in-command. Isn't that interesting? Dangle a carrot under her nose, and you get lots of inside information. Did he offer you money, Chris, or just a corner office with a nice shiny brass plaque? I don't know what you're talking about. But she took a quick and careful step away from Jerry. My relationship with Tony had nothing to do with my position at Lacour. You keep thinking that, Ty said casually. Meanwhile, De Mornay, you keep playing on Don, nudging him along deeper, deeper. He's got some money problems. Who doesn't? You'll lend him a little, just a friendly loan. And you string him along about the move to Lacour. What else can he bring to the table? Inside information? Not good enough. My company doesn't require inside information. It's not your company. Ty inclined his head when he saw the fury spurt out of Jerry's eyes. You just want it to be. You talk to Don about the tampering, just a few bottles, show him what he should do, could do, then how he'd be able to step in and be a hero when the shit hits, just like you'll be a hero at liqueur because you're primed and ready to move when Jim Belly takes the hit. Nobody's going to get really hurt, or that's what you tell that poor sap Don. But it'd shake up the company good. Pitiful. Beneath his precisely tailored shirt, a line of sweat ran down Jerry's back. No one's going to believe this fairy tale. Oh, the police might be pretty entertained. Let's just finish it out, Ty suggested. It goes wrong for Don. And an old man dies. No skin off your ass, of course. You've got Don by the short hairs now. He talks. He's up for murder. Meanwhile, Jim Belly's moving right along. Ivano's still sliding, and one of your own moves to the enemy camp. We've managed to bump along without the help of David Cutter. He wanted to pour wine, carelessly, but realized his hand was shaking. And you've taken up enough of my time. Nearly done. You'd already started a second front, courting one of the brains in promotion, feeding her dissatisfaction, her jealousies. When the crisis hits, and you're going to make sure it does, the Jim Belly spin is going to be off balance. I had nothing to do with this. Chris grabbed her briefcase, began stuffing papers inside. I don't know anything about this. Maybe not. Your style's more the backstabbing variety. 
I'm not interested in what you think or anything you have to say. I'm leaving. She bolted to the door, slammed it behind her. Wouldn't count on too much company loyalty in that one, Ty commented. You underestimated Sophia de Mornay, just like you overestimated yourself. You got your crisis. You spilled your blood. But it hasn't been enough for you. You want more. And that's what's going to choke you. Going after Cutter was stupid. Legal had copies of the paperwork, and Don knew it. Chris didn't worry him. She could be satisfied, like any pawn, if necessary. Obviously, Donato panicked. A man who's killed once doesn't scruple to kill again. That's right. Old Don. He didn't figure he'd killed anybody. The wine did. And he was too busy running to worry about David. I wonder who clued you into the meat in Venice, and Don scrambled to get the money out of his private account. The cops will work on that angle, and they'll start tying you in. You're going to have a lot of questions to answer, and before too much longer you'll have your own public relations nightmare. LaCour is going to prune you off, pal, just like they would a diseased cane. Ty got to his feet. You figure you've covered yourself every inch. Nobody ever does. And when Don drowns, he's going to drag you under with him. Personally, I'm going to enjoy seeing you go under for the third time. I didn't care much for Ovano. He was a selfish idiot who didn't appreciate what he had. Don falls in the same category, at a slightly higher level. But you, you're a dickless coward who pays people to do the dirty work you haven't got the guts for. Doesn't surprise me your wife went hunting elsewhere for someone with balls. He stood where he was, hands at his sides as Jerry lunged, and he took the fist on the jaw without making a move to block it. He even allowed Jerry to knock him back against the door. Did you see that? Tyler asked Sophia calmly. He punched me. Now he's laying hands on me. I'm going to ask him politely to stop. You hear that, De Mornay? I'm asking you politely to stop. Fuck you. Jerry bunched a fist and would have rammed it into Tyler's belly if it hadn't been stopped an inch from its mark, if it hadn't suddenly been crushed and the pain radiating up his arm hadn't dropped him breathless to his knees. You're going to want to have that hand x-rayed, Tyler told him as he gave him a light shove that sent Jerry the rest of the way to the floor in a curl of agony. I think I heard a bone snap. Ready, Sophie? Uh... Yes. Slightly dazed, she let Tyler draw her out the door toward the elevator. Inside, she let out the breath she hadn't been aware of holding. I'd like to point something out. Go ahead. He punched lobby level, leaned back. I didn't interrupt or ask any questions. I wasn't compelled to flex my muscles. She continued as Tyler's mouth twitched, or proved to you I could handle things. I just want to mention all that. Got it. You've got your areas of expertise, and I've got mine. He slipped an arm around her shoulder. Now let's go home. Chapter 27 And then, Sophia dug into the leftover lasagna while the family gathered in the villa's kitchen. Ty had his hand. I didn't even see it happen. It was like lightning. This big hand covering Jerry's pretty manicured one, which was probably still stinging from wrapping against Ty's jaw. Anyway, she gulped down some wine. All of a sudden, Jerry's gone white and his eyes are rolling back in his head and he's folding like, I don't know, an accordion toward the floor. And the big guy here is not even breaking a sweat. I'm goggling, I know I am, but who wouldn't? and Ty politely suggests that Jerry might want to get his hand x-rayed because he thinks he heard a bone snap. Good Lord. Pilar helped herself to some wine. Really? Hmm. Sophia swallowed. She was starving. The minute she'd walked in the door, she'd been starving. I heard this little sound, like when you step on a twig. Rather horrible, really. Then we just left. And I have to say, here, Eli, your glass is empty. I have to say that it was so quietly vicious and exciting, so exciting. I'm not ashamed to say that when we got back on the plane. I jumped him. Jesus, Sophie. Tyler felt heat rise up the back of his neck. Shut up and eat. 
It didn't embarrass you at the time, she pointed out. Whatever happens, however this all comes out, I'm always going to have the image of Jerry curled up on the floor like a cocktail shrimp. Nobody can take that away from me. Do we have any gelato? I'll get it. Pilar got up from the table, then paused and kissed Ty on the top of the head. You're a good boy. Eli drew a breath, let it out. He didn't leave much of a mark on your jaw there. Guy's got pussy hands, Ty said before he could think, then winced. I beg your pardon, la señora. As you should. I don't approve of such language at my table. But as I'm in your debt, I'll overlook it. You don't owe me anything. I know. She reached for his hand, held it tight. That's why I'm in your debt. My own blood betrayed me and mine. For days, knowing that opened a hole in me, made me doubt myself. Things I've done and things I haven't. Tonight I look and I see the daughter of my daughter and the boy Eli once brought to me, and that hole closes again. I regret nothing. I'm ashamed of nothing. How could I be? Whatever happens, we'll go on. We have a wedding to plan, she said, smiling as Pilar dished up ice cream. A business to run, vines to tend. She lifted her glass. Per familia. Sophia slept like a log and woke early. At six, she was already closed in her office, refining a press release and making personal calls to key accounts in Europe. By seven, she'd worked her way across the Atlantic to the East Coast. She was careful, very careful not to mention Jerry's name and not to accuse a competitor of shady practices, but she let the implication take root. At eight, she judged it late enough to phone the Moors at home. And Helen, I'm sorry to call so early. Not so early. I'd have been out the door in fifteen minutes. Are you still in Venice? No, I'm home, and in need of a legal opinion. On several pesky matters, actually. Some involve international law. Corporate or criminal? Both. You know Donato's been taken into custody. He's being extradited to Italy today. He's not going to fight it. He's implicated someone... Privately to me at this point, an American, a competitor. This person was at minimum aware of the tampering and the embezzlement, and very likely was more involved. Doesn't that make it conspiracy? Can he be charged? Margaret died here in the state, so... Hold on, hold on. You're moving much too quickly, Sophie. The law is a slow wheel. First, you're going on something Don told you. He isn't very credible at the moment. He'll be more credible she promised. I just want a picture. I'm not an expert on international law. I'm not a criminal attorney, come to that. You need to talk to James, and I'll put him on in a minute. But I'm going to tell you this, as your friend. This is a matter for the police and the system. I don't want you to do anything, and I want you to be very careful what you say and what you print. Don't make any statements without running them by either me, James, or Link. I've drafted press releases for here and overseas. I'll fax them over if that's all right. You do that. You talk to James now. Don't do anything. Sophia bit her lip. She wondered what her surrogate aunt, the judge, would have to say about the visit she and Ty had paid to Jerry the night before. At mid-morning, David stood among the rows, among the young mustard plants at the Macmillan Vineyard. He felt useless, out of touch, and more than a little panicked because his just-turned-seventeen-year-old son had driven off to school that morning behind the wheel of a second-hand convertible. Don't you have some papers to push? Tyler asked him. Up yours. In that case, I won't suggest you head over to the caves to check on the month's drawing. We're going to be testing the 93 Merlot for starters. I get to taste wine, you get to rumble. That's the breaks. Besides, it wasn't much of a rumble. Pilar said you flattened him one-handed. David tested his injured arm. One hand's still about all I've got, though the sadist physical therapist says I'll be back to two in no time. I want to take a pop at him. David strode between the rows to work off some of the temper. 
I worked for the son of a bitch for years, sat in meetings with him, had lunches, late-night strategy sessions. Some of them were about how to woo over some of Jim Belly's accounts, some of yours. That's business. That's right. When Lacour copped the exclusive on Allied flights to and from Europe, I went out and celebrated with him. We nudged Jim Belly out on that one barely. I patted myself on the back for days over that. Now I look at the timing, go through the steps, and realize we copped it because he had the inside track. Don fed him Jim Belly's bid before it was made. That's the way some people do business. I don't. It was the tone that made Ty stop. He supposed somehow over the past months they'd become friends, almost family, near enough that he understood the guilt and the frustration. Nobody's saying that, David. Nobody thinks that. No. But I remember how much I wanted that account. He started to jam his hands in his pockets, and his bad arm vibrated. Ah, damn it! You going to finish beating yourself up soon? Because I've got a lot of work to catch up on, seeing as I had to go to Italy to help wipe your blood off the street. You getting yourself shot really put a crimp in my schedule. David turned back toward Tyler. Did you use that same tone when you suggested that fucker De Mornay get an X-ray? Probably. It's the one I use when somebody is being annoyingly stupid. The raw edges in David's stomach smoothed away, and the first glint of humor sparked into his eyes. I'd take a swing at you over that, but you're bigger than me, younger too, bastard. Now that I think of it, I could take you down, but I'll give you a break because Sophia's heading this way. I'd hate for her to have to watch her future stepfather kick your ass. In your dreams, I'm going to go sulk in the caves. He started off, pausing as he passed Tyler. Thanks. Any time. Ty walked the opposite way until he met Sophia. You're late again. Priorities. Where's David going? I wanted to ask how he was feeling. Do yourself a favor and don't. He's at the restless stage of his recovery. What priorities? Oh. Solidifying some shaky accounts, manipulating the press, consulting with legal. Just another quiet day for the wine heiress. How are we doing out here? Nights have been cool and moist. Brings on mildew. We'll do the second sulfur spring right after the grapes have set. I'm not worried. Good. I'll carve out some time for the vintner tomorrow, and you carve out some for the promotion whiz. Back to teamwork. Now why haven't you kissed me hello? Because I'm working, I want to check the new plantings run by the old distillery and check on the fermentation vats. And we're testing today in the caves. Then we've got to move your stuff over to my place. I haven't said I was, but since you're here anyway, he leaned down and kissed her. We're going to have to discuss this, she began, then pulled her ringing phone out of her pocket. Very soon, she added. Sophia Giambelli. Key. Si va bene. She angled the phone away. It's Lieutenant DeMarco's office. Dom was transferred to his custody today. Ah. She shifted the phone back in place. Si, buongiorno. Ma che? Scusi? No. No. Still clutching the phone, she sank onto the ground. Come. She managed. Gripping Tyler's hand before he could take the phone from her, she shook her head fiercely. Donato. She lifted her stunned gaze to Tyler's. E morto. He didn't need her to translate the last. He took the phone from her and, identifying himself, asked how Donato Giambelli had died. A heart attack. He wasn't yet forty. Sophia paced. This is my doing. I pushed him. Then I went to Jerry and pushed him. I might as well have drawn a target on Don's back. You didn't do it alone, Tyler reminded her. I'm the one who yanked Amorne's chain. Basta, Teresa ordered, but without heat. If they find Donato died from drugs, if they find he was murdered while in the hands of the police, there's no fault here. Donato's choices put him where he was, and the police were obliged to protect as well as contain him. 
I won't have blame cast on my house. And that, she determined, would end that. He was a disappointment to me, but I remember he was once a sweet young boy with a pretty smile. I'll mourn for the little boy. She reached out, found Eli's hand, brought it to her lips in a gesture Sophia had never seen her make. Nana, I'll go to Italy, to the funeral to represent the family. No. The time for you to stand in my place will come soon enough. Not yet. I need you here. Eli and I will go. And that's as it should be. I'll bring Francesca, Gina, and the children back with me if they want it. God help us if they do. She finished with spirit and got to her feet. Sophia studied Link's office. No one, she decided, could accuse his father of preferential treatment. The room was little more than a glorified box, cramped, windowless, and stacked with law books and files. She imagined there was a desk hiding under the mounds of paperwork. Welcome to my dungeon. It's not much, Link said as he cleaned off a chair for her. But it's not much. He dumped the files and books on the floor. The nice thing about starting at the bottom is you can't get any lower. If I'm a good boy, I'll get my own stapler. With the skill that told her he'd done so before, he wheeled his desk chair around the mountain. From somewhere under the mounds of papers and books, a phone began to ring. Do you need to get that, wherever it is? If I do, somebody'll just want to talk to me. I'd rather talk to you. How anyone could work in such confusion and disorder was beyond her. She had to mentally sit on her hands to keep herself from digging in to organize. Now I feel guilty about adding to your workload, but not guilty enough to stop me from asking if the papers I sent you are somewhere around, and if you had a chance to look them over. I've got a system. He reached under a stack on the left corner of his desk, pulled out a file. It's like the magician's tablecloth trick, she commented. Nicely done. Want to see me pull a rabbit out of my hat? Grinning at her, he sat. You covered yourself here, he began. I fiddled with the press releases a little. Got to earn my inflated fee, after all. He passed the revised papers over. I take it you're acting as spokesperson for Jim Belly Macmillan. I take it too, at least as long as Nana and Eli are in Italy. Mama's not trained for this sort of thing. I am. David, Ty, I'll see they have copies just in case. But it's best that the media representative be someone from the Giambelli family. We're the ones getting kicked around. I'm sorry about Don. So am I. She looked down at the releases again, but she didn't see them. Funerals today. I keep thinking about the last time I spoke to him. How scared he was. I know what he did, and I can't forgive him for it. But I keep remembering how scared he was, and how cold I was to him. You can't slap yourself around for that, Sophie. Mom and Dad updated me on what went on, at least what we're sure of. He got greedy and he got stupid. He was responsible for two deaths, accidents he called them. I know what he did, Link. But who was responsible for him? Which brings us around to De Mornay. You're going to have to be careful there. Keep his name out of your statements. Keep Lacour out of them. Mm-hmm. Idly, she studied her manicure. It's leaked that the police are questioning him in connection with the tampering, the fraudulent account, even my father's murder. I can't imagine how the press got the information. You're a devious package, Sophie. Spoken as my friend or my lawyer? Both. Just be careful. You don't want any leaks traced back to you. And if you're asked about De Mornay, and you're bound to be, go with no comment. I have plenty of comments, and the ones you're thinking of could dump you into a lawsuit. Let the system wind its torturous way toward the end goal. If De Mornay was involved, you don't have proof. He reminded her, "Let me be a lawyer. If he was involved, it's going to come out. But Don's word isn't enough. He pulled the strings. I'm sure of it, and that's enough for me. People are dead, and why?" Because he wanted a bigger market share, for God's sake! People have killed for less, but I've got to say that's the weak spot. 
He's a wealthy, respected businessman. It's going to be a rough road tying him to corporate espionage, embezzlement, product tampering, much less murder. He's opened it up, and the press is going to leap on the juicy morsel about his wife and my father, humiliating him publicly. He hates us and will hate us more as this plays out. I felt that when I saw him in New York. It's not business, or not just business. It's very personal. Link, have you seen our new ad? The one with the couple on the porch, sunset on the lake, wine and romance. Very slick, very attractive. It had your name all over it. Yours, I mean, not just the company. Thanks. My team put a lot of time and thought into it. She reached into her briefcase, pulled a photograph from a file folder. Someone sent this to me yesterday. He recognized the ad, though this copy had been computer generated and altered. In this, the young woman's head was tipped back, her mouth open in a silent scream. A glass lay on the porch, the wine spilling out and bleeding from white to red. The header read, "It's your moment to die." Jesus, Sophie. This is sick and nasty. Where's the envelope? I have it. No return address, naturally. Postmarked San Francisco. Initially, I thought of Chris Drake. It's her style, but I don't think so. She could study the doctor to add now without a shudder. I think she's backing way off to keep herself clear of the fallout. I don't know if Jerry was on the West Coast, but he did this. You need to take this to the police. I took the original in this morning. This is a copy. I got the impression that while they'll look into it, they see it as another ugly little prank. She pushed to her feet. I want the private detective you've hired to look into it too, and I don't want you to say anything about it to anyone. I agree with the first part, but find the second stupid. It's not stupid. My mother's planning her wedding. Nana and Eli have enough to deal with. So do Ty and David. Besides, this came to me personally. I want to deal with it personally. Even you can't always have what you want. This is a threat. Maybe, and believe me, I intend to be very careful. But I'm not going to have this time spoiled for my mother. She's waited too long to be happy, and I'm not going to dump any more stress on my grandparents. And I'm not telling Ty, not just yet anyway, because he'll overreact. So it's you and me, Link. She reached down for his hand. I'm counting on you. Here's what I'll do, he said after a moment. I'll put the detective on it and give him forty-eight hours to work before I say anything. If during that time you get another one of these, you have to come to me right away. I can promise that, but forty-eight hours—that's the deal. He got to his feet. I'll give you that because I love you and I know what you're feeling. I won't give any more because I love you and I know what I'm feeling. Take it or leave it. Okay, okay, she said again on a long breath. I'm not being brave and stupid, Link. Stubborn maybe, but not stupid. He wants to scare me and throw my family into more turmoil. He's not going to. Right now, I'm going to meet my mother and yours. We're going shopping for a wedding dress. She kissed his cheeks. Thanks. Maddie's idea of shopping was hanging around the mall, scoping out the boys who were hanging around the mall, scoping out the girls, and spending her allowance on some junk food and new earrings. She expected to be terminally bored spending the day with three adults in fancy dress shops, but she figured the point she'd earn with her father for agreeing to go would translate into the streak she wanted to put into her hair. And if she played her cards right, she could cop some pretty cool stuff out of Pilar. A potential new stepmother was prime fruit for plucking. Guilt and nerves, by Maddie's calculations, equaled shopping bags. She was supposed to call Miss Jim Belly Pilar now, which was weird, but better than being expected to call her mom or something. First, she had to get through the lunch deal with Pilar and the judge lady. A girl lunch, Maddie thought with derision. Tiny portions of fancy, low-fat, tasteless food. Where you were expected to talk about clothes and your figure, it wouldn't have been so bad if Sophia had been with them. But Maddie's broad hints that she'd tag along with Sophia while she did her errands had fallen on barren ground.
She resigned herself to a miserable hour or two. More points, she decided. Then was surprised to find herself walking into a noisy Italian restaurant where the air was full of spice. I should get a salad. I should just get a salad, Helen repeated. But I won't. I already hear the eggplant Parmesan calling my name. Fettuccine Alfredo. Sure, fine for you, Helen said to Pilar. You never put on an ounce. You won't have to worry how you'll look naked on your wedding night. He's already seen her naked, Maddie said, and had both women turning around to stare at her. She felt her back go up, her brows lower as she prepared for a lecture. Instead, she got laughter, and Helen draped an arm around her shoulders. Let's get a corner booth. Then you can give me all the dirt on your father and Pilar. I haven't been able to crowbar out of her. I think they did it outside last night. Dad had grass stains on his jeans. Can you be bought? Pilar demanded. Maddie slid into the booth, grinned. Sure. Let's negotiate. Pilar sat down beside her. She wasn't bored. She was surprised to find herself having fun, not being shushed for wisecracks or expected to sit quietly and behave. It was, she thought, a lot like hanging out with Theo and their father, only different, good different. And she was smart enough to realize it was the first women's outing she'd ever had. Smart enough to understand Pilar knew it too. She didn't even mind being dragged into the dress shop or having the conversation turn absolutely and completely to clothes and fabric and color and cut. And when she watched Sophia dash in, wind blown, flushed, happy. Maddie, at not quite fifteen, had a revelation. She wouldn't mind being like her, like Sophia Giambelli. She proved, didn't she, that a woman could be smart, really smart, do exactly what she wanted in the world and how she wanted to do it, and look really amazing at the same time. She didn't dress like she was craving attention, but she got it anyway. Tell me you haven't tried on anything yet. No, not yet. I wanted to wait for you. What do you think of this blue silk? Hmm, a definite maybe. Hi, Maddie and Helen. She leaned over to kiss Helen's cheek, then let out a quick whoop. Oh, Mama, look at this! The lace is fabulous, romantic, elegant, and the color would be perfect on you. It's lovely, but don't you think it's a little young? More for you. No, no, it's for a bride, for you. You have to try it. While she studied the dress, Pilar laid a hand on Sophia's shoulder, sort of absent-mindedly. Maddie thought, just to touch. Her own mother had never touched her absent-mindedly, not that she could remember. They'd never had that connection. If they'd had it, she couldn't have left so easily. Try them both, Sophia insisted, and this rose linen Helen's picked out. If she wasn't in such a rush to hook this guy. She could have something designed, and I could lose ten pounds before I had to wear the matron of honor gown. Do I have time for liposuction? Oh, stop. Okay, I'll start with these three. When Pilar went off with the sales assistant to the dressing rooms, Sophia rubbed her hands together. All right, your turn. Surprised, Maddie blinked at her. This is a grown-up shop. You're as tall as I am, probably about the same size. She added as she studied her target. Mama's going for soft colors, so we'll stick with that. Though I'd like to put you in jewel tones. I like black, Maddie said for the hell of it. Yes, and you wear it well. I do. Hmm. But we'll expand your horizons for this particular occasion. I'm not wearing pink. Maddie folded her arms. Ah. And I was imagining a pink organdy, Helen said. With ruffles and little Mary Janes. What are Mary Janes? Ouch! I'm old. I'm going over to daywear and sulk. Well, what are they? Maddie demanded as Sophia went through the selections. Either shoes or pot or both. I'm not entirely sure. I like this. She pulled out a full-length sleeveless gown in smoky blue. It'll look okay on you. Not for me, for you. Sophia turned. Held the dress up in front of Maddie. Me, really? Yes, really. I want to see you in it with your hair up. Show off your neck and shoulders. What if I got it cut? My hair, I mean, short. 
Mmm. Lips pursed, Sophia mentally cut and restyled Maddie's straight mop. Yes. Short around the face, a little longer in the back. A few highlights. Streaks, said Maddie, nearly speechless with joy. Highlights, subtle. Ask your father and I'll take you to my guy. Why do I have to ask about having my hair cut? It's my hair. Good point. Go try this on. I'll give the salon a call, see if they can fit you in before we head back home. She started to hand Maddie the gown, then stopped. Oh, Mama. What do you think? She'd started with the peach, the ivory lace romancing the bodice, the skirt sweeping back into a gentle train. Be brutal. Helen, come see, Sophia called out. You look beautiful, Mama. Like a bride, Helen agreed and sniffled. Damn, there goes the mascara. Okay. Half dreaming, Pilar turned a circle. Maddie, what's your vote? You look great. Dad's eyes are going to pop out. Pilar beamed and turned another circle. We have a winner. First time out. It wasn't as simple as that. There were hats, headdresses, shoes, jewelry, bags, even underwear. It was dark before they headed north, with the back of the SUV crammed with shopping bags and boxes, which didn't include the dresses themselves, Maddie thought with wonder. Those had to be fitted and altered and fussed with. But she'd ended up with a pile of new clothes, shoes, really cool earrings that she was now wearing. They showed off great with her awesome haircut. And highlights. This new girl family deal had definite high points. Men, Sophia was saying as she cruised north, consider themselves the hunter, but they're not. See, they decide to go after a grizzly, and that's their whole focus. So while they track the big bear, they miss all the other game out of their narrowed vision. Women, on the other hand, may track the grizzly, but before, or even while, bagging it, they take down all the other game as well. Plus men shoot the first big bear they see, Maddie put in from the back seat. They don't take into account the entire world of grizzlies. Exactly, Sophia tapped the steering wheel. Mama, this girl has real potential. Agreed. But I'm not taking the rap for those shoes with the two-foot soles she's wearing. That one's on you. They're great. Funky. Yeah. Pleased with them and herself, Maddie lifted her foot. And the soles are only about four inches. I don't know why you'd want to clomp around in them. Sophia met Maddie's gaze in the rearview mirror. It's a mom thing. She has to say it. You should have seen her face when I got my belly button pierced. You got your belly button pierced? Fascinated, Maddie reached for the snap of her seatbelt. Can I see? I let it grow back. Sorry, she said with a chuckle as Maddie sat back again in disgust. It was irritating. And she was eighteen, Pilar pointed out, turning her head to give Maddie a warning stare. So don't even think about it until you are. Is that a mom thing, too? You bet. But I will say the two of you were right about the hair. It looks great. So when Dad connips, you'll calm him all down, right? Well, I'll... She turned back as the car squealed around a curve. Sophia, at the risk of saying another mom thing, slow down. Tighten your seatbelts. Grimly, Sophia's hands viced on the wheel. Something's wrong with the brakes. Oh, God. Instinctively, Pilar turned back to Maddie. Are you strapped in? Yeah. She grabbed the seat to brace herself as the car shot around another turn. I'm okay. Pull up the emergency brake. Mama, pull it up. I need both hands here. Those hands wanted to shake, but she didn't let them. Didn't let herself think about anything but maintaining control. The car squealed again, fishtailed around the next turn. It's up all the way, baby. And the car didn't slow. What if we turned off the engine? The steering lock. Maddie swallowed the heart that leaped into her throat. She wouldn't be able to steer. Gravel spit as Sophia fought to keep the car on the road. Use my phone. Call 911. She looked down briefly. A half tank of gas, she thought. No help there. And she wasn't going to be able to control the car around the upcoming S-turns at this speed. Downshift! Maddie shouted from the back. Try downshifting! Mama, 
Shove it into third when I tell you. It's going to give us one hell of a jolt, so brace yourselves. But it might work. I can't let go of the wheel. I've got it. It's going to be all right. Okay, hold on. She pushed in the clutch, and the car seemed to gain more speed. Now! The car jolted hard. Though Maddie bit her lip, she couldn't hold back the scream. Into second, Sophia ordered, wrenching the wheel from the shoulder of the road. A line of sweat ran cold down her back. Now! The car bucked, threw her forward, back again. She had a moment's panic that the airbags would deploy and leave her helpless. We've slowed down some. Good thinking, Maddie. We're going to head downhill around more turns. Sophia's voice was ice calm, so the speed's going to pick up again some. I can handle it. Once we're through them, we go up a slope, and that should do it. Get my phone, Mama, just in case. And everybody, hold on. She didn't look at the speedometer. Her eyes were glued to the road now, her mind anticipating each turn. She'd driven the road countless times. The headlights cut through the dark, slashed across oncoming traffic. She heard the angry sound of horns blaring as she crossed the center line. Nearly there. Nearly there. She whipped the wheel left, then right. It slicked in her hands as her palms sprang with damp. She could see, could feel the ground begin to level. Just a little more, she thought. A little bit. Into first, Mama. Shove it into first. There was a horrible noise, a tremendous shudder. Sophia felt as if an enormous fist punched into the hood of the car. Something shrieked, then clanged, and as the speed dropped, she pulled to the side of the road. No one spoke when they stopped. A car whizzed by, then another. Is everyone all right? Pilar reached for the latch of her seat belt and discovered her fingers were numb. Is everyone okay? Yeah. Maddie dashed tears from her cheeks. Okay, I think we should get out now. I think that's a good idea. Sophie, baby. Yeah, let's get the hell out. She managed to get out, to get to the far side of the car before her legs buckled. Bracing her hands on the hood, she fought to get her breath back, and only managed to wheeze. That was really good driving, Maddie told her. Yeah, thanks. Here, baby. Here. Pilar turned her. Held her when the shakes came, and holding her, reached out for Maddie. Here, baby, she said again. Maddie pressed herself into that circle of comfort and let the tears come. Chapter Twenty Eight. Nearly blind with terror and relief, David bolted out of the house. Even as the police car braked, he scooped Maddie out, held her cradled in his arms as he would a baby. You're okay. He pressed his lips to her cheeks, her hair, breathed her in as the shakes he'd held off since the call took over. You're okay. He said it a half dozen times as she curled into him. I'm all right. I'm not hurt or anything. But when she wrapped her arms around his neck, her world came all the way right again. Sophie drove like one of those guys you and Theo like to watch on the raceway. It was kind of cool. Kind of cool. Yeah. Rocking now. Calming himself, he kept his face buried in the curve of her throat while Theo awkwardly patted her back. Bet it was some ride. Theo manfully swallowed the prickly lump in his throat. There was a jittering inside his chest that came as much from seeing his father break apart as from anxiety over Maddie. I'll haul her in, Dad. You're going to wreck your arm. Unable to speak, David just shook his head and held on. His baby was all he could think. His little girl might have been lost. It's okay, Dad, Maddie told him. Everybody's okay now. I can walk. We got the shakes after, but we got over it. But Theo can haul in all the loot. She rubbed her cheek against her father's. We kicked shopping butt, right, Pilar? Right. I could use a hand, Theo. Theo and I'll get it. She wiggled until David set her down. What did you do to your hair? David ran his hand over the sassy crop of it, left his hand resting warm on the back of her neck. Got rid of most of it. What do you think? I think it makes you look grown up. You're growing up on me. Damn, Maddie, I wish you wouldn't. He sighed, pressed his lips to the top of her head. Just another minute, okay? 
Sure. I love you so much. I'd appreciate it if you wouldn't scare me like that again any time soon. I don't plan on it. Wait till you see the dress I got. It goes with the hair. Great. Go ahead. Drag off your loot. You'll stay, won't you? Maddie asked Pilar. Yes, if you want. I think you should stay. Since Theo had grabbed the bags, she clomped off after him in her funky new shoes. Oh, David, I'm so sorry. Don't say anything. Just let me look at you. He cupped her face, skimmed his hands back into her hair. Her skin was chilled, her eyes huge and full of worry. But she was here. She was whole. Just let me look. I'm fine. He drew her close, seemed to fold himself around her and rock. Sophia, she's fine. The taut wire that had held her straight and steady snapped as she burrowed into him. God, David, God, our babies. I've never been so scared, and all the time it was happening, they, they were amazing. I didn't like leaving Sophie back there dealing with the police. But I didn't want Maddie coming home alone, so Ty's already on his way down. She drew a ragged breath, then a second that came easier. I thought he would be. That's all right then. Come inside. He shifted her, keeping her close to his side. Tell me everything. Tyler swung behind the police cruiser with a harsh scream of brakes. In the flashing lights, Sophia watched him stride over the road. She could see him well enough to recognize Rage. As calmly as she could, she turned away from the cop who was interviewing her and walked toward him. He grabbed her fast enough, hard enough to knock the breath out of her. Nothing had ever felt so safe. I was hoping you'd come. I was really hoping. Did you get banged up any? No. The jeep, on the other hand. I think I blew the transmission. Ty, I didn't have any brakes. They were just gone. I know they're going to tow it in, check it out, but I already know. The words poured out of her, shaky at first, then gaining strength, gaining temper. It wasn't an accident. It wasn't some mechanical failure. Somebody wanted to hurt me, and they didn't care if my mother and Maddie got hurt too. God damn it, she's just a little girl. Tough though, tough and smart. She told me to downshift. She doesn't even know how to drive. The rage would have to wait. He'd have to wait to break something in half, to plow his fist into something, anything. Sophia was trembling and needed tending. Kid knows something about everything. Get in the car. Time for somebody else to take the wheel. A little dazed now, she glanced behind her. I think they still want to talk to me. They can talk to you tomorrow. I'm taking you home. Find my me. I have some shopping bags. He smiled, and his grip on her loosened to a caress. Of course you do. He meant what he'd said about taking her home, his home. When she didn't argue the point, he figured she was more shaken than she'd admitted. He dumped her shopping bags in the foyer, then wondered what the hell to do with her. You want like a hot bath, a drink? How about a drink in a hot bath? I'll take care of it. You ought to call your mother, let her know you're back, and you'll be staying here. All right, thanks. He dumped half a tube of shower gel that had been around since Christmas into the tub. It smelled like pine, but it bubbled. He figured she'd want bubbles. He stuck a couple of candles on the counter. Women went for candlelit baths for reasons he couldn't fathom. He poured her a glass of wine, set it on the lip of the tub, and was standing back, trying to figure out what else to do when she stepped into the bathroom. Her single huge sigh told him he'd already hit the mark. Macmillan, I love you. Yeah, so you said. No, no. At this moment, this exact moment, no one has ever, will ever love you more. Enough to let you get in with me. In a tub full of bubbles, he didn't think so. And if he could overlook the mortification of that for the obvious benefits, she looked beat. I'll take a pass on this one. Strip and get in. You romantic bastard! A half hour in here and I'll feel human again. 
he left her to it and went down to get her things. To his way of thinking, if he dumped her shopping loot in the bedroom, it would take her that much longer to run off again. As far as he was concerned, this was the first stage of her moving in. He grabbed her purse, her briefcase, four, Jesus Christ, four loaded shopping bags, and started back up with them. As long as he kept busy, he told himself, did what came next, he wouldn't give in to the fury choking him. What did you buy? Small slabs of granite? He tossed them on the bed, considered the job done, and her briefcase tumbled off. He grabbed for it, managed to snag the strap, and, upending it, dumped out most of the contents. Why did anyone need so much junk in a briefcase? Resigned, he crouched and began to gather it up again. Okay, he could see the bottle of water, her bulging filofax, the electronic memo deal, the pens, though God knew why she needed a half dozen of them, lipstick. Idly, he uncapped it, swiveled the tube out, one sniff, and he tasted her. Travel scissors, hmm, post-its, paper clips, aspirin, a powder puff thing, a fingernail thing, other assorted girl things that made him wonder why she bothered to carry a purse as well, and what the hell she put in it. Breath mints, a little bag of unopened candy, a mini tape recorder, wet naps, matches, a couple of floppy disks and some file folders, a pair of highlighters and a bottle of clear nail polish. Amazing, he decided. It was a wonder she didn't walk crooked once she strapped it over her shoulder. Just passing the time, he flipped through the file folders as he replaced them. She had a tear sheet of the first ad, a comp of the second, a ream of scribbled notes and a stack of typed ones. He found the press releases with the notes scribbled over them. Lips pursed, he read the English version and found it solid, strong, and smart. He'd expected nothing else. Then he found the altered ad. Holding it, and a copy of an envelope addressed to her, he came straight up. He was still holding them when he shoved open the bathroom door. What the hell is this? She'd nearly fallen asleep. When she blinked, the first thing she saw was his furious face, and the second, the sheets in his hands. What were you doing in my briefcase? Never mind that. Where did you get this? In the mail. When? A hesitation. Brief, but long enough to let him know she was considering a cover. Don't bother jiving me, Sophie. When did you get this? Yesterday. And you were planning to show it to me when? In a couple of days. Look, would you mind if I finish up in here before we discuss this? I'm naked and covered with boy bubbles. A couple of days? Yes. I wanted to think about it, and I went to the police with it. To link just today so I could get a legal opinion. I can handle it, Ty. Yeah. He looked at her up to her chin in froth, her face haunted by shadows of fatigue. You're a real handler, Sophia. I guess I forgot that part. Ty! She slapped a fist on the water when he walked out and closed the door. Just wait a minute! She got out of the tub and, rather than drying off, just wrapped a towel around herself. She went after him, leaving a trail of water and bubbles. She called him again, cursed him, and heard the back door slam shut as she raced downstairs. She slept on the outside lights, saw that his long, angry strides were carrying him toward the vineyards. Tightening her grip on the knotted towel, she ran outside. Her bare foot came down hard on a small stone, inspiring a fresh string of curses as she continued in a limping run. Tyler, just wait a damn minute! She hurled insults at his back until she realized she was using Italian, and they might as well have been promises of undying love to his ear. Listen, you idiot! You coward! You stop where you are and fight like a man! Because he stopped, whirled around, she all but plowed straight into him. She pulled up short, puffing like a steam engine and hopping to take the weight off her sore foot. Where do you think you're going? she demanded. You don't want to be near me now. Wrong. To prove it, she tapped a fist on his chest. You want to take a shot at me? Fine. She angled her chin. I'd rather somebody take an honest punch than walk away. As tempting as that is, and believe me, I'm in the mood to punch something. I don't hit women. Go back in the house. You're wet and half naked. I'll go back when you go back. In the meantime, 
We can have this out right here. You're mad because I didn't come running to you over that nasty bit of business. Well, I'm sorry. I did what I thought best about it. You're half right. You did what you thought best, but you're not sorry. I'm surprised you bothered to call me tonight just because somebody tried to kill you. Ty, it's not the same thing. It's just a stupid picture. I wasn't going to let it upset me or you or anyone. You weren't going to let. There you go. Teamwork, my ass. He was shouting now. Such a rare occurrence. She could only stare up at him. A big, furious man who'd finally snapped his leash. You decide what you'll give, how much and when. Everyone's supposed to fall in line with your schedule, your plan. Well, fuck it, Sophie. Fuck that. I just stepped out of line. God damn it, I love you. He hauled her up on her toes, calloused hands against pampered skin. You're it for me. If it's not the same on both sides, it's nothing. Do you get it? Nothing. Furious with both of them, he dropped her back on her feet. Now go inside and get dressed. I'll take you home. Please don't. Please, she said, touching his arm as he started to walk by her. Please, God, don't walk away. The shakes were back, but had nothing to do with fear for her life. This was so much more. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry that by not doing something I thought would worry you, I did something to hurt you. I'm used to taking care of myself, used to making my own decisions. That's not how it works anymore. If you can't deal with that, we're wasting our time. You're right. And you're scaring me because I understand this is important enough to make you walk away from me. I don't want that to happen. You're right, and I was wrong. I wanted to handle it my way, and I was wrong. Yell at me, curse at me. But don't push me out. His temper had peaked and ebbed and, as always, left him feeling annoyed with himself. You're cold. Let's go inside. Wait. His voice was so final, so distant, it tied knots in her belly. Just listen. She gripped his arm, her fingers digging desperately into his shirt. If he turned away now, she knew she'd be alone as she'd never been alone before in her life. I'm listening. I was angry when it came. All I could think was that the bastard, I know it's Jerry, the bastard's using my own work to taunt me, to try to scare me, and I'm not going to let him. I'm not going to let him worry me or my mother or anyone I care about. I thought I could handle it myself and protect you from the worry, and I realized standing here right now that if you'd done the same thing, I'd be just as hurt. Just as angry as you are. Her voice hitched, and she feared she'd sob. Unfair tactics, she reminded herself and bit down on grief. I love you. Maybe that's the one thing I don't know how to handle. Not yet. Give me a chance to figure it out. I'm asking you not to walk away from me. It's the one thing I can't take. Needing someone, loving them, and watching them walk away. I'm not your father. Ty cupped a hand under her chin. He saw the tears brimming and her valiant attempt to hold them off. And neither are you. My being there for you, taking some of the weight, doesn't make you weak. It doesn't make you less, Sophie. He always let someone else deal with the sticky parts. She drew in a breath, let it out shakily. I know what I'm doing, Ty, when I push people back so I can deal with problems on my own. I know what I'm trying to prove. I even know it's stupid and self-serving, but I can't always seem to stop doing it. Practice. He took her hand. I told you before I'd stick, didn't I? A shudder ran through her. Yes, you did. To steady herself, she brought their joined hands to her cheek. I've never been it for anyone before. No one's been it for me. Looks like you are. That works for me. We square now? I guess we are. Her lips curved. He made things so simple, she thought. All she had to do was let him. It's been a hell of a night so far. Let's go back. Finish it off. 
He slid an arm around her to lead her back to the house, automatically taking her weight as she limped. Served her right, he thought, riling him up the way she had. Hurt your foot? The amused and satisfied tone didn't escape her notice. I stepped on a rock while I was running after this big stupid culo. Which would be me. I understand enough gutter Italian to know when the woman I love is calling me an asshole. But very affectionately. Since you're up on the language, why don't we finish the night off by... She rose up to whisper in his ear, ending the provocative Italian with a quick nip on his lobe. Mmm. He didn't have a clue what she'd said, but the blood had cheerfully drained out of his head. I think I'm going to need a translation on that one. Happy to, she said, once we're inside. It surprised Pilar to see Tyler outside the kitchen door at what she imagined he'd consider the middle of the morning. It surprised her a great deal more to see the bouquet of flowers in his hand. Good morning. Hi. He stepped inside the cutter kitchen, nearly shuffled his feet. I didn't expect to see you here or I'd have... Embarrassed, he shook the flowers in his hand. You know, brought more. I see. You brought them for Maddie? Ty? Delighted with him, she reached up, squeezed his cheeks. You're so sweet. Yeah, right. Well, how are you feeling? Fine. Lucky. She stepped toward the inside doorway and called for Maddie. Sophia was amazing, steady as a rock. Yeah, that's Sophie. I gave her a break. Left her sleeping this morning. He looked over as Maddie came in. Hi, kid. Hey, what are those? I think they're flowers, for you. Her eyebrows drew together in puzzlement. Me? I have to go. I'll just say goodbye to David and Theo. Pilar kissed Maddie lightly, absently on the cheek, and made the girl's color come up. See you later. Yeah, okay. How come they're for me? She asked Tyler. Because I hear you did good. He held them out. You want them or not? Yeah, I want them. She took them, noted the little flutter in her belly as she sniffed, a kind of muscle reflex, she supposed it was, a nice one. Nobody ever gave me flowers before. They will. I figured I'd get you something for your brain, too, but I haven't come up with it yet. Anyway, what did you do to your hair? I cut it. So? So? Just asking. He waited while she got out of vase. The new do made her look like a brainy pixie, Ty thought. Boys, he realized with a little tug of regret, were going to come sniffing at the door. You want to hang with me today? I've got to check for mildew, then see how the work's going over at the old distillery. Start on the weeding. Yeah, that'd be good. Tell your dad. When she was settled in the car beside Tyler, Maddie folded her hands on her lap. I've got two things I want to ask you. Sure, shoot. If I were like ten years older and had actual breasts, would you go for me? Jesus, Maddie. I don't have a crush on you or anything. I sort of did when we first moved here, but I got over it. You're too old for me, and I'm not ready for a serious relationship or sex. Damn right you're not. But when I am ready, I want to know if a guy would go for me, theoretically. Tyler ran a hand over his face, theoretically, and leaving out the breasts because that's not what a guy looks for. If you were ten years older, I'd have already gone for you, okay? She smiled, slipped on her sunglasses. Okay, but that's bull about breasts. Guys say how they look for personality and intelligence. Some of them say how they're leg men or whatever, but it's the breasts. And you know this because... Because it's something we have you don't. He opened his mouth, shut it again. This wasn't a debate he could comfortably enter into with a teenage girl. You said you had a couple of questions. Yeah, well, she shifted in her seat to face him. The other's an idea. Venotherapy. Venotherapy? Yeah, I read about it. Grape seed base skin creams and stuff. I was thinking we could start a line of products. We could. I need to do more research, some experimenting. But this company's doing it in France. We could corner the American market. 
See, red wine contains antioxidants, polyphenols, and Maddie, I know about polyphenols. Okay, okay, but see the seeds, and you ditch them during wine production. They have antioxidants, and that's really good for the skin. Plus, I'm thinking we could do an herbal deal, internal too, a whole health and beauty line. Health and beauty. What next? Look, kid, I make wine, not skin cream. But you could, she insisted. If I could have the seeds when you harvest and a place to experiment, you said you wanted to give me something for my brain. Give me this. I was thinking more like a chemistry set. He mumbled. Let me mull on it. He intended to let the mulling wait until after work, but Maddie had different ideas. Sophia was in the vineyard watching the cutters weed with their wedge-shaped blades. Maddie headed straight for her and started before Sophia could speak. I think we should move into vino therapy like that French company. Really, Sophia pursed her lips, a sure sign she was carefully considering. That's interesting, because I've had that idea on a back burner for a while now. I've tried the facial mask; it's marvelous. We're winemakers, Ty began, and we'll always be, Sophia agreed. But that doesn't preclude addressing other areas. There is an enormous market for natural beauty products. I've had to table the idea because we've had a difficult year and other things demanded my attention. But maybe this is a good time to consider expansion rather than damage control. She mused and was already playing on the spin. I'll need to accumulate more data, of course. I can get it, Maddie said. I'm good at research. You're hired. Once research moves toward research and development, we'll need a guinea pig. As one, they turned to study Tyler. He blanched. Actually, felt the blood fall away from his face. Forget it. Chicken. Sophia's amused expression faded as she spotted the two figures walking toward them. The police are here. Claremont and McGuire. It can't be good news. Deliberate, Sophia thought as she sat in Tyler's living room. The four wheel had been tampered with as deliberately as the wine had been. Part of her had known it, but having it confirmed now with cold hard facts brought a fresh chill to her skin. Yes, I use that vehicle often. Primarily, I drive my car to and from the city, but it's a two seater. The three of us were spending the day in San Francisco shopping for my mother's wedding. We needed the bigger car. Who knew your plans? McGuire asked her. A number of people, I suppose. Family. We were meeting Judge Moore, so her family. Did you make appointments? Not really. I stopped by to see Lincoln Moore before I met the others for lunch. The rest of the day was loose. And the last place you stopped for any length of time? Claremont asked. We had dinner. Moose's at Washington Square. The car was parked about ninety minutes, from around seven to eight thirty or so. We left for home from there. Any idea, Miss Giambelli, who would want to cause you harm? Yes, she met Claremont's gaze levelly. Jeremy De Mornay, he's involved in the product tampering and the embezzlement in every problem my family's had this year. I believe he's responsible for it. That he planned it and used my cousin and whatever, whoever else came to hand. And as I've told him so personally. He's unlikely to be happy with me just now. Mister De Mornay's been questioned, and I'm sure he had plenty of answers. He's responsible. You saw the ad he sent Sophia. Frustrated, Tyler pushed to his feet. It was a threat, and he made good on it. We can't prove De Mornay sent the ad. McGuire watched Ty prowl the room. Big hands, she noted. De Mornay must have crumbled like plaster under them. We've confirmed he was in New York when the package was mailed from Chicago. He had it sent then. Find a way to prove it. Tyler shot back. That's your job. I believe he killed my father. Sophia kept her voice calm. I believe his hatred of my father is at the core of everything that's happened. He may tell himself in some skewed way that it's business, but it's personal. Basing that on the alleged affair between Ivano and the former Mrs. De Mornay, it's a long time to wait for payback. No, it's not. 
Maddie spoke up. Not if you want to do it right. Pull everyone in on it. Claremont took the interruption in stride, gave Maddie a quiet go-ahead look. If he goes after Sophia's father right after the divorce, then everybody knows he's whacked out over it. She'd spent some time analyzing it, running theories. Like if I want to get Theo for something, I sit back, wait, figure out how to hit him best. Then when I do, he's not expecting it and doesn't even know why he's getting it. She nodded. It's scientific and lots more satisfying. My kid's a genius. Ty commented. A dish best served cold. Claremont mused on the drive back to the city. It fits to Mornay's profile. He's cool, sophisticated, erudite. He's got money, position, impeccable taste. I can see that type waiting, planning things out, tugging strings. But I can't get his type risking losing that position over a cracked marriage. How would you handle it if your man cheated on you? Oh, I'd kick his ass and scalp him in the divorce and do everything in my power to make the rest of his life a living hell, including sticking pins in the throat and balls of a doll made in his image. But then, I'm not sophisticated and erudite, and people wonder why I'm not married. Claremont flipped open his notebook. Let's go talk to Kristen Drake again. It was infuriating to have the police come to your place of business. People would be talking, speculating, snickering. There was nothing Chris hated more than people gossiping behind her back. And as she saw it, the blame of it was squarely on Sophia's shoulders. If you want my opinion, the problems Jim Bailey's been facing this year were brought on because Sophia's more interested in promoting her own agenda than in the company or the people who work for it. And that agenda is, Claremont asked. Sophia is her own agenda, and her self-interest, as you see it, has resulted in no less than four deaths, a shooting, and what might have been a fatal accident involving herself, her mother, and a young girl. She remembered the cold rage on Jerry's face when she'd been in New York, and Sophia and her farmer had cornered him. Obviously, she's pissed somebody off. Not her problem, Chris assured herself. Not her deal. Besides you, Miss Drake, McGuire said pleasantly. It's no secret that I left Jim Bailey on less than amicable terms, and the reason for it was Sophia. I don't like her, and I resent the fact that she was brought in over me when I clearly had seniority and more experience, and I intend to make her pay for it in the market. How long were you being courted by De Mornay and Lacour while you were still drawing a salary from Jim Belly? There's no law against considering other offers while employed with another firm. It's business. How long? She shrugged. I was first approached last fall by Jeremy De Mornay. Yes, he indicated that Lacour would be pleased to have me on their team. He made an offer, and I took some time to consider it. What decided you? I simply realized I wasn't going to be happy with Jim Belly as things stood. I felt creatively stifled there. Yet you remained there, stifled, for months. During that period, were you and Mornay in contact with each other? There's no law against Miss Drake. Claremont interrupted. We're investigating murder. You'd simplify the process by giving us a clear picture. We simplify it for you by asking questions here, where you're comfortable, rather than bringing you into the station house where the atmosphere isn't nearly as pleasant. Were you and De Mornay in contact during that period? So what if we were? During those contacts, did you give Mr. De Mornay confidential information about Jim Belly, business practices, promotional campaigns, personal information that may have come into your hands regarding members of the family? Her palms went damp, hot and damp. I want to call a lawyer. That's your privilege. You can answer the question and help us out here. Maybe cop to some unethical business practices we're not interested in using against you, or you can hang tough and possibly end up charged with accessory to murder. I don't know anything about murder. I don't know anything about that. And if Jerry, Jesus, Jesus. 
She was starting to sweat. How many times had she gone back over the scenario Tyler had painted in Jerry's apartment? How often had she wondered if what he'd said, even part of what he'd said, was true? If it was, she'd be connected. It was time, she decided, to break the link. I'm willing to play hardball to get what I want in business. I don't know anything about murder, about product tampering. I passed Jerry some information, yes. Gave him a heads up on Sophia's big centennial plans, the scheduling. Maybe he asked about personal business, but it wasn't anything more than office gossip. If he had anything to do with Tony, she trailed off, and her eyes glimmered with oncoming tears. I don't expect you to believe me. I don't care if you do, but Tony meant something to me. Maybe at first I started seeing him because I saw it as another slap at Sophia, but it changed. You were in love with him? McGuire infused her voice with sympathy. He mattered to me. He made promises about my position at Giampelli. He'd have made good on them, I know it, if he'd lived. I told you before, I'd met him in Sophia's apartment a couple times. Not, she added, the night he was killed. We were cooling it a while. I admit I was upset about that at first. Renee had her clutches in him deep. It hurt you when he married her. It pissed me off. Chris pressed her lips together. When he told me they were engaged, I was angry. I didn't want to marry him, for God's sake. Who needs it? But I liked his company. He was good in bed, and he appreciated my professional talents. I didn't care about his money. I can make my own. Renee's nothing but a gold-digging whore. Which is what you called her when you phoned her apartment last December, McGuire stated. Maybe I did. I'm not sorry for saying what I think. Saying what I think's a long way from having anything to do with killing somebody. My relationship with Jerry's been professional right down the line. If he had anything to do with Tony or any of the rest, it's on him. I'm not swinging with him. I don't play the game that way. Some game. McGuire slid behind the wheel. Give me a nice clean. I killed him because he cut me off on the freeway any day of the week. Drake's running scared, shaking down to the toes. She thinks De Mornay set all this up, and she's in line to take the fall. He's a slick son of a bitch. Yeah. Let's pump up the pressure on him. The slicker they are, the harder you squeeze. Chapter 29 He wasn't going to tolerate it. The idiot police were certainly on the Giambelli payroll. He had no doubt of it. Of course they could prove nothing but the muscle in Jerry's cheek twitched as doubts danced in his head. No, he was sure of that, sure of it. He'd been very, very careful. But that was beside the point. The Jim Bellies had publicly humiliated him once before. Avano's affair with his wife had put his name on wagging tongues, forced him to change his life, his lifestyle. He could hardly have remained married to the unfaithful slut, particularly when people knew. It had cost him placement and prestige in the company. In his great uncle's eyes, a man who lost a wife to a competitor could lose accounts to a competitor. And Jerry, always considered the liqueur heir apparent, particularly by himself, had been taken down a painful peg. The Giambellis hadn't suffered because of it. The three Giambelli women had remained above it all. The talk of Pilar had been respectful sympathy of Sophia quiet admiration, and there was never talk of the great La Signora. Or hadn't been, Jerry reminded himself, until he'd made it happen. Years in the planning and stylish in its execution, his revenge had cut through to the core of Giambelli. It had sliced through the family, keen as a scalpel. Disgrace, scandal, mistrust, and all brought about by their own. Perfection. Who'd been taken down a peg now? Even with all his planning, his careful stages, they were turning it on him. They knew he'd bested them, and they were trying to drag him under. He wouldn't permit it. Did they think he'd tolerate having his associates speculate about him? A de Mornay? 
The idea of it made him shake with black, bitter rage. His own family had questioned him, questioned him on business practices. The hypocrites. Oh, they didn't mind seeing their market share increase. Had they asked questions then? But at the first sign there might be a ripple in the pond, they laid the groundwork to make him a scapegoat. He didn't need them either. Didn't need their sanctimonious questioning of his ethics or his methods or his personal agenda. He wouldn't wait for them to ask for his resignation, if they would dare to do so. He was financially comfortable. It might be time to take a break from business, an extended vacation, a complete relocation. He'd move to Europe, and there his reputation alone would ensure him a top position with any company he selected. When he was ready to work again, when he was ready to pay Lucour back for their disloyalty. But before he restructured his life yet again, he would finish the job. Personally, this time, Macmillan thought he didn't have the guts to pull his own trigger. He'd learn differently. Jerry promised himself. They would all learn differently. The Giambelli women were going to pay dearly for offending him. Sophia zipped through her interoffice email. She'd have preferred attending to the reports, the memos, the questions personally in her San Francisco office, but the law had been laid down. She didn't go to the city unaccompanied. Period. Tyler refused to be pulled away from the fields. The weeding wasn't complete. The suckering was just begun, and there was a mild infestation of grape leafhoppers. Nothing very troublesome. She thought with a little twist of resentment as she answered an inquiry. The wasps fed on the leafhopper eggs. That's why blackberry bushes, which served as hosts for the predator, were planted throughout the vineyard. Hardly a season passed without a slight infestation, but there were stories, and those who loved to tell them, of an entire crop being devastated by the little bastards. She wouldn't budge Tyler until he was certain it was under control, and by that time she'd be so busy with the last-minute details of her mother's wedding she wouldn't be able to spare a day to go into the office, much less out to the vineyards. When the wedding was over, the harvest would begin. Then no one would have time for anything but the crush. At least the demands, the tight schedule, helped keep her mind off Jerry and the police investigation. It had been two full weeks since she'd careened around turns with no breaks. As far as she could tell, the investigation was at a standstill. Jerry de Mornay was a different matter. She too had her sources. She was perfectly aware there was talk about him, questions not only by the police, but by his superiors and the board members, led mortifyingly, she hoped, by his own great uncle. It was some satisfaction to know he was being squeezed, as her family had been squeezed, between the greedy fists of gossip and suspicion. She brought up another email, clicked to open the attached file. As she watched it scroll on screen, her heart stumbled, then began to race. It was a copy of the next ad, one set to run in August. A family picnic, a wash of sunlight, the dapple of shade from a huge old oak. A scatter of people at a long wooden table that was loaded with food and bottles of wine. The image Sophia had handpicked was of several generations, a mix of faces, expressions, movement. The young mother with a baby in her lap, the little boy wrestling with a puppy on the grass, a father with a young girl riding his shoulders. At the head of the table, the model who'd reminded her of Eli sat, his glass lifted as if in a toast. There was laughter in the picture. Continuity, family tradition. This image had been altered, subtly, slickly. Three of the model's faces had been replaced. Sophia studied her grandmother, her mother, herself. Her eyes were wide with horror. Her mouth gaping with it, stabbed into her chest like a knife, was a bottle of wine. It read, "This is your moment. It'll be the death of you and yours." You son of a bitch! You son of a bitch! She jabbed the keyboard, ordered the copy to print, saved the file, then closed it. He wouldn't shake her, she promised herself, and he wouldn't threaten her family with impunity. She would deal with him. She would handle this. 
She started to slap the hard copy of the ad in a file, hesitated. You're a handler, Tyler had told her. Suckering the vines was a pleasant way to spend a summer's day. The sun was warm, the breeze mild as a kiss. Under the brilliant blue cup of sky, the circling vacas were upholstered with green, the hills rolling down lush with the promise of summer. His grapes were protected from that streaming midday sun by a lovely verdant canopy of leaves, nature's parasol, his grandfather called it. The crop was more than half its mature size, and before long the black grape varieties would begin changing color, green berries miraculously going blue, then purple as they pushed toward that last spurt of maturity, and harvest. Each stage of growth required tending, just as each stage brought the season to its inevitable promise. When Sophia crouched beside him, he continued his work and his pleasure. I thought you were going to hole up in your office all day, waste the sunshine, hell of a way to make a living if you ask me. I thought a big important vintner like yourself would have more to do than suckering vines personally. She combed a hand through his hair, lavishly streaked by the sun. Where's your hat, pal? Around somewhere. These Pinot Noir are going to be our earliest to ripen. I've got a hundred down with Polly on these babies. I say they're going to give us our best vintage in five years. His money's on the Chenot Blanc. I'll take a piece of that. Mine's on the Pinot Chardonnay. You ought to save your money. You're going to need it financing Maddie's brainstorm. It's an innovative, forward-thinking project. She's already buried me in data. We're putting together a proposal for La Signora. You want to rub grape seeds all over your body? I could do it for you. No charge. He shifted, their knees bumped before he laid a hand on hers. What's the matter, baby? I got another message, another doctored ad. It came through a file attached to inner office email. As his hand tensed, she turned hers over so their fingers linked. I've already called. It was sent under PJ's screen name. She hasn't sent me any posts today. Someone either used her computer or had her account information and password. It could have come from anywhere. Where is it? Back home. I printed it out, locked it in a drawer. I'm going to send it to the police, add it to their pile. But I wanted to tell you first. As much as I hate the idea, I suppose the thing to do was call a summit meeting so everyone in the family's aware and on guard. But I wanted to tell you first. He stayed as he was, crouched, his hand dwarfing hers. Overhead, a cloud teased the edges of the sun and filtered the light. Here's what I want to do. I want to hunt him down and peel the skin off his bones with a dull knife. Until that happy day, I want you to promise me something. If I can? No, Sophie, there's no if. You don't go anywhere by yourself, not even from the villa to here, not even for a walk in the gardens or a quick trip to the goddamn mini-mart. I mean it. I understand how worried you are, but you can't understand, because it's unreasonable. It's indescribable. He tripped her heart by bringing her free hand up, pressing his lips to the palm. If I wake up in the middle of the night and you're not there, I break out in a cold sweat. Ty, shut up. Just shut up. In one fast and fluid move, he got to his feet to walk off the nerves in the rage. I've never loved anyone before. I didn't expect it to be you. But it is, and that's it. You're not doing anything to mess this up for me. Well, naturally we can't have that. He turned, gave her a look of profound frustration. You know what I mean, Sophie. Fortunately for you, I do. I don't intend to mess this up for you or me either. Great. Let's go pack your things. I'm not moving in with you. Why the hell not? Frustration had him dragging his hands through his hair. You're there half the time anyway, and don't give me that lame excuse about needing to be home to help with the wedding. It's not a lame excuse. It's a reason. Potentially a lame reason. I, I don't want to live with you. Why? Just tell me why. Maybe I'm old-fashioned. Like hell you are. 
Maybe I'm old-fashioned, she repeated, in this one area. I don't think we should live together. I think we should get married. That's just another— The word sank in, momentarily dulled his brain. Whoa. Yes, and with that scintillating response, I need to go back home and call the police. You know, one day you're actually going to let me work through a process at my own time and pace. But since that isn't the case on this one, at least you could ask me in a more traditional way. You want me to ask you? Fine. Will you marry me? Sure. November's good for me. He cupped her elbows, lifted her a couple inches off the ground, which was when I was going to ask you, but you always have to be first. I figured we could get married, have a nice honeymoon, and be back home before pruning time. Kind of a tidy and symbolic cycle, don't you think? I don't know. I have to think about it. Culo. Back at you, honey. He gave her a hard kiss, then dropped her back on her feet. Let me finish this vine, then we'll go call the cops and the family. Ty. Hmm. Just because I did the proposing doesn't mean I don't want a ring. Yeah, yeah, I'll get to it. I'll pick it out. No, you won't. Why not? I'm the one who'll be wearing it. You're the one wearing your face, too. But you didn't pick that out, either. On a sigh, she knelt beside him. That makes absolutely no sense. But she tipped her head onto his shoulder as he worked. When I came here, I was scared and angry. Now I'm scared, angry, and happy. It's better, she decided. A lot better. This is who we are, Teresa stated, lifting her glass, and who we choose to be. They were dining al fresco in a kind of Jim Belly reflection of the ad. A purposeful choice, Sophia thought. Her grandmother would stand straight against a threat and kick it dead in the balls if need be. The evening was warm, the sunlight still brilliant. In the vineyards beyond the lawns and gardens, the grapes were growing fat, and the Pinot Noir, as Tyler had predicted, was just beginning to turn. Forty days till harvest, Sophia thought. That was the old rule. When the grapes took color, harvest was forty days away. Her mother would be married by then, and just back from her honeymoon, Maddie and Theo would be her brother and sister and back in school. She would be planning her own wedding, though she'd pressured Tyler not to announce their engagement yet. Life could continue because, as La Signora said, this is who they were and who they chose to be. When we have trouble, Teresa continued, we band together. Family, friends, this year has brought trouble and changes and grief. But it's also brought joy. In a few weeks, Eli and I will have a new son, and more grandchildren. And, it seems, she added, turning toward Maddie, a new enterprise. In the meantime, we've been threatened. I've given considerable thought to what can and should be done. James, your legal opinion of our options. He set down his fork, gathered his thoughts. While evidence indicates de Mornay was involved, even perhaps instrumental in the embezzlement scheme, the tampering, there's no concrete proof. Donato's claims notwithstanding, there isn't enough to convince the district attorney to file charges on those matters, or Tony Ivano's death. It's been confirmed that he was in New York when Sophia's car was tampered with. He would have hired someone, David began. Be that as it may, and I don't disagree, until the police have evidence against them, there's nothing they can do. And nothing, James added, you can do. My best advice is to stay above it. Let the system work. No offense intended to you or your system, Uncle James, but it hasn't been working very well to date. Donato was murdered while he was in the system, Sophia pointed out, and David was shot on a public street. Those are matters for the Italian authorities, Sophie, and only tie our hands all the more. He's harassing Sophie with those ads, Tyler shoved at his plate. Why can't they be traced back to him? I wish I had the answers. 
This isn't a stupid man or, thus far, a careless one. If he's at the core of all this, he's covered himself with layers of protection, alibis. He walked into my apartment, sat down, and shot my father in cold blood. I'd consider that, at the very least, a careless act. He needs to be punished. He should be hounded and pursued and harassed, just as he's hounded, pursued, and harassed the family. Sophia, Helen reached across the table. I'm sorry. Sometimes justice isn't what we want it to be or what we expect. He set out to ruin us. Teresa spoke calmly. He hasn't done so. Damaged, yes. Caused us loss, but he'll pay a price for it. Today, he was asked to resign his position at Lecour. I'm pleased to believe the discussions Eli and I had with certain members of their board and discussions Tabid had with key executives bore this particular fruit. She sipped her wine, enjoyed the bouquet. I'm told he didn't take it well. I'll use whatever influence I have at my disposal to see to it he finds no position at any reputable winemaker. Professionally, he's finished. It's not enough, Sophia began. It may be too much, Helen corrected. If he's as dangerous as you believe, this sort of interference will push him into a corner, make it only more imperative that he strike back. As a lawyer, as your friend, I'm asking you, all of you, to leave it alone. Mom, Link shook his head. Could you? Yes. The single syllable was a fierce declaration. To protect what mattered most I could, I would. Teresa, your daughter is about to be married. She's found happiness. She's weathered a storm, and so have all of you. This is a time for you to celebrate, to move on, not to focus on revenge and retribution. We each protect what matters most, Helen, in our own way. The sun's going, she said. Tyler, light the candles. It's a pleasant evening. We should enjoy it. Tell me, do you still pitch your Pinot Noir against my Chinon Blanc? I do. He worked his way down the table, setting the candles to flame. Of course, it's a win-win situation as we're merged. When he reached the head of the table, he met her eyes. Speaking of mergers, I'm going to marry Sophia. Damn it, Ty, I told you. Quiet, he said so casually, Sophia sputtered into silence. She's the one who asked me, but I thought it was a pretty good idea. Oh, Sophie. Pilar leaped up from the table and rushed to throw her arms around her daughter. I only wanted to wait until after your wedding to tell you, but Big Mouth here couldn't keep it shut. That part was her idea, too. Tyler agreed as he circled the table. Sophie's not wrong that often, so it's hard to get it through her head when she is. The way I figure it, you just can't have enough good news. Here. He grabbed her hand, holding it when she tugged. He took a ring out of his pocket and slipped the simple and spectacular square-cut diamond on her finger. That makes it a deal. Why can't you just... <gasps> it's beautiful. It was my grandmother's, Macmillan to Jambelli. He took her hand, lifted it, and kissed it. Jambelli to Macmillan. It works for me. She sighed. I really hate it when you're right. Revenge, Jerry decided, made stranger bedfellows than politics. Not that they'd quite gotten to the bed yet, but they would. Rene was so much easier a mark than he'd have believed. I appreciate your seeing me like this, listening, hearing me out. He reached for Rene's hand. I was afraid you believed those vicious rumors of Jim Bellies are circulating. I wouldn't believe any of them if they said the sun came up in the east. Rene settled back on the sofa, made herself cozy. Over and above her loathing for the Jim Bellies was a keen sense for a man with money. She was quickly running out of cash. Tony, damn him, hadn't been honest with her. She'd already sold off some jewelry, and if she didn't land another fish soon, she'd have to go back to work.
I'm not saying I didn't play hardball. That's my job. Believe me, Lacour was behind me all the way, until things got sticky. Sounds like the way the Giambellis treated Tony. Exactly. Oh, he'd use that, use that and her innate hatred to turn his tide. Don offered me inside information. I took it. Of course, the Giambellis can't have that stand, can't abide people knowing they were undermined by their own. So it has to be me. I have to have coerced or finagled or bribed or God knows. I took what was offered. It's not like I held a gun to their heads. He broke off, squeezed her hand. Jesus, Renee, I'm so sorry. What a stupid thing to say. It's all right. If Tony hadn't lied to me, hadn't cheated and snuck around with that little tramp who worked with Sophia, he'd still be alive today. And she wouldn't be damn near broke. Chris Drake. For effect, he pressed a hand to his brow. I didn't know about her and Tony before I hired her. The idea that she might have had something to do with Tony's death. If she did, she was still working for them. They're behind it, all of it. Could she be more perfect? He only wished he'd thought of using Renee months before. They've ruined my reputation. I guess I brought part of that on myself. I shouldn't have wanted to win so much. Winning's all there is. He smiled at her. And I'm a man who hates to lose. In anything. You know, when I first saw you, I didn't know you and Tony were an item, and I... Well, I never got the chance to compete there, so I suppose that doesn't qualify as losing. More wine? Yes, thanks. She pursed her lips, considering how to play it while he reached over for the bottle. I was swept away by Tony's charm, she began, and I admired what I thought was his ambition. I'm very attracted to clever businessmen. Really? I used to be one, he said as he poured the wine. Now, Jerry, you're still a clever businessman. You'll land on your feet. I want to believe that. I'm thinking of moving to France. I have some offers there. Or would have, he thought grimly. Damn well would have. Luckily, I don't need the money. I can pick and choose, take my time. It might do me good to just travel a while, enjoy the benefits of the years of hard work I've put in. I love traveling, she purred it. I don't feel I can leave until I've straightened all this out, until I've dealt with the Jim Bellies face to face. I'll be frank with you, Renee, because I think you'll understand. I want to pay them back for putting this smear on me. I do understand. In what could be taken for sympathy or otherwise, she laid a hand over his heart. They always treated me like something cheap that could be easily ignored. She worked tears into her eyes. I hate them. Renee, he moved in slowly. Maybe we can find a way to pay them back for both of us. Later, when she lay naked, her head pillowed on his shoulder, he smiled into the dark. Tony's widow was going to clear his path straight into the heart of the Jim Bellies, and he would rip it out. It was going to be fun. Renee dressed carefully for the role she was about to play. Dark, conservative suit, minimal makeup. She and Jerry had worked it all out, just what she'd say, just how she'd behave. He'd made her rehearse countless times. The man was a little too demanding for her taste, but... She figured she'd bring him around, if she kept him long enough. For now he was useful, entertaining, and a means to an end. And he, as most did, underestimated her. He didn't realize she knew he also considered her useful, entertaining, and a means to an end. But Renee Fox was nobody's fool, particularly no man's fool. Jerry de Mornay was dirty up to the knot of his Hermes tie. If he hadn't called the shots in that whole product tampering business, she'd start wearing off the rack suits. Gave those rotten GM bellies a good kick in the ass with that one, she mused. As far as she was concerned, a man smart and devious enough to pull that off was just what she was looking for. She decided walking into the homicide division with the box in her hands was her first step into a very lucrative tomorrow. 
I need to see Detective Claremont or McGuire, she began, then spotted Claremont just rising from behind his desk. Oh, Detective! She was pleased she'd tagged him first. She always did better with men. I have to see you right away. It's urgent. Please, is there somewhere? Take it easy, Mrs. Ivano. He took her arm. How about some coffee? Oh, I couldn't. I couldn't keep anything down. I've been up half the night. She was focused on the job at hand and missed his quick signal to his partner. We'll talk in the coffee room. Why don't you tell me what's upset you? Yes, I, Detective McGuire. It's good you're here too. I'm so confused, so upset. She set the safe box on the table, pushed it to the center as if she wanted distance, then sat. I was going through some of Tony's things, his papers. I hadn't gotten to all of them yet. I couldn't before. I found this box on the top shelf of his closet. I couldn't imagine what might be in it. I'd already had to deal with all the insurance papers, the legal papers. She fluttered her hands. There was a key in his jewelry box. I remembered coming across it before, but not knowing what it was for. This, she said, gesturing. It was for this. Open it, please. I don't want to look through it again. Records, she said when Claremont opened the box and began to sift through the paperwork. Ledgers or whatever they're called from that false account the Jim Belly set up. Tony, he must have known, and that's why they had him killed. I know he must have been gathering this evidence, trying to do the right thing, and it cost him his life. Claremont glanced through the accounts and correspondence, passing the sheets on to McGuire. You believe your husband was killed over these papers? Yes, yes. What was he? Renee thought impatiently. An idiot? I'm afraid I might be partially responsible. I'm afraid what might happen to me. I know someone's been watching me, she said, dropping her voice. It sounds paranoid, I know, but I'm sure of it. I snuck out of my own apartment like a thief to come here. I think they've hired someone to watch me. Who would do that? The Giambellis. She reached out, gripped Claremont's hand. They're wondering if I remember, but I didn't. I didn't until I found this. And if they know, they'll kill me. That you know what? That Sophia killed my Tony. Renee covered her mouth with her hand and sacrificed her makeup to tears. That's a serious accusation. McGuire rose to grab some tissues. Why are you making it? Renee's breath hitched. Her hand trembled as she reached for the tissues. When I found these, I remembered. I'd come home. It was so long ago, a, a year ago. Sophia was there. She and Tony were arguing upstairs. She was furious, and he was trying to calm her down. They didn't even know I'd come in. I went into the kitchen. I could still hear her. She was shouting as she does when she's in that terrible temper of hers. She said she wasn't going to stand for it. That it was none of his business. I didn't hear what he said because his voice was low. She dabbed at tears again. Tony never raised his voice to her. He adored her, but she, she detested him because of me. The Cardianelli account. She said the name, but I didn't think of it again. The Cardianelli account would be left alone, and that would be the end of it. If he did anything with the ledgers, she would make him pay. She said very clearly, "If you don't leave this alone, I'll kill you." I came out of the kitchen then because it made me angry. Almost at the same time, she came flying down the stairs. She saw me, said something vicious in Italian, then stormed out. She released a shuddering breath, sniffled delicately. When I asked Tony about it, I could see he was shaken, but he brushed it off, said it was business, and she was just blowing off steam. I let it go. Sophia often blew off steam that way. I never thought she meant what she said, but she did. He knew she'd been involved in embezzlement, and she killed him for it. So, McGuire tipped back her chair when she and her partner were alone. You buy any of that? For somebody who didn't sleep last night, she looked pretty alert. For somebody terrified and upset. 
She remembered to match her shoes to her purse and coordinate her hose. You're a real fashion cop, partner. No way she just came across these papers. She'd have been through every drawer, closet, and cubbyhole within a day of his death to make sure she had access to every penny. McGuire, I don't think you like the widow of Anno. I don't like people who think I'm stupid. Question: If she had these papers all along, why turn them over now? If she didn't have them before, who passed them to her? The Mornays in San Francisco. Claremont tapped the tips of his fingers together. Wonder how far he and the widow go back. One thing for certain, they've both got it in for the Jim Bellies, and that one wants to put the screws to Sophia G, and she wants it bad, bad enough to give a false statement to the police. Oh hell, she enjoyed that, and she's smart enough to know she didn't say anything we could hook her on. We can't prove if and when she found those papers. And if it came down to it, the argument scene would be her word against Sophia's, who's likely to have argued with her father at some point during the last year of his life. No way to cook her on that, even if we wanted to bother. Never made sense for her to marry Ivano and kill him the day after. She doesn't gel there for me. Doesn't gain her anything, and she's in it for what she can get. If we bought this, she could cop a little revenge. That's what she's after now. Yeah, and so's De Mornay. Claremont rose. Let's see how tight we can link them. Chapter Thirty. Renee slithered onto the sofa beside Jerry and accepted the flute of champagne. I got some very interesting information at the salon today. What might that be? I'll tell you. She ran a fingertip down the center of his shirt. But it'll cost you. Really? He took her hand, lifted it to bite gently on her wrist. Oh, that's nice too, but I want something a little different. Let's go out, lover. I'm so tired of staying in. Take me out to a club where there are people and music and wicked things going on. Honey, you know I'd love to. It's not smart for us to be seen together in public quite yet. She pouted, nuzzled against him. We'll go somewhere nobody knows us. And even if they do, Tony's been dead for months and months. No one expects me to grieve alone forever. From the reports that had winged back across the Atlantic, Renee hadn't grieved alone for a week. Just a little while longer. I'll make it up to you. When we're finished here with everything and everyone, we'll go to Paris. Now, what did you find out today? To borrow from that slut Chris's lexicon, bitch number three is giving bitch number two a little party on Friday night, wedding eve, all females. She's setting up a damn spa in the villa for the night. Facials, body treatments, massages, the works. And what will the men be doing while the women are getting themselves scrubbed and robbed? Watching porno flicks and jerking off, I suppose. They're holding their bachelor night deal at the McMillan place. The bride and groom aren't allowed to do the dirty the night before the wedding. Hypocrites. This is interesting. And exactly what he'd been waiting for. We'll know just where everyone is, and the timing couldn't be better. Right before the happy event. Renee, you're a jewel. I don't want to be one. I just want to have them. A week from now, we'll be in Paris, and I'll take care of that. But first. You and I have a date on Friday night at Villa Giambelli. She wanted it to be perfect, the kind of night they'd all remember and laugh about for years. She'd planned it, organized it, fine-tuned the details right down to the scent of the candles for the aromatherapy treatments. In twenty-four hours, Sophia thought, her mother would be dressing for her wedding. But for her last evening as a single woman, she was going to bask in a world of females. When we have our products, maybe we should sell them direct to spas for a while. Maddie sniffed at the oils already arranged by the massage table. Make them like exclusive, so people are dying for them. You're a clever girl, Madeline. But no business tonight. Tonight is for female ritual. 
We are the handmaidens. Do we get to talk about sex? Of course. This isn't about exchanging recipes. Ah, there's the woman of the hour, Sophie. Already in her long white wrap, Pilar circled the pool house. I can't believe you went to all this trouble. Various stations were set up with lounging sofas and salon chairs. The evening light shimmered towards sunset, while scents from the gardens clung to the air. Tables held abundant platters of fruit and chocolate, bottles of wine and sparkling water, baskets and bowls of flowers. Along the wall, water spilled down the brass sculpture and into the pool to add sensuous music. I was shooting for a Roman bath thing. Do you like it, really? Is wonderful. I feel like a queen. When you're finished, you'll feel like a goddess. Where are the others? We're wasting pampering time. Upstairs, I'll get them. No, you won't. Maddie, pour Mama some wine. She's not to lift a finger except to pick up a chocolate strawberry. I'll get everyone. What kind do you want? Maddie asked her. Just water for now, honey. Thanks. It's such a lovely evening. She wandered toward the open doors. Then laughed lightly. <laughs> massage tables on the patio. Only Sophie. I never had a massage before. Hmm. You'll love it. As she spoke, as she looked out over the garden, Pilar ran a hand absently over Maddie's hair, left it lying on her shoulder. The gesture made everything inside the girl go warm, and made her sigh. What's wrong? Nothing. Maddie passed Pilar the glass. Nothing's wrong. I guess I'm looking forward to everything. You're bluffing, David said around the cigar clamped in his teeth and tried to stare Eli down. Yeah, put your money up, son, and call me. Go ahead, Dad. Theo had a cigar unlit in his teeth as well and felt like a man. No guts, no glory. David tossed chips in the pot. Call. Show 'em. Three little deuces, Eli began and watched David's eyes gleam. Standing watch over two pretty ladies, son of a bitch, a Scotsman doesn't bluff over money, son. Eli, jubilant, raked in his chips. The man scalped me so many times over the years. I wear a helmet when we sit down to cards. James gestured with his glass. You'll learn. Link's head came up at the knock on the door. Somebody ordered a stripper, right? I knew you guys wouldn't let me down. It's the pizza. Theo leaped up. More pizza? Theo, you can't possibly want more pizza. Sure, I can. He shouted over his shoulder to his father. Ty said I could. I said he could order it for me. He inhaled the last order. Link sent Tyler a sorrowful look. You couldn't arrange for a stripper to deliver the pizza? They were all out of strippers. Shriners Convention. Likely story. Well, I hope he got pepperoni at least. My God, Sophie, this was a brilliant idea. Thanks, Aunt Helen. They sat side by side, tipped back with purifying masks, thick and green, covering their faces. I wanted Mama to feel relaxed and completely female. This'll do it. Can you see Teresa and Maddie over there getting pedicures and arguing? Hmm. Sophie amused. They disagree about the name for the beauty products we don't even have yet. I don't know if it's Maddie or the concept, but it's boosted Nana's morale. I'm glad to hear it. I've been worried about her, all of you, since we talked last. The idea of Renee trying to make Tony a hero and you a villain over the Cardinelli business—it fries my cookies. Sophie tensed, deliberately relaxed again. It was a stupid move. De Mornay's behind it, and it's one of the first truly stupid moves he's made. He's cracking. That may be, but it caused more upset. She held up a hand, and that's all I'm going to say about it. Tonight's not about problems; it's about indulgence. Where's Pilar? Don't think about it. Sophia ordered herself. Think pure thoughts. Treatment room B, otherwise known as the lower level guest bath, full body facial. You need to be near a shower. Fabulous. I'm next. Champagne. Maria, Sophia roused herself enough to sit up. You're not to serve. You're a guest. My manicure's dry. 
She showed off her nails. I have a pedicure next. You can bring me champagne then. That's a deal. Maria glanced over as Pilar, looking soft and relaxed, came back in. You've made your mama happy tonight. Everything's going to be all right now. You sure know how to show a woman a good time. Jerry ran a hand over the butt of Renee's snug black pants. You haven't seen anything yet. This is going to be a night to remember for everyone. They moved through the vineyard now. It had been a long hike from the car, and the sack he carried seemed to gain weight with every step. Still, there was something to be said for doing the job himself that he hadn't experienced before. Not just the amused gratification he'd felt at other times, but a deep and personal excitement. And if anything went wrong, he'd simply sacrifice Renee. But he didn't intend for anything to go wrong. He knew the setup here. Between Don and Chris and his own observations, he was aware of the security setup and how to avoid setting off alarms. It was simply a matter of patience and care, and a single driving ambition. Before the night was over, Jim Bailey would, one way or another, be in ruins. Stay close, he told her. I am. Not to spoil the party, but I wish I was as sure as you are this is going to work. No second thoughts now. I know what I'm doing and how to do it. Once the winery's on fire, they'll come spilling out like ants at a picnic. I don't care if you burn the whole fucking vineyard to ashes. In fact, she got a thrill out of the image and of her dancing at the edge of the flames. I just don't want to get caught. Do what I tell you and you won't. Once they're out here busy trying to put out the fire, we go in, plant the package in Sophia's room, get out. We're in the car and heading back five minutes later. We call the cops from a payphone, give them an anonymous tip, and we're back at your place popping champagne before the smoke clears. The old lady'll pay off the cops. She won't let her precious granddaughter go to prison. Maybe. Let her try. It won't matter. They'll be ruined. Sooner or later you find the right straw, and that's the one that breaks the back. Isn't that what you want? Something in his voice had a chill snaking up her spine, but she nodded. It's exactly what I want. When he reached the winery, he took out the keys. Don had been slick enough to make copies, and he'd been smart enough to duplicate those. These get tossed in the bay when we're done. He slid the key into the first lock. No one's going to need them after tonight. They'll have a hell of a time explaining how a fire started inside a locked building. With that statement, he opened the door. Sophia lay on the massage table and looked up at the stars. Mama, am I obsessive? Yes. Is that a bad thing? Pilar glanced back from her stance at the edge of the patio. No. Occasionally annoying, but not bad. Do I miss the big picture because I'm drilling on the details? Rarely. Why do you ask? I was wondering what I'd change about myself if I could, if I should. I wouldn't change anything. Because I'm perfect? Sophia asked with a grin. No, because you're mine. Is this about Ty? No, it's about me. Up until... Well, I'm not exactly sure when, but up until I was sure I had everything figured out. Knew what I wanted and how I was going to get it. Not sure anymore? Oh, no, I'm still sure. I still know what I want and how I'm going to get it, but the things I want changed on me. I was wondering if they were there all along and I was just missing the big picture. I... Could you give us a minute? She said to the therapist and sat up, holding the sheet to her breast when she was alone with Pilar. Please don't get upset. I won't. Not that long ago, I still wanted you and Dad to get back together. I wanted it because I didn't know how to want anything else, I think. Because I felt if you did, he'd be what I needed him to be. Not what you needed or what he was, but what I needed. That was the detail I kept obsessing over, and I missed the big picture. I'd change that if I could. I wouldn't. You would have been a good daughter to him if he'd let you. You were willing to be. You needed to be. No. I wouldn't change that. That helps. 
She took Pilar's wrist, turned it to check the time on her watch. It's just midnight. Happy wedding day, Mama. She pressed Pilar's hand to her cheek, then started to lie back. What's that? It looks like... Oh, my God! The winery! The winery's on fire! Maria! Maria! Call 911! The winery's on fire! She rolled off the table, snagged her robe on the run. As Jerry had predicted, they poured out of the house, raised voices, running feet. From the shadows of the garden he counted the figures wrapped in white robes that raced down the path and out across the vineyard. In and out, he whispered to Renee. Piece of cake. You lead the way. She'd given him the location and setup of Sophia's room, but he wanted her going in first. She might have made a mistake. She claimed she'd only slipped into Sophia's room once, but that was once more than he'd managed. He couldn't risk turning on the light, though he was sure his flashlight would be enough. He only needed to plant the package at the back of her closet where the police, even if they were idiots, would find it. He moved up behind René, up the terrace steps, glancing over his shoulder. He could see the bright orange and gold of the fire against the night sky. A brilliant sight. It illuminated the figures rushing like frightened moths toward the flame. They'd put it out, of course, but not quickly. It would take time for them to realize the water had been turned off for the sprinkler system. Time for them to gather their wits. Time for them to watch helplessly as precious bottles exploded, as equipment was ruined, as their god of tradition burned to hell. So he didn't have the guts to do his own dirty work? Gingerly he flexed his hand. It still twinged now and then. They'd see who had the guts when the sun came up. Jerry, for God's sake, Renee hissed at him from the terrace outside Sophia's room. This isn't a tourist attraction. You said we had to hurry. Always time for a moment of pleasure, darling. He stepped, swaggered, up to the terrace door. Sure this is hers? Yes, I'm sure. Well, then. He pushed open the doors, stepped inside and drew a deep, satisfied breath of her scent, just as Sophia dashed through the opposite door and slapped on the lights. The sudden glare slashed across his eyes. The shock froze his brain. Before he could recover from either, he was fighting off a hundred and ten pounds of enraged woman. She leaped at him, blind fury catapulting her across the room. Even as she sank her teeth into him, the edges of her vision glowed red with bloodlust. Her only clear thought was to inflict pain, monstrous pain, and when he howled, the feral thrill of it spurted through her like lava. He struck out, caught her across the cheekbone, but she didn't even feel it. She went for his eyes, freshly manicured nails already tipped red, slashed out, missed by a breath and scored like the prongs of a rake down his cheek. The burn of it maddened, with no goal but to free himself. He tossed her aside and sent her into a shrieking Renee. He could smell his own blood. Intolerable. She'd ruined all his careful plans. Unforgivable. Even as she scrabbled to her feet, prepared to leap at him again, the gun was out of the pouch in his hand, with his finger sweaty on the trigger. He nearly ended it then, with one quick twitch of his nervous finger. Then her body jerked to a halt, and her eyes cleared of rage and filled with shock and fear. Finally, he thought, face to face, and he wanted more than survival. He wanted satisfaction. Now, isn't this interesting? You should have run out with the others, Sophia, but maybe it's fate you end like your worthless father, with a bullet in the heart. Jerry, we have to get out of here. Just go. Renee pushed herself to her feet, stared at the gun. My God, what are you doing? You can't just shoot her. Oh, he thought he could, and that was a revelation. He didn't believe he'd have any trouble with it at all. And why not? That's crazy. It's murder. I'm not having any part of murder. I'm getting out. I'm getting out now. Give me the keys to the car. Give me the damn keys. Shut the fuck up. He said it coolly and in an almost absent gesture smashed the gun into the side of her head. When she went down like a stone, he didn't even glance at her, but kept his eyes locked on Sophia's. 
She was a pain in the ass, on that we can agree. But she's useful, and this is perfect. You'll appreciate the spin on this, Sophia. Renee started the fire. She's had it in for you all along. She went to the cops a few days ago, tried to convince them you'd killed your father. And tonight, she came here, fired the winery, and broke into your room to plant evidence against you. You caught her. You struggled. The gun went off. The gun, he added, used to shoot David Cutter. I had it sent to me. Forward thinking, which I'm sure you'll appreciate. You're dead, and she hangs for it. Very tidy. Why? Because nobody screws with me and gets away with it. You Jim Bellies think you can have it all, and now you'll end up with nothing. Because of my father? She could see the bright orange glow from the fire through the open doors behind him. All of this because my father embarrassed you? Embarrassed? He stole from me my wife, my pride, my life. And what did any of you lose? Nothing. Just another bump to you. I've taken my own back and more. I'd have been satisfied to ruin you, but Dad's better. You're the key. Teresa. Well, she's not as young as she was. Your mother, she hasn't got what it takes to bring the company back. Without you, the heart and the brains are dead. Your father was a user, a liar, and a cheat. Yes, he was. No one would come for her, she thought. There would be no one to race back from the fire to save her. She would face death on her own. You're all that, and so much less. If there was time, we'd debate that. But I'm a little pressed, so... He brought the gun up another inch. Ciao, Bella. Vaya farte fotere. She cursed him in a steady voice. She wanted to close her eyes, to find a prayer, an image of something to take with her. But she kept them open, waited. When the gun exploded, she stumbled back and watched blood seep through the tiny hole in his shirt. Baffled shot crossed his face, then another shot jerked his body to the side and dropped him. In the doorway, Helen lowered the gun to her side. Oh, my God! Oh, God! Aunt Helen! Her legs gave out. Sophia stumbled to the bed, lowered herself to it. He was going to kill me. I know. Slowly, Helen came into the room, sat heavily on the bed beside Sophia. I came back to tell you the men had come. I saw. He was going to kill me, just like he killed my father. No, honey. He didn't kill your father. I did. I did, she repeated, and dropped the gun she held to the floor. I'm so sorry. No, that's crazy. I used that gun. It was my father's. It was never registered. I don't know why I took it that night. I don't think I planned to kill him. I wasn't thinking at all. He wanted money. Again. It was never going to end. What are you talking about? Sophia took her shoulders. She could smell gunpowder and blood. What are you saying? Link. He was using Link against me. Link, God help me. Link is Tony's son.
they've got it under control. It's. Pilar rushed in the terrace doors, stopped cold. Oh dear God, Sophie! No, wait. Sophia sprang to her feet. Don't come in. Don't touch anything. Her breath came out in pants, but she was thinking, thinking fast. Aunt Helen, come with me. Come with me now. We can't stay in here. It'll destroy James and Link. I've ruined them after all. Moving quickly now, Sophia dragged Helen up, pulled her out onto the terrace. Tell us, tell us quickly. We can't have much time. I killed Tony Pilar. I betrayed you, myself, everything I believe in. That's not possible. For God's sake, what happened here? She saved my life, Sophia said. A blast rent the air as bottles exploded in the winery. She barely flinched. He was going to kill me with the gun that shot David. He'd sent for it, kept it like a souvenir. Helen, what happened with my father? He wanted money. Over the years, he'd contact me when he needed money. He never actually demanded, never actually threatened. He'd just mention Link. What a fine boy he was! What a bright and promising young man! Then he'd say he needed a bit of a loan. I slept with Tony. She began to weep then, silently. All those years ago, we were all so young. James and I were having problems. I was so angry with him, so confused. We separated for a few weeks. I remember, Pilar murmured. I ran into Tony. He was so understanding, so sympathetic. You and he weren't getting along either. You were considering a separation. He was. Charming, and he paid attention, the way James hadn't been. There's no excuse. I let it happen. After I, I was so ashamed, so disgusted with myself. But it was done and couldn't be changed. I found out I was pregnant. It wasn't James's because we hadn't been together that way. So I made my second hideous mistake, and I told Tony. I might as well have told him I'd decided to change my hairstyle. He could hardly be expected to pay for one night's indiscretion, could he? So I paid. Tears dripped down her cheeks, and I paid. Link is Tony's child. He's James's. Helen looked pleadingly at Pilar, in every way but that one. He doesn't know. Neither of them know. I did everything I could to make up for that night, to James, to Link, God, Pilar, to you. I slept with my best friend's husband. I was young and angry and stupid, and I've never forgiven myself for it. But I did everything I could to make it up. I gave him money every time he asked for it. I don't even know how much over the years. And you couldn't give any more, Pilar concurred. The night of the party, he told me he had to see me. Told me when and where. I refused. It was the first time I'd done so. It made him angry, and that frightened me. If I didn't do as he said, he'd go inside then and there and tell James, tell Link, tell you. I couldn't risk it. Couldn't bear it. My baby Pilar, my little boy with the loose shoelaces. When I went home, I got the gun out of the safe. It's been there for years. I don't know why I thought of it. Don't know why I took it. It was like a veil over my mind. He had music on in the apartment, and a good bottle of wine. He sat and told me his financial troubles, charmingly, as if we were old dear friends. I don't remember everything he said. I'm not even sure I heard him. He needed what he liked to call a loan, a quarter of a million this time. He'd be willing, of course, to take half by the end of the week and give me another month for the rest. It wasn't too much to ask, after all. He'd given me such a fine son. I didn't know the gun was in my hand. I didn't know I'd used it until I saw the red against his white tuxedo shirt. He looked at me, so surprised, just a little annoyed. I could almost imagine him saying. Damn, Helen, you've ruined my shirt. But he didn't, of course. He didn't say anything. I went home and tried to convince myself it had never happened, never happened at all. 
I've carried the gun around with me ever since, everywhere. You could have thrown it away, Pilar said quietly. How could I? What if one of you were arrested? I'd need it then to prove I'd done it myself. I couldn't let him hurt my baby or James. I thought it could be over. And now? I need to tell James and Link first. I need to tell them before I talk to the police. Cycles, Sophia thought. Sometimes they needed to be stopped. If you hadn't used that gun to save my life tonight, you wouldn't have to tell them anything. I love you, Helen said simply. I know it. And this is what happened here tonight. Just exactly what happened. She took Helen by the shoulders. Pay attention to me. You came back, saw Jerry holding me at gunpoint. He brought both guns with him. He'd intended to plant them in my room to implicate me. We'd struggled, and the other gun, the one that killed my father, was on the floor near the doorway. You picked it up, and you shot him before he shot me. Sophia, that's what happened. She took Helen's hand, squeezed it, took her mother's. Isn't it, Mama? Yes, that's exactly what happened. You saved my child. Do you think I wouldn't save yours? I can't. Yes, you can. You want to make it up to me, Pilar demanded. Then you'll do this. I don't care about what happened one night almost thirty years ago. But I care about what happened tonight. I care about what you've been to me most of my life. I'm not going to let someone I love be destroyed. Over what? Over money? Over pride? Over image? If you love me, if you want to make up for that mistake so long ago, you'll do exactly what Sophie's asking you to do. Tony was her father. Who has more right to decide than she? Jerry's dead, Sophia said. He killed, threatened, destroyed, all because of one selfish act by my father. And it ends here. I'm going to go call the police. Someone should take a look at Renee. She leaned forward, brushed her lips over Helen's cheek. Thank you. For the rest of my life. Late. Late into the night, Sophia sat in the kitchen sipping tea laced with brandy. She'd given her statement, had sat, her hand holding Helen's, as Helen had given hers. Justice, she thought, didn't always come as you expected. Helen had said that once, and here it was, unexpected justice. It hadn't hurt that Rene had been hysterical, had babbled to everyone, including Claremont and McGuire when they'd arrived, that Jerry was a madman, a murderer, and had forced her at gunpoint to come with him. Some snake slithered through, Sophia supposed, because life was a messy business. Now at last, the police were gone, the house was quiet. She looked up as her mother and grandmother came in. And Helen? She's finally sleeping. Pilar went to the cupboard, got two more cups. We've talked. She'll be all right. She's going to resign her judgeship. I suppose she needs to. Pilar set the cups on the table. I've told Mama everything, Sophia. I felt she had a right to know. Nana? Sophia reached for her hand. Did I do the right thing? You did the loving thing. That often matters more. It was brave of you, Sophia. Brave of both of you. It makes me proud. She sat down, sighed. Helen took a life and gave one back. That closes the circle. We won't speak of it again. Tomorrow my daughter's getting married, and we'll have joy in this house again. Soon the harvest, the bounty, and another season ends. The next is yours. She said to Sophia, yours and Tyler's, your life, your legacies. Eli and I are retiring the first of the year. Nana, torches are meant to be passed. Take what I give you. The faint irritation in her grandmother's voice made her smile. I will. Thank you, Nana. Now, it's late. The bride needs her sleep, and so do I. She got to her feet leaving her tea untouched. Your young man went back to the winery. You don't need so much sleep. True enough, Sophia thought as she raced across the grounds toward the winery.
She had so much energy, so much life inside her. She didn't think she'd ever need to sleep again. He'd set up lights, and the old building hulked under them. She could see the sparkle of broken glass from the windows, the smears from smoke, the chars from flame. But still, it stood. It withstood. Perhaps he sensed her. She liked to think so. He stepped out of the broken doorway as she ran up, and he caught her, held her close and tight, and inches off the ground. There you are, Sophia. I figured you needed a little time with your mother. Then I was coming to get you. I got you first. Hold on, okay? Just keep holding on. You can count on it. Even as he did, the ice skimmed through his belly again. He pressed his face to her hair. God, God! When I think, don't think, don't," she said and turned her mouth to his. "I'm not going to be able to let you out of my sight for the next oh, ten or fifteen years. Right now, that suits me fine. You all alone here? Yeah. David needed to get the kids home, and I sent Granddad back before he keeled over. He was exhausted. James was still pretty shaken, so Link took him back to my place since your mom's with Helen. Good. Everything's as it should be. She rested her head on his shoulder, looked toward the winery. It could have been worse. He eased her back, touched his lips gently to the bruise on her cheek. It could have been a hell of a lot worse. You should have seen the other guy. He managed a strangled laugh as he held her tight again. That's a little sick. Maybe, but it's the way I feel. He died with my mark on his face, and I'm glad of it. I'm glad I caused him some pain, and now I can put it away, all of it, lock it away, and everything starts now. Everything, Ty, she said. We'll rebuild the winery, rebuild our lives, and make them ours. Jim Bailey McMillan is going to come back bigger and better than ever. That's what I want. That's handy, because that's what I want too. Let's go home, Sophie. She tucked her hand in his and walked away from the damage and the scars. The first hints of dawn lightened the sky in the east. When the sun broke through, she thought it was going to be a beautiful beginning.